i hope all the audience have taken the poll questions uh, also those who are joining us online i'll request you to kindly take the poll questions uh, for the online audience i'll request if you have any comments to kindly type in the chat section if you have any queries please type in the q and a box this conference comprises of four scientific sessions four scientific tracks uh, the track one is called as anemia and beta uh, thalassemia followed by chronic lymphocytic leukemia acute myeloid leukemia and chronic myeloid leukemia after all the scientific tracks we would be having an interactive quiz with the live audience proceeding forward i'll i'll request Dr. Sachin Malhotra, Chief Executive of Officer from Tech Care for All India Private Limited, to kindly brief us about Medical Learning Hub. Thank you, Shubhi. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll share my screen. Uh, sir, so kindly. Please. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you. And Just... the screen is also visible? Uh, not yet, sir. Let me try again. Is the screen visible now? Yes, sir, visible at the side. Okay. Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining in today. Uh, a big warm welcome to all the delegates today morning on a Saturday. Thanks for taking your time and, and joining us um, on what will be a very promising um, hematology program throughout the day where you'll have a fantastic faculty to present. Uh, so I'd like to also thank first the uh, the faculty who've designed a very good agenda, uh, a very promising scientific series today. Uh, also want to extend my thanks to uh, to the organizers uh, at MGM, Dr. Yadav, Dr. Amrita, and Dr. Sachin, and of course, uh, several others who've helped us create this and, and put this uh, overall program together. Thank can you. Please, uh, can you please stop for one minute? Actually, uh, your screen is not visible at... Uh... Offline side. Oh. All right, I'll wait. Let me know when to resume. Okay, sir, I'll request you to kindly take it out. Thank you. Okay. So I was just thanking the organizers. Um, and so Dr. Yadav, Dr. Amrita, Dr. Sachin, and, and everyone who's been behind the scenes helping in putting this together. Of course, uh, the the leadership of MGM Medical College in Indore, thank you for your support and in, in also uh, putting this together. So I'll briefly introduce, uh, and I won't take much of your time because I know you're here for the science, not for what we are talking about. Uh, I'll very quickly introduce what we are up, uh, what we have been doing. 
We started uh, Medical Learning Hub uh, in 2018. Uh, and today, Medical Learning Hub is, uh, so we started it out of India and today MLH or Medical Learning Hub is active both in India and in Africa. Uh, the, the mission that we, that we started in 2018, uh, we've, uh, we started on skill building and, uh, and to create and empower healthcare excellence by, by a process of continuous learning of all healthcare providers. So doctors, nurses, um, traditional uh, medicine, uh, we are looking at creating a continuous learning environment for all of you healthcare providers. Uh, we are bringing together a larger collaboration between the industry, the academia, the research. And we are also in this process now helping in the growth of professionals across our regions. Uh, so that is what MLH stands for. And we've been doing this uh, by sticking to a few core principles um, uh, when it comes to uh, training and, and creating learning opportunities. Equity is very critical on our mind. So we, we aim to create an equitable uh, learning environment across the region, across the diverse region of India, and of course, uh, multiple countries in Africa, where there's equal access for both urban as well as rural healthcare providers. Uh, and we look at creating these learning opportunities together with only qualified uh, you know, institutions as well as uh, faculty who are qualified by their, uh, you know, through their peers or who, who are well known in the field. Um, of course, the audience for them, we uh, we are very sensitive to affordability. So programs and courses on our platform, uh, they are highly affordable, uh, customized by the interest of every individual um, and convenient. So we, we are largely online, but we also, of course, do all types of online on, on site programs. So today, as you're part of a digital program, so, so there's a physical audience as well in indoor. And there's an online audience also. Um, there's all types of CMEs that we do. We do workshops, we, uh, we do conferences, we create short video snippets so that we can engage you, uh, all the busy professionals out there who are spending their time. Um, there's championships. Did I, uh, was someone trying to say something? No, okay. There's certificate courses happening through the platform, there's fellowships, there's mentoring, and there's a lot of other activities that we are engaging in this year uh, that will bring medical colleges even more uh, closer to, to our users. Um, and I'll leave you with this one slide, which is, uh, which is about this program series that, uh, that we are all part of today. Uh, what started as a journey in March of 2023 was is now going to culminate in uh, June of 24. And this series is, is actually a multinational program in hematology, which is aimed to strengthen our healthcare systems uh, you know, for the diagnosis, the early diagnosis, the treatment and the management of, of blood cancer and hemoglobinopathies. Um, we'll be finishing by, uh, by mid of this year, close to about uh, 60 programs in this series and would have engaged about 15,000 uh, healthcare professionals across the regions uh, with about 240 um, speakers and faculties, all well-qualified and distinguished in their nature. Uh, so, so that's it. I mean, I won't bot uh, bother you more with, with my uh, little bit here. Uh, I'll hand over to Dr. Yash Javeri, who is of course gonna come and discuss about anemia in the ICU. And I encourage every one of our audience to, uh, to, to be engaged during the program, uh, to ask questions, to, you know, to, to, to participate a lot more. Uh, either whether you're online or on-site, please do participate as much as you can. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, back to you, uh, Shubhi. Thank you so much. So moving forward, we have our next uh, session, uh, the first scientific session by Dr. Yash Javeri on anemia in ICU. Dr. Yash is Director of Critical Care and Emergency Medicine at Regency Super Speciality Hospital, Lucknow. He is dedicated and skilled intensive care physician with 20 years of experience. And he is leading multidisciplinary teams and achieving superior patient outcomes 
uh he is also on the editorial boards of many journals of reputed critical care medicine anesthesiology infectious diseases as well as emergency medicine and have authored more than 50 book chapters and more than 30 original articles i welcome you uh, dr yash the uh, i also request dr purnima ma'am to kindly chair this session uh i'll request you ma'am if you can join us on the stage so uh, moving ahead we have our first session uh, on anemia in icu i'll request you dr yash to kindly take and proceed with your talk thank you thank you uh, good morning everyone at the onset i like to thank the organizing committee of the metrocon for the kind invitation and for medical learning hub to have me as a speaker it's a privilege being in this conference one reason is the magnitude of the conference and the hybrid mode other reason is i hail from the city of indore and it's always a very nice feeling to be at your own home online or physically so i am going to talk about anemia in icu the perspective which i am going to give is from a critical care point of view rather than an opd or ipd point of view no disclosures to make no conflict of interest including financial or other conflict of interest the learning objectives from today's presentation will be to understand anemia in adult critically ill patients and we are not going to discuss acute bleeding or acute hemolysis for that matter chronic anemia is largely excluded what is the etiology of anemia in icu workup anemia prevention strategies in icu transfusion and non transfusion treatment for anemia in icu a little bit of background anemia is quite common in critically ill patients on admission and during the stay even anemia persists up to 6 months 7 months after a critical illness as a post intensive care syndrome reason for admission to icu could also be anemia related failure or other complications anemia could be confounder illness in many of the diseases especially in icu anemia per se has attributable mortality in icu patients not only it increases length of stay but also the severity of illness how do we define anemia the definition of anemia used in icu is as any other definition and the most widely used definition is who definition hemoglobin less than 13 for adult male and less than 12 for adult non pregnant female if we talk about severity of anemia during critical illness there is no universally agreed definition and when i was doing a literature search i could sense that this topic is very less discussed in critical care circles and probably there is no guideline specific to critical care and anemia management however almost 95% of patients in icu will have anemia by day 3 and this anemia typically persists throughout the icu and hospital stay 40% of the patients admitted to icu receive transfusion 85% of patients who are there for more than a week they require transfusion acute blood clot account for almost 35% of transfusion even so anemia and transfusion requirement both are big issues in critical care practice and as discussed anemia can persist in medium and long term as more than one half of the patients who were anemic at the time of discharge from icu were still anemic 6 months after discharge so we always talk about this post intensive care syndrome anemia being one part of that post intensive care syndrome now we have recognized and understood the magnitude of the problem how to manage anemia the main mechanism of anemia have to be understood in icu the first and foremost is blood loss blood loss could be visible it could be internal it could be gi blood loss it could be hematomas formed here and there and some other losses which leads to loss of rbc and iron deficiency it could be hemodilution we give lot of fluids a patient with renal failure patient with sepsis patient with burns it could be just hemodilution and you are getting anemia as a hemodilution component inflammation most of the critical illness have underlying high degree of inflammation and inflammation is responsible for inhibition of endogenous erythropoietin synthesis inhibition of bone marrow response to erythropoietin and for functional iron deficiency due to induction of hepcidin synthesis 
It is also responsible for decreased RBC lifespan, especially as a result of membrane alterations of the RBC. Some pitfalls you have to remember in ICU. You have to look not only on hemoglobin level if you are resuscitating a patient with bleeding and severe anemia in ICU, but you have to look at the complete picture. You have to look at the hemodynamic parameters. What is the heart rate? Is there a component of heart failure? What is the response to blood transfusion? And not only to a single marker or single level of hemoglobin. We don't treat numbers. We treat patients. We always need to have clinical correlation. Do not work in silos. Do not look at the numbers or the patient alone. Look at the patient as a complete picture. Sampling errors, very, very common in ICU. Drip arm sample is very, very common where all the levels, sodium, potassium, everything will be low, including hemoglobin. Hemoconcentration, when the patient is dehydrated, hypovolemic hemoglobin levels can be falsely high despite a loss of hemoglobin. Hemodilution, we all understand whenever there is a lot of body fluid which is accumulating or we are transfusing, hemoglobin <laughs> levels will be low. What are the other etiologies of anemia in ICU? Blood loss, blood sampling, hemorrhage. Hemorrhage could be visible or it could be incipient. RBC survival is decreased, RBC production is decreased, abnormal iron metabolism, nutritional deficiency, especially if we talk about thiamine deficiency, it is so common in Indian population. We did a study in 2010 where we found almost 60% of our patients on admission were thiamine deficient. Inappropriate erythropoietin production, abnormal cell production, suppression of bone marrow by many drugs which we are using in our day-to-day -day ICU practice. Iron metabolism, if you talk about in ICU, it resembles with anemia of chronic inflammation. Iron levels are low. TIBC is low. Functional binding capacity is low of iron. Ferritin levels are increased because ferritin is a acute phase protein. Whereas transferrin levels are generally low, it is a negative acute phase protein. Transferrin saturation is low. And if we talk about B12 and folate levels, generally they are normal. Erythropoietin concentration could be normal or slightly increased. So in inflammation, iron is transferred into macrophage and incorporated into ferritin, which is an acute reactant. And this ferritin and iron overload is an immunosuppressant. And we saw in COVID how this was responsible for increase, one of the factors on increased incidence of mycosis in this part of the world. Total body iron is normal. However, low biolability of free iron or erythropoiesis lead to hypochromic reticulocyte. Overall, inflammation leads to inhibition of normal erythrogenesis by various mechanisms and probably this audience is much more learned on these aspects than me. So the net result is inhibition of normal erythrogenesis. If we talk about uh, pathogenesis, there is functional iron deficiency, inability to incorporate iron into hemoglobin, hematology is similar to anemia of chronic disease. How do we manage anemia? We have to consider risk benefit ratio for every patient, for every unit of blood. We should not be transfusing blood just because. Hemoglobin level is marginally low, or you want to have a supraphysiological target. Supraphysiological targets do not work in ICU. So please do not have the supraphysiological targets in your practice. At early stop bleeding, look for bleeding. There could be other cause of anemia, but bleeding is much more common, occult, or visible. Activate a bloodless program for all your interventions, including sampling. Sampling should also be having minimum of blood from the body. Reduce iatrogenic blood loss. Give it back when possible. We always teach our nurses and trainees. When you sample from a central line after cleaning the central line, we generally keep 20 ml away in a syringe, then take the sample. This 20 ml should be infused back and you should not be discarding this 20 ml. We did a survey, small survey of about 50 patients six, seven years back. And what we found was we are losing almost 60 to 80 ml of blood daily because of sampling issues. It could be ABG, it could be blood culture, it could be other 
pathological test. Blood transfusion is like marriage. It should not be entered upon lightly, unadvisedly, or wantonly, or more often that is absolutely necessary. So you should be more careful about blood transfusion in critical illness. Report me in the ICU, we are often called as medical vampires. We have to minimize blood draws. We have to be thoughtful of each sample. We should know what is the requirement. Is daily TLC doing any purpose? No, it is a useless practice. Is daily platelet doing any sample for most of the patients? No. Pediatric tubes, micro sampling, and bloodless procedures are desired. What is a critical level of hemoglobin when we have to transfuse? There are various studies in ICU patients, and what we found: four to five or four to six gram per deciliter is a critical value in terms of hemodynamics, in terms of myocardial ischemia, in terms of cerebral metabolism of oxygen. And if your hemoglobin is in this range, you have to obviously bring it to a higher level to 7 to 9, which is accepted number for ICU. The landmark trial for ICU, which was published in NEGM 1999. Trick trial and other recent large epidemiological studies suggested hemoglobin of 7 to 9 gram per deciliter is well tolerated. And a trigger of 7 is generally accepted to decrease mortality in ICU patients. Some clinicians, including intensivists, tend to increase hemoglobin concentration in absence of clinical bleeding or absence of anemia. Please do not fall in trap for these terms and these practices. You gain nothing by supraphysiological targets. Do not talk about diminished physiological reserve, altered tissue perfusion, tissue hypoxia, if your hemoglobin is in the range of 7 to 9. So, widely accepted target in ICU population is 7 to 9. Unless your hemoglobin is less than 7, please do not transfuse PRBC in ICU. The practice in ICU is largely based on this article nowadays, Anesthesia Critical Care Pain Medicine publication in 2020, where they talked about management and prevention of anemia, where acute bleeding was excluded in adult critical care patients. Next few slides will be focusing on clinical questions asked uh, answered in this paper. The first question which they tried to answer was, which non-pharmacological interventions can reduce RBC transfusion and morbidity mortality related to anemia or transfusion critically in patients? They proposed a diagnostic phlebotomy reduction strategy. Reduce the number of samples, frequency of samples, and the volume of sample to decrease the incidence of anemia and transfer in ICU patients. The next clinical question which they asked was, which transfusion strategies can reduce RBC transfusion in anemia-related morbidity mortality in ICU patients? They recommended to adopt a restrictive transfusion strategy, hemoglobin of 7 in ICU patients in general, including septic patients, to reduce utilization of RBC. Other clinical question was, about restrictive transfusion strategies. So the answer is seven is the magic figure you have to look at in vast majority of patients, 7.5 to 8 in post-operative cardiac surgery patients in order to reduce RBC transfusion and morbidity mortality. So general ICU patients, the target is seven to nine. Trauma again, seven to nine. Sepsis again, seven to nine. So this is a range. If your hemoglobin is up to seven, you sit comfortably, do not enter into transfusion. Brain injuries, the target is 7 to 10. And these neurosurgeons are the most difficult specialty to handle. They want to transfuse their patients even when their hemoglobin is 9 to 10, which is a very, very wrong practice. Sadly, this practice is carried on by neurosurgeons across the country and it's a difficult thing to make them understand. Post-operative cardiac surgery patient, the target could be 7.5 to 8 to 9, depending on the cause. However, if your patient has acute coronary syndrome, active myocardial ischemia, or refractory hypoxia, then your target becomes around 9. So only place your target is high, in ICU high means 9, is acute coronary syndrome, which is not 
tackled the angioplasty is not done or refractory hypoxia due to ARDS or due to some other cause then only you are going to reach the magic figure of 9. It is probably not recommended to adopt a liberal transfusion strategy. Now we always talk about less is more minimalistic interventions in medical practice. So the optimal hemoglobin target of 10 is not right even for patients with acute coronary syndrome who have been revascularized. However, patients with active myocardial ischemia, your target is 9. But for revascularized, again, it will come in the category of 7 to 9. It is probably not recommended to adopt a liberal transfusion strategy. So you do not enter into this liberal. You have to restrict your transfusion strategies. Duration of storage. This is again a no man's land cell. It is not recommended to select units of RBC according to their duration of storage to decrease the morbidity and mortality in the critically ill patients. We generally tend to transfuse patients fresh RBC or fresh whole blood as the need might arise. But the guidelines say you do not go by the duration of collection while descending, deciding on the samples, deciding on the transfusion. But this is the general practice and we all try to look at fresher blood units rather than old or stale blood units. Single unit transfusion. This has been discussed for last two decades. The experts suggest adoption of a restrictive transfusion strategies based on transfusion of a single unit of RBCs followed by review of indication for subsequent transfusion in order to reduce RBC utilization. So you have to be very, very judicious. You have to champion the cause of blood transfusion. The blood bank physician, the physician who is looking after the patient, the quality team, you should review what is your utilization of blood. Was it required or not? This is one of the quality improvement initiative for the ICU as well as for, for the blood bank team. Erythropoietin therapy in ICU, there have been various papers. This particular paper was published by Corbin Group where erythropoietin was transfused in 166 unit of RBC compared with 300 to the placebo group for a trigger of 8.5. Mortality was similar in both the groups. Little doubt that erythropoietin is effective as blood sparing therapy in critically ill patients. But the key question is whether it is cost effective and that remains a controversy. And we need to have more research about utilization of erythropoietin in ICU patients, non-renal failure patients, non-hematology patients. The practice widely prevalent worldwide is we do not tend to use erythropoietin in ICU, non-renal failure, non-hematology patients. Thus, administration of erythropoiesis stimulating agent reduce RBC utilization and our morbidity related to anemia or transfusion. The answer, however, is they recommend to use erythropoiesis stimulating agents in critically anemic when their hemoglobin is less than 10 and or trauma patients in absence of contraindication, especially with the history of ischemic cardiovascular disease and of venous thromboembolism in order to reduce RBC utilization. But this is a practice which is generally not done in most of the ICUs. They suggest stopping erythropoiesis stimulating agent when hemoglobin stabilizes between 10 to 12. Utilization of iron preparations in ICU. Should iron be administered to ICU patients to decrease RBC utilization, morbidity and mortality? The evidence which came was largely from this iron men study which was published in intensive care medicine a few years back. In patients admitted to ICU who were anemic, IV iron was compared with placebo. It did not result in significant lowering of RBC transfusion requirement during hospital stay. Patient who received IV iron had a significantly higher hemoglobin concentration at hospital discharge, but the outcomes were not better. So it is probably not recommended to administer iron to reduce RBC utilization or morbidity in ICU patient. But this is talking about general ICU patient. If there is any other hematological indication where you have to transfuse iron, that is a different ball game. To decrease RBC utilization, the answer was again no, it should not be utilized as a generic therapy. However, 
Two questions remained unanswered in these guidelines. The transfusion threshold in critically ill patient with chronic cardiovascular disease and administration of vitamin B12 or folic acid to critically ill patient. The practice points from my talk today are phlebotomy reduction strategies have to be utilized in your ICUs. Restrictive RBC transfusion and single unit transfusion policy goes a long way. Use of RBC regardless of storage time. Treatment of anemic patient with erythropoietin, especially after trauma and absence of contraindications. This is still not practiced in most of the ICU. We have to look into details. And I also got a new clinical question to look at after this talk. Avoidance of iron therapy except in context of erythropoietin therapy for hematological indications. Thank you. I will request some clinical questions and queries. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I'll request the audience if you have any questions. Uh, can we pass the mic, please? Uh, sir, we have a question here from a live attendee who would like to ask. Question answer. Yeah. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, so my question is, uh, what would be the guidelines for uh, blood transfusion in pediatric ICU or uh, neonatal ICU? Yeah. For pediatric ICU, the guidelines are almost same, 7 to 9 hemoglobin. Neonatal, the general tendency because the hemoglobin levels are much higher. So they generally practice a threshold of 10 cutoff. Adult, uh, pediatric generally 7 to 9, 8 to 9, they generally want to have a figure of. Neonatal generally, they tend to have a figure of 10 hemoglobin. 10 deciliter, gram per deciliter. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yash, for taking thank this uh, session on anemia in uh, ICU. Uh, now, I'll request uh, Dr. Nidhi, ma'am, to kindly felicitate Dr. Purnima, ma'am, for chairing this session. Thank you so much, ma'am, and thank you so much, Dr. Yash, for taking this session uh, and joining us uh, online and sparing your valuable time. I hope our audience must have gained many valuable uh, insights from your session. Thank you. So, proceeding forward, I would now uh, like to uh, call upon uh, Dr. Preeti Malpani, who would be taking our next session on beta thalassemia, also Cooley's anemia. Dr. Preeti has conducted more than 75 bone marrow transplants in pediatric hematological disorders and has publication in national and international journals. Her keen area of interest are thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, pediatric bone marrow transplant, and pediatric hematology. The chairs of this session are Dr. Amit Verma, who is professor and head of uh, pathology at uh, uh, SAMES and Dr. Ravi Jain, who is Associate Professor of Pathology at MGM Indore. Room to share for you.
good morning uh, everyone at the outset i would uh, like to thank the organizers medical learning hub department of transfusion medicine for giving me this opportunity to speak on uh, this platform i think it is a great idea to involve everyone i haven't attended uh, such kind of uh, hybrid uh, conference so thank you organizers so i have been uh, told to speak on uh, beta thalassemia so hemoglobinopathies are uh, one of the most common uh, monogenic disorder of the humans and uh, thalassemia is uh, one of them uh, resulting from deficient uh, production of uh, beta globin chains so thalassemia is a group of inherited disorders of hemoglobin synthesis characterized by reduced or absent one or more of the globin chains of adult hemoglobin so if there is deficiency of alpha chain uh, it is labeled as alpha thalassemias and if there is deficient production of globin chain it is referred to as uh, uh, beta thalassemia and i have been told to speak on uh, beta thalassemia so i'll focus on beta thalassemia only uh, they are characterized by varying degree of ineffective erythropoiesis and increased hemolysis so thalassemias are a huge burden uh, on india there are around 1 lakh uh, thalassemic syndrome patients residing in india initially it was confined to certain regions and certain caste but now the burden has become global because of the migration of population and intercaste marriages so uh, now the burden has become global so let's see the structure of hemoglobin uh, this is the structure of hemoglobin hemoglobin uh, has um, each rbc has hemoglobin which is made up of various combinations of hemoglobins like hemoglobin a a2 f so this is the hemoglobin a which has two alpha and two beta chains and can each containing heme moiety in it so hbb gene is responsible for uh, beta globin chain production which is located on uh, chromosome 11 mutation in hbb gene causes deficient production of beta globin chains leading to thalassemia so when there is deficient production of beta globin chains there will be excess of alpha uh, chains which will aggregate and uh, precipitate and destroys the cell membrane leading to premature destruction of rbcs and ineffective erythropoiesis and hemoglobin as the uh, oxygen carrying component the oxygen supply to the different organs will be less leading to chronic hypoxia chronic anemia which manifest early in the childhood and last throughout the life these are the various types of hemoglobin i will not go into the detail of embryonic hemoglobin but uh, fetal hemoglobin is hemoglobin f which contains two alpha and two gamma chains adult hemoglobin hemoglobin a which contains two alpha and two beta chains hemoglobin a2 which contains two alpha and two del delta chains so adult hemoglobin comprises mainly hemoglobin a which constitutes 95 to 98% of total hemoglobin uh, hemoglobin f makes less than 2% and hemoglobin a constitutes around 2 to 3% of the total hemoglobin these are the certain uh, variants or we can say uh, there is some co inheritance with other thalassemias so when uh, the variant is such that there is no production of uh, beta globin chains this is known as beta zero thalassemia when there is some production of beta globin chains it is called beta plus thalassemia when it is combined with uh, sickle Uh, uh sickle cell disease it is known as sickle uh, beta thalassemia Th uh, thalassemia e is also very common in our region so when it is combined with e it is known as e beta thalassemia so there are uh, these 
variants which we commonly encounter. So classification of beta thalassemia, three main types, minor, intermediate, and uh, major. So when there is only one gene is affected, this is known as thalassemia minor or thal trait. It is a heterozygous condition. Patient will have no symptoms. Only the only thing is hemoglobin will be little less, 9 or uh, 10 grams per cent. Uh, when both the genes are affected, the condition will be known, uh, will be uh, labeled as thalassemia intermedia or thalassemia uh, major. So, in intermedia, both the genes will be affected. It is a homozygous condition, but one gene can be beta 0 and one will be beta plus. So, the presentation of these patients will be little late. Usually, the presentation of thalassemia major is in early infancy, but thalassemia intermedia will present at a later age, four years, five years. Initially, the blood transfusion requirement will be little less, but ultimately, they are also uh, transfusion dependent, and after few years, they require regular blood transfusion. Thalassemia major, also known as Cooley's anemia, uh, homozygous condition, it can be beta plus or combination of beta plus and beta uh, zero. So these are the uh, various types of uh, beta thalassemia. Now, epidemiology. So uh, uh, initially, thalassemias were confined to certain regions like Mediterranean, Mediterranean uh, area, Southeast Asian countries, Indian subcontinents, and uh, Middle East. But now the burden has become global because of the migration of people around the uh, world. So, and few years back, it was intensified by a massive migration from um, Indian countries and uh, Middle East to European countries. So, uh, now you can see the thalassemia patients all over the uh, world. And initially, it was confined to certain caste, but... Now, it's not like that because of the uh, intercaste marriages. So, you can see thalassemia in almost every uh, population. So, there are more than 200 different mutations resulting in absent or decreased beta-globin chain production. But 20 are the most common ones responsible for 80% of the known thalassemia syndromes. Around 3% of the world's population carries alleles for uh, beta thalassemia. Uh, recent data indicate that around 7% of the world's population is carrier of uh, hemoglobin disorders and uh, 1 lakh children are born every year with homozygous state of thalassemia. In India, around 1 lakh thalassemia patients are residing. So, uh, now, uh, about the inheritance of uh, thalassemia. So, inheritance is uh, autosomal recessive. So, shall I wait? Uh, no, but. But, you have to do it in audience. So, inheritance is uh, autosomal uh, recessive. So, uh, when both the partners have uh, thalassemia trait, I mean when they have one gene mutation, this condition is known as thalassemia minor or thalassemia trait. So, if the lady gets pregnant, there are 25% chances of having both the genes normal. So, the child born will be normal. But if, and there are 50% chances of having one gene abnormal. So, 50% chances of having thalassemia trait or minor. And there are 25% chances of having both the genes abnormal, both mutated genes resulting in 
thalassemia major so this is the usual pattern of inheritance now uh, we'll discuss uh, clinical manifestations so as i have told you the presentation of thalassemia major is in early uh, infancy 4 months 6 months of age when the uh, fetal hemoglobin drops down to normal level so normal fetal hemoglobin normal levels of fetal hemoglobin comes to around the age of 4 to 6 months so they usually have uh, pallor and uh, the um, feeding will be poor so they will have the usual presentation of anemia uh, they will have a failure to thrive because of the chronic hypoxia and chronic anemia later on these children they have uh, delayed puberty they will be short stature so th usually the growth of these children is retard retarded so initial they will have uh, anemia and the jaundice also because of the chronic uh, hemolysis and later on they will have a typical skin color the bronze uh, skin color because of the iron deposition the reason being regular blood transfusions hepatosplenomegaly in the early uh, life the reason will be extra medullary hematopoiesis but later on the reason could be because of the iron overload and they have typical abnormal facies if not uh, managed properly so this facies is known as chipmunk facies they have large head um, uh, depressed nasal bridge maxillary prominence malaligned teeth and deformed uh, jaw and the reason being extramedullary hematopoiesis from the small bones of the face and if we go for uh, x-ray skull it will have uh, hair on end appearance because of the widening of the diploic spaces they have various bony abnormalities later on they have osteoporosis is very common growth retardation delayed puberty primary uh, amenorrhea and later on they have many endocrinal disturbances uh, leg ulcers which is a usual complication of chronic hemolytic anemias gallstones which is also a chronic complication so these are the uh, characteristic features of uh, thalassemia patients now if we evaluate uh, these patients so first and foremost investigation will be cbc first indication uh, of thalassemia will be anemia and uh, microcytic uh, anemia but uh, iron deficiency anemia should be ruled out because iron deficiency anemia will have the presentation at the same age and it is also a very common condition so iron deficiency anemia should be ruled out uh, the patient will have reticulocytosis as all the hemolytic anemias they have increased retic count the blood smear will show the uh, features of hemolysis in the form of target cells and isocytosis poikilocytosis so the peripheral smear will give you lot of clue and you can um, confirm your diagnosis by doing electro hb electrophoresis by hp lc method so we have discussed the normal hemoglobin structure but thalassemias will have raised fetal hemoglobin and raised a2 levels bone marrow usually bone marrow examination is not required for the confirmation of the diagnosis of thalassemia but yes bone marrow will show erythroid hyperplasia molecular diagnosis is uh, not a routine practice because you can confirm your diagnosis by clinical presentation examination and by electrophoresis but if there is any doubt in the diagnosis you can go for molecular uh, diagnosis dna testing and uh, dna testing is uh, usually used for antenatal diagnosis of thalassemia syndromes not for the routine uh, purpose so uh, the hemoglobin pattern will be like th th like this normal we have discussed the hemoglobin a constitutes the major amount 
uh, hemoglobin F will be less than 2% and A2 will be 2 to 3%. Thalassemia trait will have raised HbA2 levels. Thalassemia intermedia will have combination of both hemoglobin A, hemoglobin F and A2 will be slightly raised. And thalassemia major, the major amount will be hemoglobin F. So, this is, these are the types of hemoglobins which will be present in various types of thalassemias. Now, we come to the management. So, management is not only blood transfusions, ki usko blood transfusion diya aur hamara kaam ho gaya. No, it has to be comprehensive. So, comprehensive management includes confirmation of the diagnosis by HPLC method or molecular testing. Correction of anemia by giving pack cell transfusion regularly. So, by repeated uh, transfusions and thalassemic patients, because of the chronic anemia, they have a tendency to absorb more iron from the gut. So, the uh, iron overload, the reason for iron overload will be absorption, more absorption from the gut and packed red cell transfusion. So, uh, we have to, we need to remove this iron from the body, which we can do from the iron chelation therapy. Now, management of various complications because of the iron, main, mainly the complications are because of the iron overload. So, uh, this has to be taken care of. Supportive management includes mainly the psychosocial support, uh, vaccinations and fam support to the family, society. And the curative treatment is obviously stem cell transplant and future is gene replacement therapy. So now uh, we'll discuss one by one transfusion uh, therapy. So when will you start transfusion therapy? So when hemoglobin drops down to below 7 grams per cent on two occasions, 15 days apart. So this is the indication for starting uh, regular transfusion therapy uh, or if the patient has growth retardation, patient has uh, ex uh, features of extramedullary hematopoiesis, facial changes, uh, hepatosplenomegaly, growth retardation. So, these are the indications for starting uh, regular transfusion therapy. Now, what is the goal of uh, transfusion therapy? Number one is to prevent anemia and to suppress the extramedullary hematopoiesis. So, these are the types of transfusion usually in a normal uh, patient. Patient has to undergo bone marrow transplant or patient is in ICU with uh, compromised cardiorespiratory conditions. So, in those conditions, we prefer hypertransfusion and supertransfusion therapy in which the pre-transfusion hemoglobin should be uh, more than 10 and more than 12. But the risk of stroke will be there because of the hyperviscosity. So, you have to be very, very careful. So, transfusion should be regular three to every three to four weekly and it has to be packed RBCs and it will be good if you can give your patient leukodepleted uh, RBCs so that you can reduce many complications, many transfusion uh, reactions. Uh, now, what are the advantages of giving transfusion so that the growth will be uh, normal? So, जो पुराने patients हैं, जो जिनकी age अब 24-25 साल हो गई है, यदि हम उनको देखेंगे तो उनकी growth, क्योंकि पहले regular transfusion भी नहीं देते थे और iron chelation भी नहीं होता था, so they have big organs, big liver, big spleen and the typical color and growth retardation, less height, but nowadays if you manage them properly, you cannot make out that this patient has thalassemia because their growth will be normal, the skin color will be normal because of the proper iron chelation therapy and they, they will not uh, uh, have uh, such big uh, liver and spleen. 
and uh, so uh, the reasons for giving transfusion are maximizing growth minimizing extra medullary hematopoiesis reducing the iron absorption from the gut if the you will keep the hemoglobin level above 9 and 10 so the iron absorption from the gut will be less so by doing this we can prevent the iron overload so this is the reason for giving transfusion at regular intervals these are certain transfusion related complications i will not go into the details of all these now we'll discuss iron overload the reason being regular transfusion and iron increased iron absorption from the gut so now how will you monitor uh, see, um, iron uh, levels in the blood so serum ferritin is uh, not the ideal method but still we do uh, serum ferritin levels because we don't have other methods to uh, do it regularly so uh, serum ferritin is uh, good for monitoring the um, iron uh, trend the best method is to do iron uh, liver iron concentration by doing a t2 star uh, mri which is not available at our center so if the levels are more than 50 grams per gram of dry weight the iron con concentration is high and second method is by doing liver biopsy but it is an invasive procedure so not done routinely so, so to t t2 star mri of liver and cardiac is the best way to see the exact iron content of the body so as the age advances the number of transfusions will be more the iron content of the body will be high initially the liver and the cardiac are the main organs to be affected and later on it involves other uh, organs also like endocrine glands and uh, all that so these are the features of iron overload the patient will have typical uh, bronze skin color ultimately the patient will develop uh, liver cirrhosis cardiac manifestations will be cardiac arrhythmias and later on cardiomyopathy and endocrine manifestations will be diabetes growth retardation and hypothyroidism hypoparathyroidism now uh, when will you start uh, chelation therapy? So, uh, if serum ferritin goes above 1000 and after uh, 10 to 12 transfusion, this is the usual practice we follow. And when liver iron concentration goes more than 5 to 7 milligrams per grams of dry weight. So, this is the time when we should start with iron chelators. These are the types of iron chelators, deferioxamine, deferasi rocks, and deferiprone. Uh, but the D deferasi rocks, desirox, is the most of the centers are using this drug because only single dose in a single uh, dose in a day is required and it is given per oral. And it is with less side effects, but we can give combinations of uh, these when the iron concentration is very high like we usually prefer desirox along with deferiprone or sometimes if the patient has to undergo bone marrow transplant we give combinations of all three so you can uh, decide looking at the uh, uh, iron concentration of the body supportive care includes folic acid vaccinations care of uh, the other complications and all that follow-up is uh, very very uh, important so uh, as soon as the patient is diagnosis a uh, patient is diagnosed a patient should be evaluated for the transplant HLA typing should be done extended blood group antigen typing should be done every monthly CBC LFT RFT and record of blood transfusion should be maintained every three monthly growth monitoring serum ferritin levels every six monthly physical examination tenor staging dental uh, examination should be done and yearly one to two yearly cardiac functions endocrine functions and other functions have to be evaluated and patients should have all the records of all these things so this is about the management of uh, thalassemia just few um, slides about the prevention because uh, soon sankalp india foundation is going to launch 
this program in our uh, institute sankalp india foundation is a bangalore based ngo working for the thalassemic uh, patients for the they are working for thalassemia prevention cure and treatment they have a huge uh, thalassemia day care center they have a um, 20 bedded transplant unit and recently they have started working on uh, prevention of thalassemia by doing the uh, antenatal screening of all the pregnant women they have tie up with various uh, states various medical colleges and recently ethical clearance from our institute has been provided to them so they will screen all the antenatal mothers at mth hospital if the mother is having thalassemia minor they will screen uh, husband also and if both are uh, pos- uh, thalassemia trait then they will go for the antenatal diagnosis of the fetus everything will be sponsored by them we don't have to spend a penny for uh, this uh, thing uh so uh, we can prevent uh, thalassemia by uh, doing population uh, education mass screening genetic counseling and antenatal diagnosis so antenatal diagnosis can be done at 9 to 11 weeks of pregnancy by cvs chorionis villus sampling and amniocentesis at 16 to 18 weeks of pregnancy now just two three slides for bone marrow transplant because our institute is having bone marrow transplant uh, unit curative treatment is uh, bone marrow hematopoietic stem cell transplant so what is bone marrow transplant it is a process by which non functioning deficient or diseased bone marrow is eliminated by chemotherapy or radiation and it is replaced by healthy bone marrow uh, for the restoration of normal hematological and immunological functions so for thalassemic children which is the ideal age when a pediatrician or a general practitioner should refer the patient for the transplants so uh, lesser age the transplant outcome will be uh, better because of the uh, uh, less iron overload and the organ functions will be okay so risk categorization is done on the basis of age and liver size if the age of the patient is less than 5 years and liver size is less than 2 cm so thalassemia free survival after the transplant would be 92% these are low risk patients intermediate risk patient when age is more than 5 years and liver size is between 2 to 5 cm thalassemia uh, sir, outcome will be 72% after the transplant and high risk patient when age is um, uh, any matlab above 5 and liver size is more than 5 cm so outcome cut down to 50% now about the donor so a uh, matched sibling donor if the patient has matched sibling donor the outcome will be best but only 30% of the patients they have matched sibling donor so uh, but nowadays all over the world haplotransplants are quite in with very good results we also have started doing haplotransplants at our center so for our, our center the hierarchy for donor selection is this if the patient has hla matched sibling best then hla matched parents the next preference we uh, give to haplo identical transplant haplo identical transplant means any first degree relative uh, father mother sibling son or daughter can serve as a donor if he or she is more than 50% match and the facility of unrelated donor transplant is not available at our center so now uh, cost effectiveness so transplants are quite cost effective if we see at the total cost of uh, 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 total cost we spend on the treatment of thalassemia patients which comes around to 80 thousand to 1 lakh rupees in a year and uh, if we look at the normal life span 20 25 30 years so the total cost goes more than 25 to 30 lakhs so 
every thalassemic child should opt for the bone marrow trans transplant. So at private centers, the cost of bone marrow transplant is uh, 25 to 30 lakhs. And at our center, the cost of transplant comes to around 10 lakhs, which we arrange uh, through CSR funds. So patient doesn't have to bear any cost for the bone marrow transplant at our center. This is our unit situated in uh, fifth floor of super specialty hospital. This is the inside picture of our unit. If we look at the statistics of our unit, we have done more than 90 transplants, including adults also. But this is the statistics of uh, pediatric transplants only. So we have done 79 transplants out of them, 47 were of thalassemic patients. The others were sickle cell anemia, severe aplastic anemia, leukemias, and other conditions. So if we compare the results from the other institutions, it is quite comparable. Overall survival of our patients is 85%. Disease-free survival is 80%. And graft rejection was seen in around 6% of patients and mortality 14% of patients. So we have done 52 transplants in hemoglobinopathies out of 43 are alive. Nine have died because of certain regions, regions and uh, only three are uh, having autologous reconstitutions and they uh, are suffering from thalassemia. So there are, last slide this is, uh, uh, there are certain unmet needs in the thalassemia. Like we have to uh, set more numbers of daycare center modalities to optim optimize blood transfusion to each and every thalassemic patients. All the thalassemic children should have access to iron chelators, but unfortunately only 50% of the thalassemic patients are accessible to iron chelators. Antenatal screening facilities should be available throughout the countries and developing the cost-effective facilities for bone marrow transplant across the country should be there and to promote education and awareness uh, programs for the um, general populations should be there. So thank you so much and I am thankful to the transfusion uh, medicine department. Transfusion medicine department is the backbone of bone marrow transplant unit because many procedures are done by them and they are expert now and a lot of uh, blood components are needed by these patients so they are full time they are uh, supporting and they are helping us right from the day one until now thank you so much <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you, madam. That was uh, uh, precise and nutshell, uh, right from basics of thalassemia till the transplants. What we uh, hope maybe in future we come up with gene therapies also. Uh, I must congratulate you and your department for successful transplants in uh, pediatric. It is more challenging to adults. Uh, any question uh, from the audience? Thank you so much. Uh, just one uh, query, madam. Like uh, uh, blood bank and pediatric department, they are hand in hand. Well, uh, they are connected with the patients before they actually come to you for transplants. So, is there any policy uh, regarding the transfusion of these children to avoid elimination? So that they are fit for transfer. So, uh, no, for aluminization, actually, we don't have. We are trying to buy the machines so that we can go for extended uh, antigen typing. But uh, this, this problem we are facing with many of our patients. So, we are, I, I mean, we are not preventing aluminization till now to our patients. Uh, no, like uh, simple practice of uh, we need to. Okay, yeah. 
Yes. Or they will become unfit for yeah, the yeah. transplant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Long so that period. we follow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in this regard, Brahma sir, I would like to emphasize uh, with the help of Dean Sir, we are getting machine of immunohematology. Okay. And we are doing typing also as well as the antibody uh, screening. Let's. for Especially we will start with thalassemia patient. In future, there will be a no issue for aluminization. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'll request Dr. Kukyadav, sir, to come and felicitate uh, Preeti, ma'am. I'll request uh, Dr. Sachin to kindly felicitate uh, our chairperson, Dr. Ravi, sir, and uh, also uh, could join us in the felicitation. And also Dr. Amit Verma, sir. Uh, we would be now having the inaugural session of the conference. Uh, this will be conducted by Dr. Uh, Govind Tripathi, sir. Namaskar. मैं डॉक्टर गोविंद त्रिपाठी ट्रांसफर मेडिसिन विभाग की ओर से आप सभी का अभिनंदन करता हूं स्वागत करता हूं हेमेटोकॉन हेमेटोलॉजिकल डिसऑर्डर एंड वेयर एंड देयर मैनेजमेंट के आयोजन के अवसर का औपचारिक उद्घाटन के सर्वप्रथम मैं जो आयोजन के सचिव हैं डॉक्टर अमिता त्रिपाठी मैडम से निवेदन करता हूं कि अतिथियों को मंच पे लाएं आज के कार्यक्रम के हमारे मुख्य अतिथि हैं हमारे डीन सर डॉक्टर संजय दीक्षित साहब डॉक्टर भटनागर सर मालपानी मैडम सरकार मैडम से मैं अनुरोध करता हूँ मंच पर डॉक्टर अमित वर्मा सर डॉक्टर टीना राय डॉक्टर सचिन जैन सर डॉक्टर मयूरी और हमारे प्रिय डॉक्टर अशोक यादव सर इसके बाद ही लगेगा पर अब एक मिनट बताता हूँ जैसा yes, है कि किसी भी कार्यक्रम का शुभारंभ या उद्घाटन हम सरस्वती जी की प्रतिमा के माल्यार्पण कर और दीप प्रज्वलन के साथ करते हैं 
तो मैं मंच पर उपस्थित सभी अतिथियों से निवेदन करता हूँ कि आए दीप प्रज्वलन कर और मैं डॉक्टर त्रिपाठी से निवेदन करता हूँ कि साथ में दीप प्रज्वलन के करवाए आप हमारे विभाग तथा बायोकेमिस्ट्री विभाग की सबसे प्रिय मैडम डॉक्टर सरकार मैडम के स्वागत के लिए मैं डॉक्टर पीयूष शर्मा जी को आमंत्रित करता हूं कि आए मैडम का स्वागत करें
स्वागत की इस कड़ी में डॉक्टर अमित वर्मा सर के स्वागत के लिए मैं डॉक्टर प्रियंका मैडम को आमंत्रित करना चाहूंगा कि वो मंच पर आए और सर का स्वागत करें डॉक्टर प्रियंका की आवत डॉक्टर सचिन जैन सर के स्वागत के लिए मैं डॉक्टर सचिन शर्मा को आमंत्रित करता हूँ कि मंच पर आए सर का स्वागत करें ईना राय मैडम के स्वागत के लिए मैं डॉक्टर खुशबू लिखार मैडम को आमंत्रित करता हूँ मैडम का स्वागत हमारे विभाग के विभाग अध्यक्ष डॉक्टर यादव के स्वागत के लिए मैं डॉक्टर देवेश बुलबाके सर को आमंत्रित करना चाहूंगा कि मंच पर आए और सर का स्वागत एमएलएच ग्रुप से उपस्थित डॉक्टर मयूरी के स्वागत के लिए मैं निधि शर्मा मैडम को आमंत्रित करना चाहूंगा कि वहां मैडम का स्वागत है मंच पर उपस्थित अतिथि हमारे अतिथि नहीं पर बल्कि हमारे अपने हैं इनके सहयोग से हम सारे अस्पताल का काम या संस्था का काम इनकी देखरेख में करते हैं इन सबके सबके परिचय का अवगत कराने के लिए मैं स्वागत भाषण के लिए हमारे विभाग के विभाग अध्यक्ष डॉक्टर अशोक यादव को आमंत्रित करना चाहूंगा कि वाक्य अपना स्वागत भाषण रिस्पेक्टेड डीन सर प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर संजय दीक्षित साहब सीईओ एमजीएम मेडिकल कॉलेज एंड एसोसिएट हॉस्पिटल हमारे प्रिय कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट सुपर स्पेशलिटी हॉस्पिटल के डॉक्टर अजयदीप भटनागर जिनके मार्गदर्शन में यह पूरा सुपर स्पेशलिटी अस्पताल ही नहीं कार्डियोलॉजी विभाग हर दिन नए आयाम छू रहा है हमारी चाचा नेहरू बाल चिकित्सालय की सुप्रिंटेंडेंट प्रोफेसर प्रीति मालपानी मैडम बायोकेमिस्ट्री विभाग की विभाग अध्यक्ष सरकार मैडम अरबिंदो मेडिकल कॉलेज से आए हुए हमारे कलीग और हमारे सभी कार्यक्रमों में सहभागी बनने वाले डॉक्टर अमित वर्मा हमारे सचिन जैन जो कि दिल्ली से आए हुए हैं और हमें इन्हें अपना सचिन शर्मा का प्रतिबिंब दिखता है जब भी हमें कोई दिक्कत आती है हमें हमेशा सचिन टू सचिन कांटेक्ट करना पड़ता है बिकॉज ही इज ए मास्टर इन फिलोसाइटोमीटर हमारी मेडिकल उससे एमसीआई से मेडिकल काउंसिल भोपाल से आई हुई टीना मैडम जो कि विदिशा मेडिकल कॉलेज में एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर हैं आपका भी मैडम बहुत बहुत स्वागत है और एमएलएच ग्रुप की तरफ से हम सभी अंडर ग्रेजुएट्स और पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट्स स्टूडेंट्स जो कि हमारे साथ ऑनलाइन और ऑफलाइन जुड़े हुए हैं इन सब का भी मैं अपने विभाग ट्रांसफ्यूजन मेडिसिन की तरफ से मैं डॉक्टर प्रोफेसर अशोक यादव और इस कॉन्फ्रेंस की ऑर्गेनाइजिंग 
सेक्रेटरी अमृता त्रिपाठी की तरफ से आप सभी लोगों का बहुत बहुत स्वागत करता हूं ये कॉन्फ्रेंस मेडिकल लर्निंग हब की तरफ से जो कि एक डिवीजन है टीसी एफ टी सी फोर ए दिस टेक्निकल केयर फॉर ऑल इंडिया दिस इज ए डिजिटल प्लेटफॉर्म विच कोआर्डिनेट एंड कोऑपरेटिंग द डिफरेंट मेडिकल कॉलेज एंड मेडिकल इंस्टीट्यूट टू मेक ए सच ए वंडरफुल प्लेटफॉर्म टू कम्स टू गैदर एंड लर्न टू गैदर सो दिस इज ए वंडरफुल प्लेटफॉर्म एंड दिस कॉन्फ्रेंस इज इन ए हाइब्रिड फॉर्म एंड रादर देन आई विल से इन हाई क्रॉस फॉर्म हाइब्रिड मीन्स इट इज ए ऑनलाइन एज वेल एज ऑन द ऑफलाइन प्लेटफॉर्म एंड हाई क्रॉस मीन्स वी आर पार्टिसिपेटिंग ऑल अंडर ग्रेजुएट पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट एस आर एज वी नो द लर्निंग इज ए लाइफ लॉन्ग प्रोसेस एंड ईच पेशेंट इज गिव अस ए चैलेंज एंड एवरी थिंग वी विल लर्न फ्रॉम द पेशेंट्स एज वेल एज विद द कॉन्फ्रेंस एंड विद द इंटरेक्शन विद द अदर our colleagues as well as with the undergraduates so i welcome all and i hope that we will enjoy as well as learn something from this conference and we thankful to the organizers and thankful to participants so welcome to all delegates thank you very much bahut bahut dhanyawad sir ye hum logo ka saubhagya hai ki aapke sab logon ke sath kaam karne ka hamari pd ko mil raha hai aur aise aayojan ke liye hum sakshi bane hain aaj ke karyakram ke hamare mukh atithi aur hamare khas dr sanjay dikshit sir ko main aamantrit karna chahunga ki apna atithi bhashan humko sambodhit kare dr dignity son dais participants and delegates on behalf of mgm medical college indore i welcome you all as you know the medical learning hub is uh, a cme platform and services that engage healthcare providers and specialists in learning and skill enhancement training to benefit patient care and learner growth I have been told that the platform has a large base of doctors and nurses in India and Africa, and that the team is on a mission to create equity among doctors across the vast diversity of our country. And uh, I congratulate Dr. Ashok Yadav and his team for taking these innovative ideas and always on foot, foreigner uh, runner for all the activities. and um, as you know this transfusion medicine department is first in madhya pradesh which is started in a government setup and uh, they are doing lot of activities like net uh, they are the first in uh, uh, blood truck collection also and uh, daily every day they are doing some of the charity work and i, I congratulate the team of ashok yadav and his organizing team thank you थैंक यू सर जिस संस्था के द्वारा एक चेंज है हम डॉक्टर भटनागर सर के उद्बोधन से मरूम रह जाए ऐसी हो नहीं सकता सर के विचारों से अवगत कराने के लिए मैं सर को आमंत्रित करना चाहूंगा कि आप i welcome you all for this enlightening session and i hope all of you will be benefited by it cardiology department may we used to get though we are not it's not so common but a like restrictive cardiomyopathy ke uh, group mein kai patients aate the and most of the people would turn out to be hemochromatosis some one or some people are primary and some people are secondary hemochromatosis particularly as a complication of iron overload occurring in, during the context of thalassemia treatment of course over the period of last two or three decades <clears throat> there has been a paradigm shift from the treatment which used to occur a long back in the form of massive transfusions now the treatment has uh, changed and i the department of transfusion medicine is um, progressing in that way to provide, provide the latest that. state of the art uh, uh, medical treatment for the same i congratulate dr yadav for the same thank you very much
थैंक यू सर कुछ करने की इच्छा रहती है कुछ करने के साथ में किसी का साथ मिल जाए और इसी में कुछ एक ग्रुप जो मिल जाता है तो कार्यक्रम सफल हो जाता है और ऐसे कार्यक्रम में जो हमारे अतिथि आए हैं और जो लोग यहाँ श्रोता और वक्ता के रूप में थे मैं एम एल एच ग्रुप की मैडम डॉक्टर मयूरी को वोट ऑफ थैंक्स के लिए आमंत्रित करना चाहूँगा Good morning all so on behalf of medical learning hub i would like to thank mgm medical college for helping us in organizing this conference dr ashok yadav sir and their team in finalizing the agenda speakers and overall conference i would also like to thank all the attendees to, uh, who are joining who have joined us online and on site for uh, attending and making this a success now i request uh, dr shubhi to kindly take the stage and please continue the conference please enjoy thank you Thank you all for joining us. thank you all the dignitaries um uh, now we are moving ahead to the next scientific session on diagnosis treatment and management of chronic lymphocytic leukemia in different uh, stages uh, stages the speaker for this session is dr vinay vora who is consultant hematologist and bone marrow transplant at chl cbcc cancer center indore he has done his md medicine dm uh, clinical hematology and hemato oncology his fellowship in leukemia and bone marrow transplant from canada he is a renowned hematologist clinical hematologist and a bone uh, transplant uh, surgeon and has uh, won many academic uh, awards Uh, for chairing this session i'll request dr sachin jain to kindly chair this session good morning everyone um, at the outset only i would like to thank uh, department of transfusion medicine mgm medical college allied hospitals organizing committee for inviting me here and of course thank you all the attendees who are present here online offline for sparing your saturday morning for this academic session
I have been asked to speak on how we diagnose and manage uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia in 2024. So this is how So those who look into microscope would know that this is how typical CLL would look like with uh, presence of large number of monotonous looking lymphocytes with some dark blue cytoplasm and of course uh, presence of smudge cells which are not shown here. So if we go back to basic, we all know that hematopoietic stem cell actually differentiate into two types of cells. One is lymphoid progenitor, the second is myeloid progenitor. When malignancy develop at this progenitor cell, uh, maybe lymphoid or myeloid, we would have acute lymphoblastic or myeloblastic leukemia. But when we go further ahead into the stages of development and when we have mature lymphocyte, mature lymphocyte malignancy would either give rise to CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma and of course plasma cell dyscrasia. So CLL is a malignancy, hematological malignancy which develops from a uh, mature lymphocyte once it has uh, matured beyond the stage of uh, progenitor cell. Uh, so if we peep into history, the history dates back probably to uh, two centuries ago when the work on CLL started and this first era which lasted for almost 50 years, the credit go to this physician, Dr. A. Velpew, who for the first time recognized CLL as a distinct clinical entity and then a lot of work was done. In fact, these last two decades were actually memorable decades for CLL because many therapeutic as well as diagnostic advances have been made into CLL. Because I can see a lot of uh, PG students here, we would start from basics. CLL is a malignancy of B lymphocytes which is characterized by proliferation and accumulation of good number of small mature lymphocytes. It is very important to differentiate CLL chronic lymphocytic leukemia from MBL which is monoclonal B lymphocytosis. MB MBL is a pre-malignant stage. The cutoff figure that magic figure of 5000 is very important when absolute lymphocyte count is more than 5,000, of course, these lymphocytes have to be monoclonal. When it is more than 5,000, we would call this as CLL if other criteria on flow cytometry are met. As far as epidemiology of CLL is concerned, when we were taught hematology, we were told that it is, it is the disease of Western world. That still holds true because as compared to our Western counterpart, we don't see CLL that often. But having said that, I think something has changed in last 10 years. We are seeing good number of CLL patients, probably because of change in epidemiology or because of more awareness. Good number of patients, especially in our country, are coming with CLL at younger age. They have, them, they have some different characteristic. The diagnosis is made at young age. They have aggressive phenotype. As far as familial association is concerned, 10% of the patients who have CLL may have uh, their siblings, may they have uh, may have their parents who would develop CLL or other non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And this has been proven in familial association studies. So what are the what are the risk factors for the development of CLL? The uh, you know, in last two centuries, a lot of studies were done, but we have zeroed in on three factors. First is genetic predisposition some development, some genetic changes, some somatic mutations during the cell division, which would give rise to typical translocations or genetic mutations of CLL would ultimately give rise to CLL. That is one. There was an observation that CLL is more common in farmers. And that is why it is probably thought, thought that chemicals which are present in pesticides are responsible at some point of time for the development of CLL. And there is one peculiar industry, which is rubber industry where uh, exposure to solvents during this rubber manufacturing uh, leads to development of CLL. These all are theories. The causal association has not yet been proven. So how do we diagnose CLL? The biggest problem with the CLL diagnosis is 80% of the patients would be asymptomatic on presentation. So in other words, when they have CLL, the diagnosis would be made when patients go to their doctor for some other reason. Simple febrile illness at, age of, at the age of 50 years, CBC is done, we find leukocytosis, lymphocytosis. Pre-employment checkup is done, we find leukocytosis. 
pre op workup is done for the fitness we find leukocytosis so that is how 80% of the patients would be asymptomatic when they are diagnosed only 20% of the patients would have symptoms specific to cll the cll symptoms are mainly because of infiltration of marrow infiltration of lymph nodes and enlargement of liver and spleen when spleen is enlarged beyond limits it would give rise to mechanical symptom lot of abdominal pain fullness weight loss typical b symptoms when symptoms are because of lymphadenopathy patients would be concerned with growing lymph nodes in their axilla in their groin and when cll progresses there are good number of patients who would come at progressive stage of cll when they would have marrow infiltration of cll leading to anemia thrombocytopenia and immuno paralyzed condition where they would have repeated infections so rarely patient would come with come with repeated chest infections cbcs are done and then for the first time they are diagnosed to have cll rare manifestations of cll can be leukemia cutis where there are plaques and no nodules on skin probably 2 to 3% patients would present like this a very peculiar manifestation of cll in rare patients can be mpgn and that is one of the renal manifestation of cll so when we say how do we diagnose it of course we need some clinical background we need some history and with that we would come to some basic investigations basic cbc is very important where you would see probably normal hemoglobin normal platelet count increased leukocyte and lymphocyte count so in adults uh, when we see into differential the neutrophil is predominant cell if you are seeing lymphocyte as a predominant cell immediate next step would be peripheral blood smear where you would see those um, you know monotonous looking lymphocytes and lot of smudge cells so cbc followed by blood smear and of course flow cytometry immunophenotype would help us diagnosing cll cll at the same time help us differentiate from cll uh, help us uh, differentiate cll from other uh, differential diagnosis like mantle cell lymphoma and others but the story doesn't stop here in 2024 because once we diagnose we need to prognosticate so what are the prognostic markers prognostication markers which are must when we diagnose cll first is karyotype where we we would see are uh, different karyotypic abnormalities in fact this is very important because we have two points here first depending on the karyotypic abnormalities we would put them in into a particular prognosis group at the same time now this is an era of targeted therapy we've got targeted drugs which are used depending on the uh, the cytogenetic or uh, this fish abnormalities which are present at the time of diagnosis do we need bone marrow test in each and every patient the answer is no most of the patients do not need bone marrow test when they are diagnosed as cll because almost all of the workup can be done from peripheral blood itself where we have circulating malignant cells coming to prognosis we have two different categories of factors first is general factors which are not specific to cll and this is not difficult to guess because uh, factors like advanced age comorbidities rapid uh, you know shorter lymphocyte doubling time would put patients into a bad prognostic category and then we have specific factors such as those karyotypic abnormalities fish abnormalities which would put patient into different categories like low intermediate and high risk group this deletion 17p is very important because presence of deletion 17p has has been a breakthrough in the treatment of cll this has opened the entire new era of targeted therapy and believe me in cll now days are gone where we are giving chemotherapy immunotherapy using this 17p the entire treatment paradigm of cll has changed when i was being trained in hematology in 2006 7 8 we were using immunotherapy chemotherapy but now in last two years i hardly remember a patient of cll where we are using chemotherapy uh staging of cll the credit goes to dr kanti rai indian doctor who's now settled in us in fact for last 40 years we have been using this rai staging for cll where we classify cll patients into low risk intermediate and high risk depending on whether they whether they have lymphadenopathy organomegaly and presence of anemia thrombocytopenia now see this staging system was devised 40 years ago that time there were no karyotype markers there were no fish studies but the the system which was devised by dr kanti rai still holds true but now in 2024 in addition to this we are using this different prognostic indicators where we would incorporate patient's age presence of deletion 17p which i have mentioned as a important prognostic marker some gene mutation especially 
uh, immunoglobulin heavy gene heavy gene mutation depending on the risk factors we would classify patients into different uh, subgroups and they would be assigned to a particular uh, prognostic category so to make this simple there are many markers but then at the same time if we want to simpli simplify this in our clinical practice if uh, deletion 13 q is present typically patient has low risk category of cll if deletion 17 p is present patient typically has high risk category of cll so last part of cll and that is management of cll because we as clinicians are concerned with treatment of cll now this is one malignancy which stands apart from other malignancy because of the fact that in spite of diagnosing cll in time 80% of the patients would not be offered any treatment. They would be just placed on wait and watch category. Now, this is in contrast to other cancers where the day cancer is diagnosed, immediately the treatment is planned. And that is why CLL is different from other hematological malignancies. It is different from other solid tumors. So, we have two cases here. And with this background, I would like to have some inputs from at least medicine PGs who are present here. We have 64 year, 65, uh, 65 year old male, no comorbidities, asymptomatic. CBC was done for some pre-op workup and he was ultimately diagnosed to have CLL deletion 17Q, 17P. This is uh, 17Q, but this is 17P. HB of 13.2, which is normal. Total leukocyte count of 3,40,000. Platelets normal. So we know that this is leukocytosis and of course flow cytometry was done. We know that this is CLL. On clinical examination, there is mild hepatospinomegaly and some lymphadenopathy. This is one case and we have second case here, 45 year old male. He's got history of weight loss of almost 10 kg and these B symptoms, this is classified as B symptom that is there for last two months, diagnosed again as BCLL with deletion 13Q, HB of 8.5, total leukocyte 45,000. Initial patient, the total leukocyte count were in lakhs. This is 45,000. There is thrombocytopenia. Direct Combs test is negative. Bone marrow was done. It shows diffuse infiltration uh, by of marrow by the CLL. So can anyone tell me, there are two, three questions here. Do these patients need treatment? If yes, when and how? If no, why? Any, any input? First case, asymptomatic, 3,50,000 count. Second patient, symptomatic, just 45,000 count. Anybody can take this up. No medicine PG is here. Fine. So probably we'll deal with these cases uh, at the end. Now these cases have one thing in common and that is CLL. So that is why we come to a very important uh, aspect that do we need to treat CLL in each and every patient? The answer is no. There are very few indications of treating CLL. First is presence of B symptoms. B symptoms is nothing but night sweats, night sweats, weight loss and persistent fever. Then presence of unexplained anemia, unexplained thrombocytopenia in patients with CLL. Presence of recurrent infections and use splenomegaly leading to mechanical symptoms. These are few indications where we would start treating patients with CLL. Otherwise, WBC count is not the criteria where we decide on treating or not treating anybody with CLL. So this is for the last 50 years, the history of CLL therapy. It all started with a very uh, common drug, which is now available, fluorambucil, very cheap drug. And this is being used for the last 50 years. Then the, then the era of chemotherapy, immunotherapy came. And now, as I said, last two decades have been memorable decades where chemo immuno is out and now we are talking and treating patients with CLL with targeted therapy, ibrutinib, akala ibrutinib and of course CAR T cell therapy which is coming up in a big way in patients with CLL. So how do we treat CLL? Uh, depending on, uh, there are many factors. First is age, second is uh, karyotype abnormalities and third, very, very important in our setting, and that is how well patient can afford the treatment because targeted therapies can be expensive. This is from NCCN guideline. I'm sorry, this is a very busy slide, but the purpose of the slide was to show you that in 2024, whether patient has 17P or non-17P, we treat them as as uh, with, with targeted therapy, therapy, which is ibrutinib, akala ibrutinib. Just last few slides about the drugs which are being used in the treatment of CLL. 
first is chlorambucil easily available very cheap being used for last 50 years but the biggest problem is it doesn't it never improved overall survival it just gave some relief in the mechanical symptoms it reduced splenic size it reduced the lymph node size but overall survival was never there so it is used sometimes with one of the immunotherapy second is chemotherapy chemo immunotherapy as i told you it is already out there are only few patients very fit physically fit less than 50 no deletion 17p there we would use a combination of chemotherapy which is fcr third bendamustine rituximab which used to be a darling combination for the treatment of cll 20 years ago is now almost out so this is how hematology oncology has been changing what we learned during our pg days we are not practicing that now and that is why we need to have such meetings where we can update our knowledge Ibrutinib. Now, now this is the hero on the block. This is a breakthrough. This was developed by Johnson and Johnson, and this has been there for the last ten years. This is being used upfront, you know, left and right for patients who need treatment for CLL, who can afford. And now we have generic versions uh, in India where the cost of treatment has come down. So, ibrutinib. Uh, the best part is you don't need to take chemotherapy. It is once daily dosing. You are not developing side effects of chemotherapy. And as far as overall survival, progression-free survival is concerned, it is definitely, definitely better than chemo immunotherapy. Side effects, very particular, cardiac side effects, atrial fibrillation, hypertension. You have to be very careful when you give ibrutinib with aspirin, clopidogrel, warfarin, because uh, there can be drug interaction and patients can bleed. Another new drug over ibrutinib is Akala ibrutinib because we know that ibrutinib has got some side effects, mainly cardiac. So we have this newer drug where the risk of cardiac side effects is lesser and lesser. So Akala versus ibrutinib. Akala ibrutinib is cardio safe as compared to ibrutinib. We have another new drug which is venetoclax, quite commonly used in patients with CLL. Of course, a lot of side effects. So do you think problem of plenty is here because there are so many drugs so is plenty a problem in CLL I would say answer is no because we've got very clear cut guidelines of how and when we treat CLL depending on the age depending on the fitness status depending on whether patient has deletion 17p or not we would start treating them dep uh, you know depending on the risk uh, group they are placed into they would either go to ibrutinib akala ibrutinib or younger fit patients without deletion 17p would end up receiving chemoimmunotherapy. So, so many things in CLL. In fact, the story doesn't stop here because in next decade, we are going to have 10 more molecules. These all are, uh, you know, um, uh, pathways where uh, scientists are studying and developing newer drugs, targeted drugs for the treatment of CLL. It is all Pandora's box and we are going to have lot of new drugs and I think future is bright when it comes to treating CLL. So with that last two slides complications of CLL there are only three complications of CLL first infections second infections and third infections 80 90 percent of the patients on CLL treatment off treatment would have infections as a problem because they're immunoglobulin immunoglobulin producing system is paralyzed and that's why they have recurrent chest infections recurrent sinus infections and uh, recurrent abdominal infections how do we prevent them timely vaccination this three day is very important pneumococcal vaccination influenza and now we have third arm which is herpes vaccination herpes zoster vaccination so coming to back coming back to our patients first elderly male asymptomatic and uh, very high WBC count very scary generalized lymphadenopathy and mild hepatospinomegaly so because there are no medicine PGs here Dr. Akshay can take this up Dr. Akshay maybe you can guide others how do we treat such patients CLL is one disease which the hematologist are very pleased to see or any or any oncologist is pleased to see because most of the time we are not supposed to treat these patients. So even if the WBC count is 3 lakhs or 3.5 lakhs, the patient is asymptomatic, you can still follow up the patient. 
and uh, once the patient progresses if he has right. symptoms like weight loss b symptoms anything then only we are supposed to treat the patient right so totally agree we would put this patient on wait and watch of course with careful follow up कई बार पेशेंट पूछते हैं कि डॉक्टर साहब आप तो बता रहे हो कैंसर है तो ट्रीटमेंट क्यों नहीं शुरू शुरू कर रहे हो सो दिस इज द प्रॉब्लम विद सी एल एल बट वेट एंड वॉच इम्यूनाइज देम रेगुलर इम्यूनाइजेशन रेगुलर फॉलो अप एंड वेन एवर देर इज अ प्रोग्रेशन वी वुड स्टार्ट ट्रीटिंग देम विथ वन ऑफ दी टारगेटेड ड्रग एंड सेकेंड क्वेश्चन अगेन अक्षय दिस सेकेंड फोर्टी फाइव ईयर ओल्ड मेल टेन के जी वेट लॉस डब्ल्यू बी सी काउंट जस्ट फोर्टी फाइव थाउजेंड अनिमिया थ्रोम्बोसाइटोपीनिया डी सी टी निगेटिव सो वट इज टू बी डन So again, now this patient at 45 years of age, he's symptomatic for the disease. He's having anemia, B symptoms. He's having thrombocytopenia. He's supposed to be treated now. And now for the treatment, as you have importantly mentioned now that the targeted therapy is the the therapy to go. So yes, BTK inhibitors should be the drug of choice for these patients. These are the patients who are supposed to be treated for any reason. Right. So with this, I think I come to the. end of my talk thank you so much for your patient listening thanks dr vinay it's an excellent talk you have covered i think all from the basic aspects to the recent trends in cll so i think you have covered everything any questions from the audience any question no okay just to add uh, means dr vinay's talk whenever you will see the uh, uh, total count high or low but absolute lymphocyte count is 4000 so always uh, just rule out cll and just advise flow always in sometimes when you are getting uh, absolute lymphocyte count 4000 or 4500 many of times indolent uh, kind of cll we are missing so in that case is always we have to do flow thank you thank you dr vinay So, sir, there is one uh, online question at twelve o'clock. When patient comes with fifteen thousand TLC, with more than five thousand absolute lymphocytes, and there is no evidence of lymphocytosis in previous three months, so how do we go for diagnosis? For this, it is very important that we should have absolute lymphocytosis at least for three months, and we would need flow cytometry. So, for this patient, what I would do is. of course peripheral smear examination some counseling i would call them monthly for monthly visits we would see whether wbc counts are rising because there are some other dds infectious mononucleosis some autoimmune disorders can give rise to leukocytosis lymphocytosis so it is important to differentiate and when we have absolute lymphocytosis for almost 3 months the next thing is diagnostic uh, evaluation which is flow cytometry and other uh, genetic markers yes, and that is how seen carefully in these type of cases and then okay there is one more question why do we wait for disease progression it's a very important question because this is how we answer patients family also their question is once you have diagnosed and see as cll you are saying that it's a cancer you start if you cannot start we'll go to mumbai that is their uh, uh, concern but cll is one disease which is not curable so right now we cannot cure it we can put cll in remission so there is a uh, theory there, there is a philosophy that for this low grade malignancy like cll like follicular lymphoma where you cannot cure it when disease is in dormant state you would start treating only when disease is progressing because if you utilize all your weapons if you utilize all your drugs when they are not needed actually when they are needed you will be done there would be no other drugs left so for most of the low grade hematological malignancy not doesn't just apply to cll for uh, all low grade hematological malignancies we would treat only when there is progression otherwise patients are asymptomatic i have got patients where wbc count is more than 6 lakh it is very scary but they are totally fine there is one more question won should we take all these because i think i don't know whether we are on time or okay take last one i think then okay won't the increased wbc count hyper viscosity yes in cll sometimes it can it can cause uh, but then in in practice we don't see hyper viscosity even with wbc count of say 5 lakh 6 lakh i don't know what is the reason for that but these are not very common um thank you so much sir i'll request uh, dr sachin sharma sir to kindly felicitate uh, dr vinay
Thank you so much, sir, for your presentation today. Uh, it was a very informative session. Next, um, next, I'll request Dr. Nidhi Sharma, ma'am, to kindly felicitate uh, Dr. Sachin Jain, sir, for chairing this session. Thank you so much. Now we will be proceeding to our next speaker session on diagnosis, treatment and management of acute myeloid leukemia in different stages. This would be uh, done by Dr. Akshay Lahoti, who is Assistant Professor in Department of Clinical Hematology at Super Speciality Hospital MGM Medical College Indore. Dr. Akshay has completed his graduation from uh, JNMC um, and post-graduation from CHRC Indore and followed by hematology training including post-doctoral uh, fellowships from premium institutes like Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical College, Lucknow and he has also done his DM from AIMS. Further, he is specialized in bone marrow transplant from Tata Medical Center, Kolkata and has clean area of interest towards malignant hematology, bleeding and thrombotic disorders, hemo uh, hemoglobin uh, globinopathies, and many more. I'll uh, invite you, sir. Uh, to chair this session, I'll request Dr. Uh, Sudhir Kataria and Dr. Aksh Aksharaditya Shukla, sir, to kindly chair this session. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you, uh, thank the organizers, the MLH group, Ashok Yadav sir and the entire Transfusion Department team of the MG Medical College for <clears throat> organizing this conference and giving me the opportunity to uh, speak on AML. Uh, I welcome Dr. Sudhir Gattaria sir, who is the... Uh, adult bone marrow transplant head at super specialty hospital he is a radiation oncologist and a very dear consultant for me uh, also dr akshara ditya who is a dear friend and he is the assistant professor in pathology over here so with this i would like to start uh, the conference uh, i would like to start the talk of mine which is aml so we'll discuss the diagnosis current therapeutic strategies and supportive care for aml so with the previous speaker has spoken about cll and this is AML, so these are the entire different malignancies in hematology. So when you see a patient of CLL, you are very happy. Because yes, most of the time you are not supposed to treat them. Uh, whenever you start treatment, it is mostly on the daycare basis. But for the AML, when you see a patient, it gives you the goosebumps. And also the patient's family and the patient. Because the treatment is quite hectic. It is quite aggressive. It is quite cost-consuming and ultimately you need the results. So for the CLL, when sir has told that almost 80% of the time you do not need treatment, the survival for CLL patients is almost 100% at 5 years, which is the contrast in AML. In spite of spending 50 lakhs in 6 months, only 30% of the patient will survive. So yes, this is a very difficult disease to treat. And there is an overlap between oncologist and hematologist. Most of the oncologists will treat all the malignancies of hematology. 
but they will skip this AML for hematologist because this is aggressive and really difficult to treat. So let's see what it is. So I have no conflict of interest. And in general terms, what is AML? So AML is a cancer of the blood and the bone marrow and hematological malignancies for that purpose. It is the most common type of acute leukemia in adults. This type of cancer usually gets worse quickly if it is not treated, unlike CLL. So I'm not comparing, but just giving you the perspective. So the AML, once you diagnose, you're supposed to treat. Even for two days, you cannot leave the patient. So when you diagnose a patient, you need to tell them, yes, this is life-threatening. And any infection, if they acquire within these two, three days, will defer your treatment for almost a week or two. And that will be life-threatening for the patient. So this is a bone marrow and this is from, this is a powerhouse for all the uh, blood components which are being produced in our body. So this is the thing and this slide has been shown previously too. And I'll just uh, uh, re-emphasize where this AML is. This is not being hydrated. So you have blood stem cells, which will produce a myeloid stem cell and lymphoid stem cells. And uh, these are the cells which will mature and proliferate into the mature RBCs, platelets and WBCs. So when there is a blockage in the differentiation at the myeloblast level, this is the population which will proliferate and it will replace all your mature components with the myeloblasts. So when there is a proliferation of myeloblast in the bone marrow, it is AML. So it is a group of aggressive hematological malignancies and it constitutes around 1-2% to 2 of all cancer incidences. So let's speak about the statistics. So 60 to 85 years of age, relapse rate after induction therapy are as follows. So it is a deadly disease, yes. So 50% of them will relapse within a year even if you have given the complete treatment as required and 80% of them will relapse within 5 years. The survival of AML, the overall survival I'm talking, it is including the low risk, intermediate and the high risk. So overall survival is around 30% at 5 years. So when you have given the complete therapy, 30% of the patients will survive. And if not, nobody will survive. So at least for these 30 patients, we have to treat 100%. What causes AML? <clears throat> so when you search on the Google, you will see n number of risk factors for AML. But these are just the risk factors. Many of them are non-modifiable, like age, sex, you cannot modify them. You have to live with that. And with all the risk factors, many people who have no risk factor will develop AML. And many people who have many risk factors will not develop. So risk factor is just a risk factor, but nobody can conclude that this can cause AML. Like in any other cancer also. But there are two, three factors which have shown and they have proven that they are the risk factors for progression to AML. So one is some genetic disorders. Any genetic disorder like any marrow failure syndrome, inherited bone marrow failure syndromes have the propensity to progress to AML. Any uh, chromosomal breakage disorders like ataxia, bloom or leaf Romani syndrome. In the poll question also we had some question regarding ALL. This is about AML. Any therapy if the patient has received for previous any malignancy with the alkylators or any etoposide, topoisomerate, resimilators, anthracyclines they are the risk factors for the development of AML in future. Both the drugs have some lack or latency time. Maybe after 5 to 7 years of receiving alkylators, if the patient is coming up with an AML, you can uh, tell the patient that this might be a probable cause for your AML disease. And with the anthracyclines and the topoisomerase, 1 to 2 years is the latency for the development of AMLs. How do these patients present, clinically present? So we'll discuss the presentation with a clinical case scenario. So let's see Mr. Thom Mrs. Thomas, who is a 70 year old patient who presents to the clinic with the uh, complaints of loss of appetite, fever, weight loss, abdominal swelling. And this is an acute history, probably within three to five days. And when you do a CBC, you see a uh, pancytopenia with a WBC count of 2800, hemoglobin 6.7 and platelets 25,000. What are you supposed to do? you are supposed to see a peripheral smear for that patient. When you see a peripheral smear, you have 20% blast. Now, how do you proceed? So patient will present with any of these presentations. 
purpuras, hemorrhage, any viral reactivations, gum hypertrophy, and these are all acute. Any skin manifestation of any malignancy with present with leukemia cutis. And when you see such patients, you do a CBC, a peripheral smear, first of all. When you have a suspicion of AML, which will tell you that there are some blasts in the peripheral smear, then you proceed with the other tests. And what are those other tests? A bone marrow aspiration biopsy, like in CLL, in AML, you are supposed to do a bone marrow biopsy if the patient is having low WBC counts or if the picture is pancytopenia. Otherwise, from a peripheral blood, if the number of blasts are sufficient, let's say the WBC count is more than 20,000 with almost 50 to 60 percent blast, then most of the investigation can be carried out without a bone marrow from a peripheral blood. What investigations are you supposed to send and why? That is important. So, a morphology just to click whether there are blasts or not, unless you see any blasts in the peripheral smear. So, a good pathologist, a good uh, clinician and pathologist relation has to be there so that we can guide the pathologist that this is a scene, you need to see the smear carefully. And if there is a blast, then you need to run specific tests to document that it is AML. And that test is known as flow cytometry or immunophenotype. Once you diagnose that it is an AML, now again, uh, you need to uh, risk study for the patient, whether you need to treat so that the therapy can be revised. And also you can prognosticate the patient that this patient will respond to your treatment. And these are the chances of the response to your therapy. So for that reason, you need to do some genetic studies, which include conventional karyotype and some genetic studies for other markers. So Dr. Uh, Ms. Thomas went ahead with the uh, further investigation because the cytopenia, there was pancytopenia. So when did, when we did a peripheral smear examination, we can see these blasts over there. And these are the characteristic blasts, although we cannot see any ore rods over here, but these are uh, atypical cells, which are not matching any of the normal physiological cells of a body. And these are the blasts. And this is a bone marrow, which is studded with all these cells over here with hardly, we can see any megakaryocytes or any uh, maturing cells, including the uh, Milo metamilo over here. Although this is a very low resolution field. And this is a karyotype. So here we can see in the karyotype, this is a chromosomal analysis where you evaluate the metaphases of the chromosome. And when you analyze those metaphases, you can see that there is some uh, deletion over here. This is a chromosome 5. So there is some deletion over here. There is some changes in the 6th chromosome, 7th chromosome. There is a uh, completely deletion of the 9th chromosome. There is some problem with the 11th, 12th. So there are multiple chromosomes which are affected in this patient. So it is known as a complex karyotype because you cannot document that only single or double things are affected. There are multiple chromosomes which are affected over here. So complex karyotype. So we need to remember that this person is having a complex stereotype so that we can correlate in the uh, next slide. And this is the uh, NGS study where in the chromosomal karyotype you tend to see the gross appearance of the chromosome. And when you do a genetic study, you will target the genes which are now responsible for the leukemias. So when you do an NGS, you will see that there is some mutation in the ASXL1, SRSF2, TET2 and TP53. So we'll remember the three genes, ASXL1, that these genes are mutated in this patient. So now with all, all these things, we need to prognosticate the patient that you are landing into high risk or moderate risk or standard risk so that we can counsel the family and his therapy can be defined. Other factors to influence the outcome of run from the genetics, that is the age, the WBC count, the underlying infections, any previous therapy he has received, any previous disorder the patient has, and that will define all our therapy. So classification of AML has evolved over time. So initially it was FAB classification, which was based on morphology. But nowadays the FAB classification is almost obsolete. And nowadays we are only focusing on the genes for the prognostic purpose and defining the AML. So in 1976, this FAB classification was formed and the morphological basis was evaluated over that time. But in 1997, we found that this classification is not working because few patients are doing fine with the therapy you are giving and few patients are not doing fine. So we defined some genetics. And eventually in 2016, we added those genetic markers into the classification of AML. And this is a molecular classification of AML that so many genes are responsible for the development of AML in different patients.
and that is why you need to uh, target these genes or you need to stratify so mr uh, our patient thomas he had two problems in the uh, evaluation he had a complex karyotype and otherwise he had asxl1 srsf2 and tp53 mutation so clinically he is landing into the adverse risk category and unless you do any chromosomal translocations or a genetic study for a patient of aml you won't be able to risk stratify those patients and this is important nowadays and we can clearly see that if the patient is having good risk the prognosis is almost more than 80% survival at 10 years so these patients who are having inversion 16 or translocation 15 16 they will survive for 10 years with the therapy you give but the person who is having tp53 or inversion 3 their chances of survival is less than 10% so they will really do bad with the treatment you give so these are the patients in which you are need to do more and that is why more number of targeted therapies are now into the treatment armamentarium <clears throat> so with this the prognosis the classification the diagnosis the causes we will move forward towards the treatment of aml so over here we can see that 3 plus 7 that is 3 days of uh, anthracyclines and 7 days of cytrabine was the standard of of care for all the AML patients till 2017. From 2017 onwards, we have targeted therapies because we have revised the classification of AML based on the genetic profile. And there are certain inhibitors or targeted therapies which are supposed to be given to these patients who have those genetic markers in your evaluation so that you can improve on their uh, survival. As we have seen that till 2017 30% of the AML could survive for more than 5 years so for these population or for these AML patients we need more therapy so that we can make uh, more betterment of these patients so from 2017 we have multiple therapies into our drug house and this is how we devise the therapy for AML so once you diagnose you give some therapy to these patients you bring them into remission and then you consolidate them with either transplant or some chemotherapy or you can give some continuous or maintenance therapy to these patients. So once you see a patient, if the patient is less than 40 years, he's fit, he's having no comorbidities, that means the patient is eligible for induction therapy. So the therapy of AML is divided into two parts. Either you can treat them aggressively or you cannot treat them aggressively. That depends on the patient fitness and also the biological markers which you have got from the uh, diagnosis. So once you treat the patients who are eligible for intensive therapy with the uh, intensive therapy once the patient is under remission which we have to see via bone marrow or some ngs markers the mrd analysis then you can either give the chemotherapy as a consolidation or you can give a bone or you can advise a bone marrow transplant to these patients for their complete therapy the patients who are ineligible at upfront ineligibility means the patient is elderly or he's not fit for the intensive therapy because intensive therapy comes with a lot of complications, a lot of infections, a lot of organ toxicities. So if the patient is already having some organ impairments, is having active infection, then you cannot treat those patients with intensive therapy, otherwise the patient will die with the therapy. So you need to treat them with some inferior doses or inferior molecules, which is okay for that time. Once the patient is uh, clinically active or he's clinically better, the infections are being controlled, his performance status has improved, then you can always consolidate those patients with a more intensive therapy later on. And finally, if you uh, the patient is fit for the allogenic transplant, you can always consolidate with allogenic transplant. So that was the traditional way of this thing, AML treatment. But with the uh, diagnosis of the genetic markers and with the targeted therapies, we can target those genes there are few genes which can be targeted now and they are more into the development in future. But we have some FLT3 inhibitors, we have some IDH2 inhibitors, we have some TP53 mutation inhibitors which can be given upfront along with the standard therapy which you are giving to all the patients. So that will improve the outcome of these patients and they have been proven. Who are the patients who are supposed to undergo an allogenic transplant? So all the intermediate risk patients and all the high risk patients have to be given allogenic stem cell transplant once their disease is under remission with either matched sibling, whether they have some sibling who is a matched HLA or maybe with MUD or maybe HAPLO. But this transplantation has to be done for all the adverse risk patients 
and intermediate risk patients who are mainly FLT3 inhibitor positive. Also in the relapse setting. But in the standard risk, supposedly with the standard therapy which we are giving, the prognosis and outcome of these patients is good. So probably those stem cell transplant cannot be advised to these. They can just be continued on chemotherapy. So a patient who is having a complex karyotype, 70 year old, with uh, so many mutations in his genetic panel, he's clearly a high risk. And what therapy will you give to him? At 70 years, nobody will uh, think of giving aggressive therapy. We'll go benign for him and we will continue with ASA and WEN. ASA cited in and venetoclax, which are targeted therapies. This is the most common and the most important part for the AML treatment because AML treatment is not a single person job. It is a teamwork. You need transfusion medicine people. You need clinical experts, you need intensivists, you need proper nursing and the what I can see are uh, uh, the uh, expert nursing who can see or who can witness the first complication in a patient and they can advise and they can guide to the patient patient family. So nursing implications become very important when you are treating a patient of AML. So these are the common adverse events during the AML treatment and these are what a clinician is concerned and afraid of if you miss any neutropenic fever in a patient, the time is very important. Every hour, the infection is proliferating almost in the logarithmic times. So if you miss or if you do not give antibiotics within three hours of first, in first spike of fever, the mortality chances of a patient in neutropenic stage are doubling. So you need an expert nurse who is taking care of the patient, a 24-hour monitoring of the patient, and you need to uh, counsel and uh, educate the patient for his uh, all the problems. So yes, patient education is important to look for the signs and symptoms of infection. Prophylactic antimicrobials we are not using, but on the first spike of fever, we are starting the empirical and sending all the culture straight away. Growth factors are of some benefit, not during the induction, but during the consolidation phases. Any spike more than 100.4, they have to be told that you need to call the nurse immediately and the nurse has to start the antibiotics and send the cultures within an hour of fever. Any bleeding manifestations are supposed to be treated with platelet transfusions and any bleeding per se uh, from nose, throat, mucosa, skin pitticase, GI tract, any bleeding has to be treated with the platelet transfusions. Thirdly, our platelet threshold for AML treatment is less than 20,000 if the patient is septic and if the patient is not having any fever, less than 10,000 is the platelet threshold when we are supposed to transfuse platelets, but not below that for any evidence of thrombocytopenia. GI toxicities have to be managed with conservative treatment. Fatigue is the most important complaint which the patient complains because of the disease and because of the treatment he is receiving. And physical activity has been established as most effective for the management of these patients. Tumor lysis, when the patient counts is high, the tumor lysis is the acute emergency during the first seven days of the treatment initiation. So for that reason, we are supposed to monitor these electrolytes regularly and we are supposed to treat this tumor lysis very aggressively with all the fluids, uric acid measures, alkalinization of urine, everything has to be done during that time. Hyperleukocytosis is the thing. Uh, sometimes the patient do present the WBC count of more than 1 lakh with the symptoms of headache, blurring of vision, epistaxis, uh, chest pain, cough. That is the sign of hyperleukocytosis and leukostasis. That is the time where we need the transfusion medicine people to do leukopheresis for these patients if the platelet count is adequate and there is no chance of any other complication during the apheresis. Infertility is an issue which needs to be told and counseled to the patient so that they are aware of this thing that giving 3 plus 7 or giving any chemotherapy can cause infertility in both the males and females. If uh, during the therapy they are supposed to use contraception because they have the harm of uh, going through the baby. So uh, with this, uh, there are a few slides about MRD which I would like to skip. So this is a new thing which needs to be practiced. And this is what the morphology we can see uh, by the smear. But MRD is the extent of disease which is remaining in the marrow. So there are multiple techniques by which we can assess the MRD, whether by genetics, fish, or some PCR and NGS study. And this is the, uh, the depth which we want to achieve with our therapy so that the disease do not relapse back and we can still continuously monitor these uh, MRD sequentially so that the patient is under observation and we are not giving any further therapy to these. These MRD analysis has become important part in few of the AML with the uh, few of the genetic subtypes 
where we are confused whether we need to consolidate with them with transplant or whether we should advise them a observation period. So continuous NGS monitoring, MRD monitoring, if it is negative, you can just observe. And whenever it is coming up, you can consolidate or reinduce and then transplant can be done for these patients. So this is what MRD has shown that MRD negativity when achieved, the outcome of these AML patients is very good. If the MRD is positive, then the outcome is poor. There are some newer advances in the management of AML. I'll quickly go through these slides. There are multiple drugs which have been approved since 2017 and they have been incorporated during the treatment and also they are in trials and they have improved the outcome of these AML patients somehow. Also, we are going towards the immunotherapies, checkpoint inhibitors, CAR T cell therapies, and these can be autologous, allogenic, uh, uh, the combination of these, and they have proven the TP53 AMLs, which were historically very poor, they have improved the survival by using the as an combination. So yes, something is being done, and these patients are taken care by all these targeted and immunotherapies whose outcome was very poor before, but they are being improved with the newer therapies under development. CD47 inhibitors, uh, the TP53 inhibitors, Magrolimab has proven of beneficial in these TP53 who are highly resistant. Even if you do transplant in these patients, they will not live. But Magrolimab, if tried, has proven their survival of more than three years, almost 50% survival for them. So these are the treatment goals. In younger patients, you need to give aggressive therapy. In older adults, you can treat them less aggressively, although the outcome is the overall survival. You need the patient should live longer with all the therapies you are giving. Something on the relapse disease. In relapse disease, is always bad to treat as compared to the upfront or the new disease because relapse disease are more refractory. They will come with a lot of complications. They will come with more of mutations and they will be refractory to the primary therapy what we have given. So newer therapies have to be given. Any role of radiation in AML? So it is generally limited to the emergent treatment of the life-threatening complications like chloroma, spinal cord compression, but they are not in the, uh, uh, the standard protocol for the AML treatment. So final take-homes, close communication between clinician, pathologist, transfusion expert, molecular pathologist is critical. Personal therapy is no longer an academic exercise. It is now a clinical exercise. And yes, AML treatment is difficult and it leads a lot of team effort, including the nursing, including the family, including the intensivist, radiologist, everyone is needed for the AML treatment. So it is said that if you are treating an AML in your institute, you can easily do an autologous bone marrow transplant. With that, I would like to thank you. Very informative lecture. Dr. Akshay has covered everything from diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up of the patient and complications of the treatment and disease itself. Any question? And I'm working since 30 years in cancer hospital, and I have never seen any AML patient surviving more than one year. After this bone marrow transplant and new drugs, definitely survival must have been increased. Any question? If we go by uh, 2022 classification for AMLs now, because we are more of morphologists, what pathologists are uh, dealing with is microscopy. So our brain uh, is trained that if we see 20% blast, I'm going to call it AML. But the latest classification says that you get particular mutations, even 10% is AML. Now, this has to be imbibed first, yes, sir. which will need some okay. time. Uh, to digest this concept. Second thing is, uh, especially when we are neighbor, we have less of experience, 4 or 5% blast, people are afraid of giving them. In those uh, cases where there is no history and uh, your counts are absolutely normal and they're just random blast which are uh, seen in the PS. So many times people refrain from uh, reporting those blast. So in such a scenario, uh, if there are 10% blast, 
and i don't see the features of mds in a ps uh, what is your take whether you are going to proceed further with 10% blast for mutations and do we start aggressive therapy with this percent of blast so generally aml patient won't be silently presenting there must be some clinical symptoms along with the ps comments so if the patient is symptomatic and you are seeing a 10% blast which is questionable for sure but if the patient is symptomatic for the disease is having high fever or some cough or some lrtis he is having some uh, associated low wbc count low platelet count then that is the time we will do a bone marrow for those patients but if only isolated uh, blast in the peripheral smear with no symptoms with hemoglobin and platelets being normal we can we tend to follow up these patients regularly maybe three uh, three uh, weekly twice cbc can be done for these patients and we can follow if they are silent then obviously nothing has to so be done symptomatic patients with a blast of 10 to 12% in marrow 10 to 12% in the marrow what we do further so symptomatic patients with 10 to 12% blast again um, even if you tell them their mds eb2 for say they patients are as aggressive as the aml so these patients are supposed to be treated now we need to figure out these blasts are myeloid lymphoid what kind of blast so immunophenotype is a must to be done for these patients at that smear secondly a karyotype analysis can help in these patients if we have the recurrent or uh, the disease defining translocations that can prove that this is aml so yes we will treat those patients sir so we start treating with 10% also we will start treating with 10% also fine thank you So any comment from Vinay sir, sir regarding the question from Amit sir? There to the uh, criteria to call MDS. There is lot of subjective variation. A colleague may call it as other person seems like may call it fifteen percent. Somebody may call it twenty percent. So, uh, you need a lot of uh, and we that what is the percent of display is here. Sir, again, MDS with 10% blast or more will be categorized as a high-risk MDS. Yeah. And they are supposed to be treated. That I completely agree. Yes. That's what yes. I said. Yes. If, it is, if I don't report it as MDS, only blast 12%. Now, that is the catch. Yes, because sir. what happens, uh, history is not anything. So, a junior pathologist may neglect that 10% blast kya report karna hai, where it is going to fall. I am saying AML, bol pa rahe, na main completely normal, bol pa rahe, na mujhe MDS ke features dekh rahe. But the latest classification said it needs a follow-up, it needs flow, it needs further cytogenetics. That's what I'm emphasizing that even whatever percent of blast we get in the marrow, we need to report. And we don't need to put a final claim that this may be AML or it is AML or something like 20%, yes, we write acute leukemias. We have stopped writing myeloblastic or lymphoblastic after seeing the flows. So no more it is recommended to call them or categorize them at morphology. But this number of blast is more challenging. That's why now marrow is not something which is done every day. It's a painful procedure. If I see 10% blast, we would immediately go ahead with flow and cytogenetics. And of course, molecular studies. We have few questions over here. Why wait for disease? So won't the symptom open? Okay. What are the recommendation guidelines for bone marrow assessment during therapy for eligible and non-eligible patients? So morphology and flow both have to be done for all the patients, whether they're eligible or not eligible, because you need to prove that it is an AML. Second, and then only you can proceed for the therapy. After remission, how can we confirm relapse clinically? And what are the investigations required to confirm? Do we need to do cytogenetics again for such cases? So, uh, uh, 
post remission uh, for few things we are regularly monitoring like for npm1 uh, mutations and inversion 16 we are regularly monitoring them with the platforms like digital droplet pcr or rq pcr and they have to be standardized somewhere and there are some guidelines which tells that these are supposed to be monitored three monthly from a marrow monthly from a peripheral smear these have to be done if the patient relapses those things will Im increase in the uh, amount and clinically all the patient who are relapsing will present with the features of pancytopenia, bleedings, fever, leukopenia, some thrombocytopenia, some anemia in a background of AML patient who you have treated. So any amount of anemia will always give you some inference that this is a patient probably is relapsing. And yes, you need to do cytogenetics and the NGS panel again because these are the development developing things and acquired mutations can always be there whenever there is a relapse. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chair. Thank you so much, sir. I'll request our chairpersons, uh, Dr. Sudhir and uh, Dr. Shukla to kindly felicitate Dr. Akshay Lahoti, sir. Thank you so much for your wonderful speaker talk today, sir. I listen. Proceeding further with this conference, we have our next uh, speaker session on role of hematopathologist in clinical practice by Dr. Sachin Jan, who is founding director, Gene Flow Labs uh, in Gurugram. He's, he, has, he has more than uh, 18 years of uh, pathology experience and a visiting fellow at University of uh, Salca uh, Sa Salamanca, Spain. And he's also the executive committee member of uh, the cry for national and international hematology and oncology journals i welcome you sir for uh, chairpersons i'll request dr T uh, tina ram to kindly join on stage and uh, Uh, instead of Dr. Priyanka, I'll request Dr. Nidhi Sharma ma'am to kindly join on stage as a chairperson. First of all, thanks to uh, uh, for inviting me, and thanks uh, for this. is very enthusiastic about so many uh, CMEs 
and uh, hematological academic programs thank you sir so my uh, role is to uh, today's to give uh, a role of hematopathologist in clinical practice in last decade the hematopathology has evolved so much uh, in md days uh, we always tend to you know uh, go towards the histopathology side so even when i have gone to first hematopathology i was myself was not aware hematopathology is a such a vast field now within hematology from morphology to coagulation to you know flow cytometry to uh, cytogenetics to molecular hematology there are so many areas you can't do all the hematopathology within hematopathology also you have to restrict to your you know field uh, which you want to excel so uh, but even uh, hematopathology has evolved from morphology to molecular to ngs still in my uh, thing the when the patient is coming first to the hematology clinical hematologist in his opd so he has no clue where to proceed okay in which direction he has to think after the symptoms so the clue will come only from the lab and that is basically the peripheral smear or cbc so still the B, uh, cbc or uh, peripheral blood is a most informative in the hematopathology even if ngs has come and all that and unfortunately uh, so many hematology analyzers obviously have come because of that evolution we are sometime ignoring the peripheral smear findings but maximum information i always say that's a one drop but ocean answers in the drop so we know whoever the pathologist are here always always make the slides any abnormal findings then you will get lots of information we have to go towards the you know benign side like thalassemia iron deficiency megaloblastic hemolytic or some infection generally when the cbc will come so nobody will tell uh, high counts or low counts there are reactive lymphocytes are there neutrophilia with toxic changes are there but that information can be very critical to the clinician that infection is bacterial or viral by seeing the ps itself you can say very easily but that information is very very critical to the uh, clinician or you have to go towards the malignant side like leukemia lymphoma myeloma mds myeloproliferative neoplasm all that information will come uh, the beginner information will come from the ps only so that's why not only the cbc whenever any abnormal finding is there just uh, look into the slide that's a very very important thing we are missing a lot on the ps so in next few slides i will just highlight a few how many pathologists are here or residents are here okay good so this is just example that's uh, you know uh, uh, two year old child if we will see the count is 61000 platelet count is very high and uh, lymphocyte count is high okay so that's uh, lymphocytosis so how many will think this can be leukemia or lymphoma in two year C first talk was cll it can be cll yes or no no it can't be cll because in that age group cll cannot be there okay so anything what you will do next simple ps so ps is showing like this few are small lymphocytes few are large lymphocytes with nucleoli okay so now anybody can say what is the in which direction we have to think anybody it will be good if you will interact that is the most commonly this will happen what of the time the, when these patients are coming me these are diagnosed
diagnosed like AL. But if you will go back and just see, of pertussis. Okay. Whenever the only one thing, whenever these type of things will come to me directly, I will call to the clinician and just ask is patient is severely coughing. Okay. Patient is severely coughing. You just say, this is pertussis. You will treat accordingly. This is nothing else. Okay. So what clinician want? So that's how the, another example, how your uh, rapo will build up with the clinician. Uh, always we claim and we, uh, you know, uh, the uh, clinicians are not giving history. So I always say in that someone has to take one step, either clinician or pathologist. But if lab will take one step, the clinician will take two step. Okay. I've, I've always seen that. So if you are seeing like this, and that's a mutual learning exercise, uh, CMC also, we have learned a lot, but we are, when we are interacting with the clinicians, diagnosis, uh, might be, they are thinking something else. So on day to ba day basis, you will learn a lot of things when you will interact. So in lab, generally, we will, you know, avoid talking to the clinicians. But I must say, whenever you are getting anything abnormal, just talk to the clinician and tell them your findings. You will always learn something, always. Okay. So in this case, platelet count is very high because pertussis patient is severely coughing. Because of that, megakaryocyte production is more and, you know, the... Uh, after sequestering that's coming into the peripheral blood. So that's why platelet count will be high. So many of will be get treatment. Also. It's a simple case of uh, can anybody, one is pathologist and one is hematologist here. Can anybody tell who is hematologist and who is pathologist? Anyone? This is not academic question. That's a general thing. No wish list will come from the clinician. Just uh, uh, mind me, Akshay. I know <laughs> you are there, but uh, always one query. We want only history, right? Okay. Now come to normal. Normal and anemia means uh, normal sites, microsites, micro is coming to us and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, PS is not coming, only CBC is coming and we are giving just microcytic hypochromic anemia, right? We are not writing more than that. Even then, uh, I have seen whenever PS is coming, most of the time we are trying to uh, somehow, I don't know from where this practice has started, the impression is not coming in the CBC report. RBC, microcytic hypochromic anemia, no para site all the description of all from the lab site somehow it will be missing so just try to write something because you know cbc mcv is less anemia is there that clinician is also uh, by seeing by seeing the cbc okay he also knows that's a microcytic he has sent ps to look for extra information so whatever information you can give our job is to give maximum information whatever we can give uh, by seeing the ps so microcytic hypochromic is not enough. Okay. So if microcytic hypochromic anemia you are seeing, but RBC indices of means, you know, RBC count is high and RDW is normal. So that's suggesting of thalassemia minor. So what is hesitating you to write? Uh, findings are suggestive of thalassemia minor. Advice HPLC to confirm. There is no medical legal question in that if you will write that. Okay. It can be iron deficiency also combined. But if indices are right, you are writing suggestive of only. So please write that. If you are thinking that's iron deficiency anemia, don't write microcytic hypochromic anemia. Write iron deficiency. Microcytes are there. Uh, ovulocytes are there. Tear drops are there. What is that? You you just write that one. Okay. Patient having 
pancytopenia, severe pancytopenia, but you are having classical changes of megaloblastic anemia, right? Macrocytes, macroovelocytes, whole jolly bodies, NRBCs, hypersegmented polymorphs. Okay. People means very less time uh, from the lab, it is written findings are suggestive of megaloblastic anemia. But you know, if you will write the findings are suggestive of megaloblastic anemia, one marrow can be prevented. Because if you have written the micro megaloblastic anemia, clinician just do the vitamin B12 and folate level to confirm. And there is no need for, you know, uh, a bone marrow in megaloblastic anemia. But if patient is having severe pancytopenia and from the lab side, he is not, uh, uh, clinician is not getting clear, confident answer to that's a megaloblastic anemia or something else. If it is a children, that is okay. But if an adult, he will definitely think up uh, towards MDS or some abnormal finding. But if you will write clearly and your findings are clear, then you can write easily. He will give uh, two or three months trial for hematonics. If it will not improve, then obviously he will do later on marrow. But unnecessarily marrow can be prevented. So PS has a you know significant role. That's another example, very important. Patient is having thrombocytopenia and you are seeing these kind of cells. Can anybody tell what are these cells? Cystocytes, right? So thrombocytopenia and these kind of cells. What are three differentials? Anybody? What are the differentials for cystocytes? Hemolytic. Okay. So if thrombocytopenia and cystocytes, so what it, what test has to order next? So cystocytes and thrombocytopenia, there can be majorly two causes. Either you will think towards the hemolytic anemia kind of thing or uh, profile is altered. Okay, then you will think towards the DIC. And what will be the DIC uh, uh, indirect hint in the, it, not indirect, in fact, direct hint on the peripheral blood? If you will see the myeloid, there will be toxic changes, toxic changes, and uh, cystocyte, probably this will be DIC. But coagulation studies will confirm that PTA, PTT, and fibrinogen, that will be be totally altered, then profile is normal cystocyte thrombocytopenia, then it will be microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. In microangiopathic hemolytic anemia also, there can be HUS, there can be TTP. Okay, how you will differentiate between that? In HUS, TTP, both will be the coagulation profile will be normal. And generally, the That will that can happen in all nitrides, and sometimes the in like will be uh, drug induced TTP also. But that information is very critical to that uh, critical to the clinician or hematologist because if that's a drug induced TTP, so they can stop um, cystocytes. But uh, uh, that's our duty to tell clinician in, in which direction to move. That's a DIC kind of thing or hemolytic kind of thing. Another thing is severe anemia, persistent anemia, no answers. When you are seeing the slide, blister cells or, you know, these kind of helmet cell, bite cells. So these will clue towards the oxidative uh, hemolysis. This can be because of G6PD, something. Okay. So in this regard, one very important, uh, uh, small, small, interesting story always uh, my mentor, Dr. Sukesh sir, was telling about this. So, in the uh, when he was doing the practice in uh, uh, Australia or uh, something, so one family has come to me, uh, come to him, and uh, you know the uh, in the winter season, and that one uh, uh, baby was having severe anemia. So, 
so he has asked uh, to have got child recently okay so, you know so uh, he is because he was suspecting oxidative hemolysis okay because of the naphthalene balls whenever you are uh, uh, taking out uh, clothes after uh, it was habit to use the naphthalene ball so naphthalene induced oxidative hemolysis so uh, okay next very important these kind of thing what are these cell uh, what are these the upper side these are rule formation and what is this this is what is the difference between this and this this is auto agglutinations this is rule formation and this is auto agglutination okay so what's the importance of this many of uh, times the myeloma is undiagnosed most of the time patient has gone renal transplant also everything kidney failure uh, creatinine is very high but the simple ps can prevent all that when you will screen the slide if anemia is there and you know you see the uh, rule formation and you will just have to pick up the phone and ask, ask the clinician is the patient is having backache you just tell him do the myeloma profile creatinine uh, 70 80% it is probably myeloma but because many of the times this patient is going to the renal not going not coming to the physician or uh, hematologist this is missing missing and missing and he is sometimes i have seen peop uh, people have gone myeloma patient has gone to the uh, kidney transplants also but the cause was just a uh, myeloma another thing is uh, autoagglutination anemia autoagglutination mainly two differential aiha cold agglutinin disease okay so another important thing whenever it's isolated anemia always do the reticulocyte count reticulocyte count generally we are doing very less because you will get lots of idea by doing the reticulocyte count and uh, you can think in terms of prca or high retic count than hemolytic anemia but if a severe anemia isolated severe anemia and you are seeing the autoagglutination on the peripheral blood probably it can be autoimmune hemolytic anemia and cold agglutinin disease what you will do you just see the print out of the instrument in these type of cases hemoglobin and hematocrit will not match even if you want don't want to see the slide just see the hemoglobin and hematocrit generally generally hemoglobin and hematocrit is multiple of 3 you know hematocrit is multiple of 3 if hemoglobin is 12 then hematocrit is 36 something like that but if that is not matching hemoglobin is 12 uh, hematocrit is 20 and uh, mcv is spuriously high like 150 or something then from the cbc uh, instrument uh, print uh, that print out itself you can think this is something wrong some autoagglutination will be there okay and if that auto autoagglutination is there just uh, incubate the sample on 37 degree and then again rerun the sample sometimes it will correct hemoglobin and hematocrit that will correct so if it will correct then after 37 degree incubation it is correct it means it's a probably cold agglutinin disease otherwise it's a aiha but by seeing the peripheral smear you will get lot of information and lot of things whole uh, point i want to highlight that there are some special stains now morphology of wbcs uh, everybody knows these cells i am not going into the detail that's uh, in bone marrow settings uh, whenever patient is uh, after the bone marrow transplant so uh, uh, lab side role is to tell when the patient is ungrafting you know patient and hematologist is very uh, waiting for to see when the neutrophil come when the monocyte will come so you have to see the slide for that screen thoroughly uh, the another thing i was telling uh, uh, total patient is having fever uh, mild leukopenia we are seeing lymphocytes but we are not commenting on the ps that's a reactive lymphocyte or what but if you will write if you are seeing reactive lymphocyte just comment about the reactive lymphocytes so that they can give clue that can be uh, you know viral infection another thing whenever uh, what vinay has told in the morning uh, whenever the leukocytosis is there okay uh, i am remembering uh, just three four months before one uh, young chap uh, just uh, around 16 17 years old generalized lymphadenopathy high counts absolute lymphocytosis but when we have seen the slide they were thinking about lymphoma in fact they have done lymph node biopsy also 
somehow CBC, it has missed or whatever before the biopsy. I don't know, but when the CBC has come to me, so CBC was showing lots of, you know, these downy kind of cells. So that was infectious mononucleosis. That's EBV induced. Nothing you have to do. No need for marrow, no need for lymph node. But uh, again, I want to highlight only that thing. PS, PS is very important. Just make the habit of making PS. Uh, child repeated infection, you know, you know, just see the inclusion. Chadiak Higashi. Normal dysplastic meds, hypolobation, hypogranulation. These now leukemias. If you will see OR rod, that's the AML. Multiple OR rods, faggot, faggot cells, you know, some pseudo hypolobated forms also. So, uh, in a year, at least two or three times it will happen. Morphologically, you will give APML, but cytogenetically or uh, RT-PCR wise, fish is coming negative for, you know, 1517. 1517 is a hallmark translocation for the APML. But many of the times, um, not many of the times, occasionally it will happen. Uh, you are uh, morphologically 100% sure that's the APML. But uh, uh, molecular tests are not showing, you know, APML. So in that case is, you have to be sure morphology is 100% if something is seeing on the morphology, that's hundred percent. If you are seeing APML, uh, multiple faggot, that's a APML. So there is somewhere some problem in the molecular report also. So don't think the molecular reports cannot be wrong or rare phenomena cannot be happen in molecular. They are also some gray areas like this. So in that cases, you have to do fish 1517 or uh, other rara break apart probe that will give another translocation. Some uh, uh, four or five percent cases of APML will not be having ideal 1517 translocation. That can be 1117 or other translocation. So that also you can miss. Even by morphology, you can tell, you can predict sometimes what type of uh, 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 AML that is. Like in AML, if you will see the morphology of OR road. So if you will seeing the thin and slender OR road, you can think towards the A uh, A21 translocation. In that one, flow will show the aberrant 19. Okay and uh, molecular will show the 821 translocation these some are the lymphomas by morphologically first is cll small cell that fish mouth appearance pro lymphocytic leukemia that's uh, you know uh, these splenic marginal zone these all mature b cell neoplasm you can think to uh, this is hairy projections hairy cells this is lots of uh, you know uh, Cytoplasmic regulation, deep blue, that's probably Burkitt. No, this is again SMZL. This is whenever uh, you are seeing Roulet formation and lymphocytosis, that can be Walden storm. So, so many clue uh, from the morphology in which direction you have to think. Same way in uh, T cell malignancies, prominent nuclei large, probably this is TPLL. This is um, uh, some large general lymphocytes are there if uh, morphology you are seeing, that can be TLGL. These kind of patient will uh, move here and there for years. Leukopenias, mild splenomegaly, transfusion dependency, but these will be LGLs. LGLs. This is, uh, you know, uh, cesarean cell morphology. That's aggressive NK cell leukemia. That's a flower shaped cell, adult T cell leukemia lymphoma. So by morphology itself, you can see so many things. And that's, uh, you know, uh, if uh, it's a uh, peripheral blood, you are seeing plasma cells with rule formation. Sometimes you will see that can be uh, uh, myeloma. Now, uh, plasma cell leukemia also, criteria has changed. Previously, we were seeing 20%. If you will see peripheral blood, then it's a plasma cell leukemia. But now it's 4 5% itself. You will see uh, uh, with the creat altered and all that thing, that can be plasma cell leukemia. But if you will tell... Uh, this is plasma cell leukemia. So hematologist will think about some aggressive therapy. Otherwise he will, think, you know, go towards the uh, routine thing. Platelet clumps, uh, everybody uh, know and uh, all, uh, you know, but you have to just keep remember certain areas. If suppose uh, sample is coming from, you know, a PICU kind of thing, PICU or still in India, still it, that practice is there. Uh, the sample has been picked up how? Not by routine uh, vacuum tainer or something just by needle at drop drop by drop drop but in that time if first time sample is coming from uh, you know uh, children's and uh, the platelet count is very less 5000 or 10000 always just uh, uh, finding just think about the pre analytical thing 
just talk to the uh, because repeat sample also will be very difficult just talk to the icu guys and find out if it is a difficult how you have taken sample because 10000 patient patient clinician all can be panic and that can be transfused but might be that is simple thrombocytopenia another thing very important thing you just you just see if in your department accessioning thing is different where you know all the samples are been uh, collected and then transported in the individual segment so for biochemistry, all the segment, all the samples are you know centrifuged, right? So sometimes what ha what happened? The accessioning team will uh, centrifuge all the samples, and by mistake sometimes they are uh, centrifuging the uh, you know uh, EDTA samples also. But EDTA sample, if it has been centrifuged, the platelet will uh, count will go beyond ten. Okay, so that also you have to sensitize to your accessioning team that uh, you know samples cbc sample should not be centrifuged okay and if once it will be centrifuged it will be very difficult to get the right count uh, uh we are seeing obviously platelet comes always but many of the times the fibrin plugs are also there so that sometimes we are ignoring but you have to see that also if uh, fibrin plugs are there on the tail of the smears that also can be cause for thrombocytopenia uh sometimes the uh, instrument hematology analyzer will give normal platelet count but that's very rare phenomena but when you will see the slide in the slide there is no platelet counts okay because what happened when uh, there are multiple uh, uh, fragmented cells so that counter will count into the platelet count so uh, you have to see the platelet count platelet graphs on the hematology analyzer so you will see where the plat is, uh, the graph is fitting into so that uh, all I want to say in that case is you have to make the slide. So that is not always true. Uh, whenever the instrument will give normal plated count, it will be normal. It will happen rarely, but it can happen. And it is happening actually. So that's uh, uh, the PS part. Any questions regarding the PS? Yeah, please. Hmm. So artifactual findings, basically, you have to, you know, uh, first of all, you have to standardize your uh, uh, staining part. What happened when, uh, if you will see carefully, RBC size, RBC uh, are not stained properly because of, you know, uh, the round button is there. So you have to check your, uh, what type of methanol they are using in the that thing. Sometimes the low quality methanol is having mixed with water because of that hypochromia and all that you don't know. Sometimes filtration is not happening properly because of that lots of, you know, uh, uh, dust will come. Uh, sometimes even uh, I see if the cost cutting is happening in the lab, you know. So uh, you are spending a lot of time in staining, but that is not coming properly. Sometimes on the slide is having grease. Whenever the slide is coming, slide is having grease or something or dust because of that staining is not proper. Okay. So you have to see just see the in the light slide you you can see the dust on the slide itself so that's lots of pre analytical thing uh, when you will actually look into the lab go into the lab and talk to the technicians then only you will be able to find out because that thing only the uh, what you were talking about that's a some processing thing only so we have to streamline that okay now the bone marrow in our uh, uh, practice in my practice basically what we are doing whenever we are doing marrow we generally will take two edt and two heparin so one edt will come for flow cytometry one heparin will go uh, for the uh, karyotyping and one uh, whatever diagnosis is coming based on that other two samples heparin or edt will be used if suppose some pcr based test or ngs has to be done that will go from the uh, uh, marrow uh, from the edt if some fish kind of test or cytogenetic test that will go from uh, uh, basically from the heparin so two edta two heparin at the diagnostic time but right at the follow-up time generally only uh, only the one sample so this is just to show the cellularity so time is comparatively less just but to give idea of whole what is we are doing in hematopathology this is for iron staining Persian blue that's uh, this purple dot blue dot uh, it's iron that's a special stainings of uh, uh, Sudan black MPO and this is pass and this uh, trap stain uh, for hairy cell. Nowadays, however, uh, in uh, corporate labs, generally uh, these staining are not routinely done because uh, in the meantime, in two, three hours, flow sample itself will, will give the diagnosis. 
but yeah in the resource limiting settings these are still very very important to have some clue what type of whenever uh, we are doing uh, marrows uh, generally it's not a habit to use the trophine imprints okay whenever we are doing trophine biopsy and whenever you are doing marrow always do the trophine biopsies also because many of the times anyway one time needle is going into the patient it doesn't matter you can take the trophine biopsy uh, because in the government settings mainly pathologist many places pathologists are doing uh, you know aspiration biopsies just uh, make the habit of doing the biopsies and before biopsies just make the trophine imprints also okay that will sometimes will give lot of information about infilt infiltration or you know on the lymphoma deposits this is just an adequate thing that's again a uh, uh, because the in the trophine you will give lots of information you know about the megakaryocytes like this hyperlobulated that's a hallmark of uh, essential thrombocythemia kind of thing that's a, you know you can see uh, dwarf and mono hyperlobulated forms uh, this is uh, in, the, in the cml uh, i faintly remember one uh, uh, 36 year female uh, patient is ha uh, having massive splenomegaly uh, but count was normal and she was wife of some mla or something uh, and she has come uh, unexplained anemia counts and all that thing was other counts were normal kind of thing marrow has been done for that and there was not much hypercellularity also but mags were classical of dwarf and hyperlobated forms and uh, clinician and in fact we were also not thinking of cml but by seeing that we have just told clinician just send bcr able somehow i am thinking that can be cml and you know uh, and why i have predicted by seeing the uh, biopsy just uh, dwarf and hyperlobated forms but that has turned out to be cml only so morphology is very very important uh, uh, yeah that's amperipolysis okay uh, this is all examples of mpn first one is you will see all the hypercellular but here dwarf and hyperlobated forms of megakaryocytes so this is uh, cml here hyperlobulated forms loose clusters this is et this is clustering of MEG. So this is probably uh, myelofibrosis. So peripheral blood, you will not get any picture. Uh, which, which kind of MPN? Maximum peripheral blood or bone marrow aspirate even, you will get that kind can be MPN. But which MPN? Exactly you will get by megakaryocyte morphology on the trophine. So trophine biopsy is very, very important. Obviously, so many uh, uh, PUO. This is, you know, uh, cryptococcus. This is uh, histoplasma. This is LD bodies. Rarely if sometime MP also can be missed on peripheral smear, but bone marrow, it can be picked. But also these are, you know, very, very crucial. Whenever you are seeing uh, lots of uh, a non-cause of uh, fever, fever is not non-cause, and uh, patient has a splenomegaly or something, on bone marrow, you are seeing lots of uh, RE activity. Always just search a lot because you can get some parasitic infection there or uh, uh, it can be HLH also you have to see the uh, you know hemophagocytosis there whenever you are seeing the uh, rsl this is you know atypical mycobacterium that's uh, granuloma information tb uh, this is amperipolysis uh, massive splenomegaly children uh, gaucher's disease neiman pick disease so bone marrow is over just to give idea of all small small things that's hplc hplc also, how the hematopathologist can help, you know, uh, generally, you you are not getting graphs, but graphs are very important. And in graphs, the most important thing in HPLC is the retention time. Okay, so here, um, A2, A2 is 4.7, F is 4.5, here F is 1.7, and here A2 is 6.1. Okay, but uh, RBC indices and CBC picture is of Thel minor classically, that's okay. But A2 is 4.7, A2 is there, that's probably Thel minor. Uh, A2 is 3.62. But A2 and HBE, both are eluting in the same window. But it's a little, little different. I will show, yeah. So if it is A2 uh, or E, there is little difference in the retention time, you know. If it is retention time is 3.72, that's a basically bioread instrument. The retention time will uh, uh, changes as the instrument will change. But that's for... Uh, uh, Bioroid instrument. So 3.72, you are seeing that's a little bit higher. 3.64, 3.72. So 3.72 is generally uh, E, E window. 
and 3.6462 that's basically a2 window so even if it is a2 window but it's a retention time 3.64 you will think towards the uh, beta thal minor but if it is a2 3.72 or something then you will think towards the uh, hbe another important thing if it is a2 and f is you know f is little bit high f is like 4.5 so sometimes the uh, presentation of patient is uh, like thal intermedia so these kind of patient, if A2 is 4.7, but F is also high and patient is presenting like thalimidate, or even if you don't have history, A2 is 4.7, HBF is high, these patient can present with the thal intermedia kind of picture. Okay. So these all you have to think. And in a severe megaloblastic anemia also, sometimes A2 can be very high. So you have to be uh, uh, see the uh, MCV and CBC also always. HPLC, I will suggest never report without the CBC. Always correlate with the CBC findings. Okay. Uh, another thing, by seeing the A2 percentage, also you can uh, think towards the which kind of mutation can be there. Specifically, 619 base pair deletion. If A2 is in a range of 8 to 10 percent, might be this is uh, thalassemia uh, minor with 619 base pair deletions. Okay. These examples, A2 is 3.72. So uh, A2 is uh, percentage is 27.1%. Generally, by the percentage also, you will getting which type of, uh, uh, this is minor or major. HB, A2 is 27.5. Uh, retention time is 3.72. So probably this is heterozygous HBE. Heterozygous HBE, unless and until it is HBF involvement or some alpha thal mutation. Generally, the A2 range, uh, will between uh, you know 22 to 30 percent kind of thing whenever it is less than 50 percent uh, anything you will think about thel minor kind of thing if it is more than that then you can think about uh, um, a little bit towards uh, homozygous kind of thing another example here is a2 is 85.9 f is less 2.5 so this is uh, yeah this is uh, probably homozygous hbe and uh, here again uh, a2 is 85.9, but with this now F is also high. Okay, by seeing this, you can see that's a HB E beta thalassemia. Probably this is E beta thalassemia. So, uh, but if you will see uh, in E beta thalassemia, also it can happen, F can be increased. Uh, in these cases, there are two things. Uh, uh, you can see the slide. If it is homozygous HB, so there will be prominent of target cells. But if with anemia, mycostic, hypochromic anemia, target cells, and uh, Additionally, you are seeing basophilic stippling also. Then probably it can be E beta. So you can think a little bit uh, by seeing that. Another thing is important thing is sickle beta. In sickle beta, uh, S is also high and F is also high. So homozygous sickle or sickle beta. See, uh, compound heterozygous sickle beta. It's very difficult to differentiate by HPLC. But it is very easy to differentiate how uh, uh, you... Uh, Many of the times we don't have molecular settings to prove that. But in that cases, you can do parent thing, parent uh, HPLC. If both the parents are sickle, obviously that's a sickle. If it is one sickle, one beta, then it will be sickle beta. Uh, okay, this is HPLC part. Now it's a flow cytometry. Flow cytometry, obviously it's a very popular. Why it's popular? It will give information only in two, three hours. Patient has come to the OPD in two o'clock, three o'clock. You will get answer by six o'clock. It's a which type of blood cancer. Okay. So that's give all uh, different, which kind of leukemia. If it is MPO is coming positive, then it's a myeloid. If it is 1979A, that's a B cell lineage. Then if it is T cell cytoplasmic CD37 is coming, it's T cell. I'm not going into the detail, but just uh, uh, to give idea. And you can, you know, differentiate. And according to that, you can predict some molecular prediction also from uh, uh, flow, uh, flow things also. Okay, these are, if it's a pH positive ALL, if 1333 is coming or 66 C is coming, it can be that one. If uh, uh, CRLF2 expression is there, it can be pH like ALL that has a poor prognosis. So flow cytometry will not only tell the diagnosis, but it also predict the prognosis also and predict the, you know, uh, uh, which mutations can be. This is what T cell, ETP ALL, among the T cell ALL, it's a uh, severe phenotype. Uh, patient is having uh, poor prognosis, then you will get the loss of five uh, in that and one of the myeloid markers. Another important thing is immunotherapeutic targets. How to identify the targeted therapies and immuno, uh, you know, uh, like uh, CD19, 
now blend to map is there cd20 rituxi map is there cd22 all uh, inotos map is there so all the refractory patients uh, once the they will not respond to the treatment or uh, um, you know standard chemotherapies if you will do all that important markers at the diagnostic time itself in future if patient will relapse so then you can uh, you know give that type of therapy but that information uh, it's very crucial at the diagnostic time itself. So whenever you are choosing the lab, just see which labs are doing all that in details. Another uh, uh, immunotherapic targets in AML. Okay. MRD. Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, in that most important thing is you just to, um, you know, uh, whenever uh, MRD has been doing only the, uh, you know, one vial is enough. Just 1.5 to 2 ml otherwise sample will be diluted so only one uh, thing this is just a pattern analysis we will analyze in the you know flow mrd from the normal to differentiate and obviously uh, our deal always mangi more in the last that's uh, what's in the future for the uh, you know uh, for the morphology it's a digital hematopathology digital histopathology is obviously very common but digital hematopathology is not still very common the main uh, cons is that because uh, all the scanners whatever is available right now is not having the oil immersion okay so that is up to 40x and they will zoom it and just see up to the 60x so because of that it's not extensively used in hematology but histopathology it has come uh, in a big way but uh, still in the hematopathology also few companies uh, uh, are there we have evaluated uh, three uh, uh, digital analyzers uh, hematology uh, means uh, these cella vision sig tuple and morphal and in uh, it's not a promotion but in our findings the cella vision was the best uh, which you know uh, we can see so uh, 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 i was closely associated with the our very aggressive and you know popular uh, physician uh, dr rahul bhargav uh, i've recently just resigned and you know uh, open i start my own venture uh, so in the uh, this is thing uh, this is sample actually from gorakhpur so we have put the sigtuple there as a project there and uh, 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 we have run almost 100 sample or something uh, there and you know one this was example of APML we have picked up from there APML is a hematological you know uh, emergency if you will uh, clinician will know he will treat immediately patient uh, life can be saved but otherwise uh, patient if it will be untreated in a night itself the game is over so that answers we will get um, by uh, you know uh, this digital hematopathology and we have to think obviously towards it uh, technology is evolving and I'm sure uh, uh, that uh, that will come soon. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? And just to tell you, not a promotion. I mean, I've started uh, my own venture, but uh, with the name of GeneFlow Labs, that's a specialized hematopath lab. But not only this is uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, only raising funds and all, but it's uh, one of the important aspect is to, you know, serve the uh, community who can't afford. So my mission is to diagnosis to all, even, even if they don't have, you know, money. So it's our duty somehow to give back to the community so that you can earn in 10 patients, but you will not earn in that two patients so that's kind of thing i have started let's see okay thank you yeah yeah some questions first anything we'll just take any questions from the audience okay few questions yeah need to cite to which one so one question is how to report atypical cells in cbc uh, effect of lipemia sample on the CBC result. So how to report atypical cells? I will say never report atypical cell in CBC, please. Okay. Just write at least atypical lymphoid cells or blast. If you are seeing it uh, morphology wise lymphoid, just write atypical lymphoid cells. If you are seeing like blast, atypical cells, atypical cells means nothing for the clinician. It can be reactive lymphocytes also. It can be reactive, you know, it can be blast also. It can be anything. Don't write atypical cell at least. 
just specifically mention it is atypical lymphoid cell or blast okay and if uh, in uh, in reporting if uh, in your uh, system its differential is not in differential sometimes in the software that option is not available in the others you can write you can cancel all the differential and write separately these atypical lymphoid cells are there or in lymphocyte suppose uh, out of the 60 lymphoid cells some uh, you know 20 25 percent atypical lymphoid cells are there write it separately these much atypical lymphoid cells are there effect of lipidemic sample yeah that will be there uh, mainly in the mainly for the hemoglobin all other things will be fine so you have to recollect uh, sample only uh, for lipidemic sample after some time otherwise uh, one company i remember uh, i don't remember the name right now that are having some reagent when you are mixing with the uh, that so that will uh, dissolve the fat kind of thing but we have evaluated that, but that was coming very costly because in each sample to use that one uh, to remove the lipemic effect, that was a uh, little costlier thing. Uh, next question, as this, uh, there is 8 to 10% in PS, what to comment and suggestion given? First of all, if it is in PS, that's 8 to 10% blast. So uh, if it is basically lymphoid blast, so obviously, it's a ALL kind of thing, but if it is eight to 10% blast, it can be MDS and peripheral blood less than 10% blast more than five to 10% category straight weight. So even if it is a myeloblast straight weight is MDS EB2, but obviously nowadays uh, we have to uh, do the mutation analysis because sometimes uh, that will be specific mutation and then category will change to AML. Uh, but if you are getting eight to 10% blast cell, uh, even if you are getting 20% blast cells, you have to write morphologically blast cells only unless otherwise you will see the or rod or faggot cells because you can't tell 100% uh, morphologically this is AML or what. However, whatever it will come to, but you have to report like if it will come for reporting, you have to report like a blast only or acute leukemia, not myeloblast or lymphoblast. How to report and differential given in severe leukopenic event? Okay, so when you are getting very less count in that, what you can do, what we are doing, uh, like post BMT patients count is only 500, 100. So you can do five cells, whatever cells you can do comfortably. Differential on five cells, one out of five neutrophil, four out of five lymphocytes. One out of 10 neutrophil, four, uh, nine out of 10 uh, lymphocytes. So some kind of uh, that thing you can use in your practice. That's it. Okay, no other questions. Thank you. If anybody have questions, you can ask uh, on the lunch also, and you can call me anytime if you have need any help. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Um, now I'll request uh, uh, Dr. Professor Pre uh, uh, Preeti Jain to kindly felicitate her for uh, the talk. received many wonderful comments towards your talk very informative session thank you and thank you sir really wonderful i'll request dr tamil priya to kindly felicitate the uh, chairpersons Thank you so much. Uh, so now we will be proceeding with the lunch. The lunch is outside uh, in the lunch area. I request you all to kindly take uh, your lunch. Also, I would like to announce that there are two CME points associated uh, with the full attendance. Uh, so the attendees who are on site should ensure that they attend the full program to complete this requirement. Thank you. Uh, we would be back in next 30 minutes. So, uh, like, uh, we would be starting uh, our next speaker session at 2.30. Thank you.
डुप्लीकेट कर दू
Hello, I think I will be audible now. Hello and
A very good afternoon to everyone, 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 to everyਸਪੈਸ਼ਲੀ ਇਨ ਚਿਲਡਰਨ ਨਾ ਦੇਰ ਆਰ ਟੂ ਇੰਪੋਰਟੈਂਟ ਹੀਮੋਗਲੋਬਿਨ ਆਪਥੀਸ ਦੈਟ ਵੀ ਹੈਵ ਇਨ ਚਿਲਡਰਨ ਵਨ ਇਸ ਸਿਕਲ ਸੈਲ ਐਂਡ ਅਨਦਰ ਇਸ ਥੈਲੇਸੀਮੀਆ ਸਿਕਲ ਸੈਲ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲੀ ਇਨ ਦ ਸੈਂਟਰਲ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲੀ ਇਨ ਮੱਧ ਪ੍ਰਦੇਸ਼ ਛੱਤੀਸਗੜ੍ਹ ਉੜੀਸਾ ਗੁਜਰਾਤ ਐਂਡ ਮਹਾਰਾਸ਼ਟਰ ਐਂਡ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲੀ ਇਨ ਟ੍ਰਾਈਬਲ ਪਾਪੂਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਵਨ ਇਸ ਸਿਕਲ ਸੈਲ ਐਂਡ ਅਨਦਰ ਇਸ ਥੈਲੇਸੀਮੀਆ ਸਿਕਲ ਸੈਲ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲੀ ਇਨ ਸੈਂਟਰਲ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲੀ ਇਨ ਮੱਧ ਪ੍ਰਦੇਸ਼ ਛੱਤੀਸਗੜ੍ਹ ਉੜੀਸਾ ਗੁਜਰਾਤ ਐਂਡ ਮਹਾਰਾਸ਼ਟਰ ਐਂਡ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲੀ ਇਨ ਟ੍ਰਾਈਬਲ ਪਾਪੂਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਵਨ ਇਸ ਸਿਕਲ ਸੈਲ ਐਂਡ ਅਨਦਰ ਇਸ ਥੈਲੇਸੀਮੀਆ ਸਿਕਲ ਸੈਲ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲੀ ਇਨ ਸੈਂਟਰਲ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲੀ ਇਨ ਮੱਧ ਪ੍ਰਦੇਸ਼ ਛੱਤੀਸਗੜ੍ਹ ਉੜੀਸਾ ਗੁਜਰਾਤ ਐਂਡ ਮਹਾਰਾਸ਼ਟਰ ਐਂਡ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲੀ ਇਨ ਟ੍ਰਾਈਬਲ ਪਾਪੂਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਵਨ ਇਸ ਸਿਕਲ ਸੈਲ
the shape of a sickle. Normally, when the RBCs are passing through the minor capillaries, they have a tremendous molding capacity. So easily they pass through. But when there is a sickle cell anemia, these pointed ends or the deformed RBCs get stick to the minor capillaries. And one of the important manifestations that occur in sickle cell anemia is a vaso-occlusive painful crisis. Wherever there is a stagnation or stasis of the microcirculation, you have anoxia and infarction in the symptomatology is mainly because of the vaso-occlusive phenomena. The another important issue in sickle cell anemia is the lifespan of the RBC gets reduced. It ranges from 10 to 20 days against a normal RBC which survives for 120 days. And third important manifestation that occur in sickle is due to the affection of the immune system, spleen in particular. So these are the immunocompromised host. So the manifestation of sickle are going to be because of the painful crisis because of the anemia and thirdly because of the immunocompromised status they catch a lot of infection the next one now this slide only shows you in the upper one it shows the normal biconcave disc how a rbc normally passes through a minor capillary <clears throat> on the bottom you have the sickle which has a difficulty in passing through a capillary and gets stuck up with the endothelium and forms clubs and it interferes with the normal circulation. It obstructs the circulation, leading to the anoxia, infarction, and painful crisis. Now, these painful crises would occur wherever the microcirculation or a major or a medium-sized vessel gets blocked. If it gets blocked into the brain, there is a stroke, vice versa, uh, the uh, cerebrovascular accident. If it gets blocked into the chest, you have acute chest syndrome. If the mesenteric artery or venous system is blocked, you have the acute abdomen. It may block the circulation in the larger, the smaller joint, and you may have a hand foot syndrome, or you may have avascular necrosis of the head. If the retinal vessel gets blocked, you have a blindness. You may have leg ulcers. You may have uh, the affection on a long-term basis. You may have an organ dysfunction, especially uh, the liver, the kidneys and the other organs of the heart. Next one. Now, so as I said, the sickle cell is basically a genetic disease where you have an abnormal hemoglobin, which is called hemoglobin S. And I'll talk about how to diagnose, what are the screening tests that we might do, and uh, uh, what is a confirmatory test? What, what do you do in neonatal screening? And what are the tests that are performed later on for making a PAKKA diagnosis of sickle cell, the next one. So, as I said in the beginning, if you see a molecule of hemoglobin, it has a two components. It has one heme component, which is an iron binding heme uh, molecule is there. <clears throat> and you have two chains of polypeptide chains, one pair of alpha chain and one pair uh, chain of beta chain, the next one. Now, this is depicting the hemoglobin molecule. The iron molecule that has been labeled here, there are four iron uh, molecules in one hemoglobin, and there are two pairs uh, of polypeptide chain, one pair of alpha and one pair of beta chain. It's okay. So, in beta chain, on sixth position, there is a substitution of glutamine instead of so there is a molecular change in the amino acid sequence in the beta chain of the hemoglobin and that is located on chromosome 11 so this change in the sequence or a substitution of a particular amino acid in the beta chain distorts the whole thing so the soluble hemoglobin that you have inside the rbcs becomes in the gel form and it distorts the shape uh, the shape of the rbc the next one as I said in the beginning, if you do a hemoglobin electrophoresis, the confirmatory test that we do by HPLC, hemoglobin electrophoresis, that uh, tells you what is the type of hemoglobin that you are having. Normally, you have an adult hemoglobin, majorly, 
a minor friction less than 3.5 is hemoglobin A2, then a very minor quantity of hemoglobin F that is normally there. And majority, more than 90% would of course be adult hemoglobin. In thalassemia, you have an excess of fetal hemoglobin. The hemoglobin S is present in sickle cell anemia <clears throat> and minor hemoglobinopathies are hemoglobin C and hemoglobin E and many others. <clears throat> so when you do a hemoglobin electrophoresis, you pick up excess of hemoglobin S and that is a diagnostic test. Now in hemoglobin electrophoresis, we look into few things. On a syndromic basis, the, hemoglo uh, the, the sickle cell could be a homozygous, it could be a heterozygous, or it could be a sickle cell. So you may have a combination of thalassemia and sickle. You may have a homozygous, which is a clinically manifesting sickle cell anemia. And you may have a heterozygous, which is a trait which will carry the abnormal gene and doesn't lead to any phenotypic manifestation. So based on hemoglobin electrophoresis, you can decide whether it is hemoglobin SS disease or it is a heterozygous, which is a trait or a which is a genetic carrier, but doesn't manifest and carries on the disease to uh, the siblings later on. Or you may have a combination of sickle and thalassemia. The next one. So if you look into the genetics, very important is genetics because you have different combinations of the parents having different siblings with different genotype and geno different phenotypes. Now, if you have a normal individual who doesn't have an abnormal gene, marries to a trait, then you are going to have two traits and two normal individuals. Means if one trait is, mar is marrying of a normal individual who is genetically normal, 50% are going to be carrier and 50% are genetically normal. So phenotypically, 100% are going to be normal, but they are going to carry the disease in their next generation, especially when they are meeting some homozygous or meeting another trait. The next one. <clears throat> if there is one trait, meaning one anemia, uh, I mean the hemoglobin SS patient, then you have 50% chance of having a sibling who is affected, homozygous, and about 50% chance of uh, I mean, the children having the trait or will carrying the abnormal gene. The next one. Now, if you may, if you, I mean, uh, the, the one of the partner is genetically normal and another is suffering from the disease that is hemoglobin SS or, or homozygous, then all are going to be trait because one of normal gene is going to from, come from that normal individual. So if you have a normal genetically individual and if you have a tray, if you have homozygous who is suffering, you have all carriers and no uh, manifesting uh, child. Now, so this all, I already discussed with you that uh, the, the, the shape of the RBCs are going to be different. The, 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 the RBCs are going to be very rigid. They do not pass through the normal capillaries. So there is a less supply of oxygen, less supply of nutrients uh, to the tissues in sickle cell anemia, especially those who manifest. And the lifespan of RBC becomes 10 to 20 days is against 120 days in a normal individual, the next one. Now, again, this is showing the two types of circulation that you have in a normal individual. The RBCs are normally biconcave disc and they easily pass through the capillaries and the tissue perfusion and the tissue oxygenation is maintained against a sickle child where the, 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 there is a clumping of the RBCs. The RBCs get adhered to the endothelium of the vessel and interfere with the normal uh, circulation in the tissues. The next one. Now, so as I, I, as I said in the beginning, it has a varied clinical presentation and sometimes uh, it may be misdiagnosed and it may be missed and uh, if you do not properly diagnose then the prognosis, the treatment is going to differ and if, do not, if you do not diagnose properly, it has an increased mortality and morbidity. Okay, one of the important manifestations of sickle cell is anemia because the this lifespan of the RBC is going to be less 
it is going to stimulate the marrow. So you have a reticulocytosis, you may have a spleen, sometimes, especially in sickle tell, you may have a splenomegaly, or in an older child, there could be an autosplenectomy. So the one of the important manifestations is anemia, their hemoglobin level may range from six to eight, or even it may go uh, below six. So one of the important clinical manifestations that a child is going to complain is, easy fatigue or a weakness. The child gets tired when he's exercising or when he's doing the daily day-to-day uh, -day working. The next one. The another important group of manifestation that I said is episodic pain or episodic crisis because of the blockage of the microvascular circulation. So especially in a child who is under five years, you know, the, the erythropoiesis in the sh is in the short uh, bones of hands and feet especially. So one of the early manifestations that you have in children under five years, especially at one or two years, is a hand foot syndrome. There is a swelling of hands and feet and it is very painful. So the child is not able to hold anything. Your child is not able to walk if he's more than one year. So if you have a asymmetrical swelling, which is very painful in hands and feet, especially in a child coming from a tribal population, Think of sickle, this, because this is very common uh, manifestation. Now, another differential diagnosis of dactylitis, which is seen in uh, sickle cell, is from the osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis is an infection in the brain which will simulate dactylitis, but the treatment is going to be different. In dactylitis, which is because of the sickle, you need to give painkillers, and you give blood transfusion if the hemoglobin is less. If it is osteomyelitis, minimum six months, six weeks, IV antibiotic is the therapy. So that is one of the important uh, differential diagnosis that one should think of when the child is coming with hand foot syndrome. The next, the 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 here the photograph is showing how the hand is swollen in a child who has sickle manifesting in first five years with hand foot syndrome. And uh, the another important manifestation, as I said in the beginning, is frequent infection especially with the capsular organisms. The infection is common because of the micro infarcts in the spleen repeatedly. There is an autosplenectomy or there is a hypofunction of the spleen. And because of this, this these children are immunocompromised and they are more uh, common for opportunistic infection and especially with the organism which are capsular. So, the and because of this, especially under five years of age, we give them penicillin prophylaxis and we give them a complete immunization schedule so that the chances of infection are less. Any child with sickle uh, coming with fever must be hospitalized, investigated, and should be treated properly. Otherwise, it may precipitate different crises. The next one. Because of the chronic anemia or because of the easy fatigue and weakness, and the poor supply of nutrients to the tissue. These children have a delayed growth, or we call them a failure to thrive. They do not put on their height and weight as a normal child would do. Because of the blockage in the retinal vessels, these children may have the blindness or diminished in the vision. And there could be a chronic changes in the retina, and because of, the, because of that, the children may get permanently blind. So visual problem or blindness is, an, is another important issue, issue in children who have sickle cell. The next one. As I said in the beginning, the organ dysfunction is very common. The organ dysfunction could be in the brain, could be in the chest, could maybe in the liver, kidney, and many in the heart and many other tissues. If it is there in the brain, we call it a cerebrovascular accident, and it commonly presents with lateralizing signs. They may have hemiplegia, they may have unconsciousness, they may have seizures, they may have difficulty in speech. So any child who is having a throbbing headache and vomiting, who is known sickle, think of a, a cerebrovascular accident, it is a life-threatening problem. It has to be recognized early and must be treated properly. Now, one of the important way to detect is a transcranial, uh, tra transcranial Doppler study, where we find out the flow in the, uh, the internal carotid, the middle cerebral, anterior cerebral, and all uh, vessels in the brain. And if there is a slowing, then it then it has to be taken care of. Uh, there is some established treatment for prevention, especially the hemoglobin should be maintained between 10 to 12. And the hematocrit should also be in the normal range. Now, acute chest syndrome is going to manifest with persistent fever, 
very painful chest and breathing difficulty. These are the three important manifestations that this, and the pain is going to dominate. In a cardiovascular system, we have a cardiomyopathy because of the anoxia, because of the persistent anemia, and you may have a pulmonary hypertension, which will again manifest with fever, cough, and breathlessness. The next one. The, the other organs which may be damaged, especially the, the small and the larger joint, the smaller joints are affected. We have a hand foot syndrome. If a larger joint, especially the hip or knee or elbow or wrist or the uh, shoulder is affected, you may have a avascular necrosis of these tissues. Especially, it is common in a large bearing, uh, the weight bearing joint that is the hip. So you may have a uh, avascular necrosis of the femur head where the child is limping or the child may stop uh, uh, walking. Another important is bl blindness that I talked about. They may have chronic leg ulcers. They may have some wounds or ulcers, especially on shin of tibia or near the malleolus. These children, because they produce excessive bilirubin because of the more hemolysis, and they may have a cholecystitis or the gallbladder stones. That is another common problem. So any child who is coming with jaundice, think of hepatitis A, think of hepatitis B, maybe transfusion mediated, maybe intrahepatic sickling, or maybe obstructive jaundice because of the biliary stones. Or there could be a cholestasis because of the uh, uh, sickle cells in the sinusoids. So there could be a cholestasis, there could be an infection, or there could be obstructive jaundice because of the cholelithiasis or biliary stone. So a jaundice is another common manifestation of sickle cell anemia. It's not a simple jaundice that we have in other hemoglobinopathies. Here we have a deeper jaundice with uh, tender liver. The next one. Now, how do we make a diagnosis? The diagnosis is very important. As I said in the beginning, these children, if not diagnosed in infancy, if they do not manifest, they end up at a different age. Children are coming at five years, 10 years, or during an adolescent with different manifestation. And those who have seen the, the experienced physicians, they pick up that this is a sickle cell anemia. If it is diagnosed right after, soon after birth or first year of life, then you can prevent certain complications and you can uh, lessen the morbidity and mortality in these children. Now, in neonatal screening, especially in developing country like ours, one of the very important uh, newborn screening is we do a filter paper spot uh, that is called a Guthrie's test. One drop of blood is taken on a filter paper from the heel prick. It is sent for hemoglobin electrophoresis by HPLC. That is the test that should be done after the baby is born. And then you can differentiate on the basis whether it is a homozygous or heterozygous or sickle, uh, uh, sickle and thel. But again, the electrophoresis has to be repeated because you have a lot of fetal hemoglobin in first six months. So the electrophoresis should again be repeated at six months of age to make a pakka diagnosis, whether it is a hetero or homo or a sickle cell, a sickle cell. The next one. Now, another emphasis is on antenatal diagnosis or prevention of sickle cell anemia. Now, if, if the parents are trade, both of them are trade, or one of the parent is suffering from the disease and another is normal. So you may have abnormal children in this setting. So you might do two tests. Anyone, the chorion villus sampling or amniocentesis. Chorion villus sampling is done at 10 to 12 weeks. The amniocentesis is done four weeks later at about 16 weeks of antenatal period. Now in this, with certain established genetic tests, you can find out whether it is a homo or hetero. And depending on that analysis, you can make a diagnosis if it is hetero or genetically normal, you can, uh, abo uh, you can continue. Or if it is a suffering, then with the consent of the parents, probably you might abort this child. So that way you can antenatally certain tests are possible to detect the, especially the homozygous state and to pre prevent the born of a child who is going to suffer lifelong. Because the ultimate, uh, the 100% treatment for sickle, as we'll discuss later, is a bone marrow transplant or a stem cell transplant, which is not in the reach of everybody today. The next one. Next one. 
so what is the treatment now if the child is born and child is coming so the treatment again would depend on what is the manifestation what is as I said, the one of the important uh, manifestation is crisis or pain. So we give them some analgesics, give them simple paracetamol, give them ibuprofen, give them naproxen. In very severe pain, people are giving IV codeine or morphine or they may anesthetize the child. So the pain is maybe so severe. So the, 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 the painful crisis, one of the management is to give a painkiller. But along with that, that system specific treatment is there. You might give them a blood transfusion. If the ferritin is more, you might have to give them a, a iron chelating agent. Because these children are immunocompromised, so you may have to give a penicillin coverage, especially in a child who is under five years of age. Or you may uh, uh, vaccinate these children for preventing the common infection to which they are vulnerable. The next one. So antibiotics, especially to prevent the gram-positive infection, we put them on, on penicillin prophylaxis. If a child is under 5, we give them 125 milligram twice a day. Or if it is more than 5, then we give 250 milligram twice a day. It will prevent osteomyelitis, it will prevent pneumonia, and many other gram-positive infections. But in, in adults, the spleen, because of the, the auto-infarcts in the spleen, they are more vulnerable. So... The, uh, apart from the pain relieving drug, another important drug that is used in sickle cell is hydroxyurea. Now, giving this hydroxyurea, what it is going to do is it will raise the fetal hemoglobin instead of sickle. So, the amount of sickle goes down and the amount of fetal hemoglobin raises. So, it prevents the ho frequent hospitalization of the patient and it prevents the frequent infections to which they are uh, vulnerable. And hydroxyurea, we give in about 10 to 15 milligram per kg. Gradually, we escalate the dose and we might go up to 30 to 35 milligram. One of the important uh, problem or side effect of hydroxyurea is myelosuppression. And uh, we might give for a year or two, especially in children uh, who are more than five years, who have a frequent vasoocclusive crisis, those who require frequent blood transfusion, those who have acute chest syndrome or a stroke or a, a vascular necrosis. These are the candidates in whom the hydroxyurea is given for a longer period. The next one. So all vaccines, the, the re, all recommended vaccines must be given. We give them pneumococcal, we give them pantavalent vaccine, we give them meningococcal vaccine. So all vaccines that are available, especially meningo and pneumococcal, uh, these are the two important, uh, uh, I mean, vaccines in, in uh, other than the routine immunization schedule that is recommended. Next one. Now, free, to raise the hemoglobin, you know, when uh, it is not possible for every child to undergo a bone marrow transplant and a child is having uh, the homozygous state, the hemoglobin level goes down. So we might give them a packed cell transfusion or a RBC transfusion to maintain their hemoglobin between 10 to 12. So blood transfusion, but the problem with the blood transfusion is twofold. If it is not properly skinned, it might introduce some infection or frequent transfusion may raise their ferritin level. So a frequent ferritin levels must be done. And if it is more than 1,000 or more than 500, then we might give them some iron chelating agents. The next one. Now this is the last one, as I said in the beginning, the bone marrow transplant. That is the ultimate cure. Bone marrow transplant, especially, should be done in children under 10 years of age, those who do not have organ dysfunction. The, the best donor for a sickle cell homozygous would be his own sibling who is, genetic, who is otherwise normal, genetically normal. Finding such a donor is also an issue. So finding a donor then to a center where it is possible, the, the cost will also be much more. So the cost, the availability of donor, and the suitability of an individual who is undergoing transplant. These are the important issues, but you know, the, we established the bone marrow transplant unit here, and uh, I hope it is now functioning, and we did a lot of bone marrow transplants uh, earlier when I was here. So I think that is all that I have to say. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll be here 
I'm here to answer you all. I, I have tried to make it simple, and I think uh, it is going through. Thank you. Thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, we have some online questions. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, is there any role of vitamin C in sickle cell anemia? Uh, vitamin C is an antioxidant. Uh, probably uh, it is not well established that vitamin C, but uh, some nutrients we might give which might supply vitamin C, but as well, the giving vitamin C doesn't help in preventing. Uh, either hospitalization or preventing infection or preventing uh, their vasoclusive crisis. So established role is not there, but of course, vitamin C uh, may be supplied from the various nutrients, I mean, uh, the, the diet that we are consuming. Indications of hydroxyurea nowadays? Uh, in the, uh, the, the special indications for hydroxyurea is when a child is more than five years and having more than three episodes of vasoclusive crisis, that is one. Any child who has received more than three blood transfusions or any child who has a cerebrovascular accident, having acute chest syndrome or having avascular necrosis of femur head or having a sequestration crisis on it. I mean, if the child had a sequestration crisis earlier, then splenectomy for a recurrent sequestration crisis is also uh, important. So these are some established indications where hydroxyurea is going to help. It will help in reducing the hospitalization and it will reduce, it will also reduce probably the infection rate. No more questions. Any comments from the chairpersons? <laughs> uh, sir, it was a very fluent talk uh, which speaks volumes about your experience in the field and uh, I think right from very basics he started and he has gone till transplant. So a holistic approach of sickle uh, in a nutshell with the clinical aspect, what they expect from us. And definitely the uh, percentage of uh, HBS uh, decides straight and all. But yeah. uh, even yeah. the simple sickling test, if it comes positive within two hours of application, we take it as a homozygous because uh, the amount of sickle hemoglobin is more. And when it takes more than 12, 12 hours, we think it might be a trait kind of thing. The screening test is important and yeah. sickling test we very often do and it is very important especially in our country but for a final diagnosis yeah, and it has to be. approach the electrophoresis letter must be done. Yes, definitely. So that is the biggest loophole what right now government is doing a mass sickle uh, screening and that is by solubility it has, itself has uh, many false negative uh, results also but with uh, limited uh, resources still uh, they are trying to at least uh, screen masses in the tribal areas. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you so much, sir. I'll request Dr. Uh, Ashok Yadav, sir, to kindly uh, felicitate. Uh, We have received wonderful comments from the audience online that it was a very informative and a very fluent session that was quite well explained. Uh, I'll now request uh, Dr. Amrita Ma'am to kindly felicitate our chairperson, Dr. Amit Verma sir, Dr. Priyanka Ma'am. and uh, Dr. Aman. Uh, so our next session is online. That is the last session for uh, the day. Uh, Followed by this session would be followed by a very interactive quiz. Uh, 
so i've just got an intimation that uh, dr talreja got an emergency and he is uh, stuck in icu so if we can so, uh, do the quiz uh... i'm i'm sorry if i'm available right now i can okay, initiate okay 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 sir okay thank you so we'll proceed with the the last speaker session for today that is with uh, dr talreja i hope i'm uh, audible and visible and my slides are seen Uh, so you're not visible. I'll. And is my slides visible right now? The slides are visible, sir. Perfect, perfect. And I'm audible right now. Ah, uh, so you're audible. Perfect. So I believe. Ah, uh, thank you. Ah, uh, the whole ah uh, organizers and thank you. Ah, uh, uh, so far. Ah, uh, it has been a very intellectually academic awakening session so far. Ah, uh, can I start right now? Yes, sir. You can start. Thank you for well, joining. Thank you. So, uh, in next twenty minutes, we will be discussing how uh, we approach chronic myeloid leukemia. Uh, very important is uh, uh, why we are discussing chronic myeloid leukemia because it's one of the most common malignancies. Nearly fifteen percent of all blood cancer patients are chronic myeloid leukemia, and various presentations it. occurs to the general physicians and also to the presenting doctors it could be asymptomatic there could be just a, a rise in the tlc count or it could be just a symptomatic left hypochondrial pain uh, leukocytosis which leading to a priapism fever splenic infarcts thrombocytopenias bone pains and very important is the various differentials which includes variety of manifestations like iron deficiency perineoplastic steroid use and a leukemoid reactions now the basic and the primary investigation that is required essentially is a complete hemogram with a peripheral smear examination also the tumor lysis markers which includes the routine biochemistry uric acid creatinine phosphorus potassium are essentially required the basic premise is of doing a bone marrow evaluation is to find out what stage of the disease it is whether it's an accelerated phase or a blast crisis and the various risk scores which we will be discussing in futures and what is the concomitant fibrosis associated with it also to need the cytogenetics whether the philadelphia chromosome is there or any other abnormal karyotypes are there we need a uh, uh, cytokeratin studies for the same and very important is the bcr uh, abl pcr studies uh, which are more specific and sensitive in the bone marrow specimen and that's where it is important to diagnose it and also to quantify it and also for the diagnosis of the philadelphia negative cases also so this is the criteria for diagnosing uh, the accelerated phase and the blast phase which includes the number of the blast in the bone or the blood uh, and also in terms of the basophilia so whenever the basophilia is more than 20% of the tlc count it immediately switches to the accelerated phase uh, and whenever the blast is uh, more than 30% it is a blast phase irrespective of whether it is there and outside the bone marrow when you find the proliferation of these cells uh, that's an extra medullary blast proliferation that's apart from the spleen and the bone marrow it is the blast phase for all of these patients and also very important is uh, what the clonal abnormalities we found there are three standard scores uh, which has been standardized and which helps in stratifying whether uh, the intensity of the chronic myeloid leukemia is a low it's an intermediate or it's a high and helps in predicting the response to the therapies and also uh, what we can look forward in future so there is a socal score which has been there for 1984 euro has fort score which is 1998 and it's a utah score uh, since 2011 for prognostication and prediction of the uh, cml cb patients all of these are available online simple calculators also on the various applications no uh, hard calculations just fill on small details of the age the tlc count uh, the basophils uh, and uh, the various uh, parameters and you will get the score and you will also get the classification for the same and that helps in the prediction as you could see uh, the 10 year survival has a difference of uh, as you could see and also 
uh, the remission rate associated with it also is different with this the same as you could see this is the way we classify uh, survival of these patients so uh, a low risk has a low uh, uh, risk of uh, relapse and a low uh, and a better overall survival as compared to the intermediate or the high risk which has a higher chances of failures treatment failures and response rates and we'll, when we look at the chronic myelite leukemia patients uh, sometimes we do wonder whether to label them as uh, cancers because the life expectancy of the general population and life expectancy of a chronic myeloid patient, uh, leukemia patient are exactly exactly equivalent and that's where it is important that we need to see uh, with the advent of newer and newer tablets with the av advent of more stringent molecular monitoring uh, it's something which has revolutionized the whole oncology treatment so far now very important is when we look at chronic myeloid leukemia we look at the bcr abl so bcr abl uh, translocation is the primary uh, abnormality that is locate that is responsible for chronic myeloid leukemia and there we have to classify the bcr abl abnormality as as at which location the translocation has been there so it's a uh, whether a 190 or a 210 or a 230. These are the three uh, transcripts that can be formed with this translocation of uh, BCR and the ABL uh, genes, which are located on the 11 and the 19th chromosomes, respectively. And that's where it is important when this transcript is formed. The transcript is whether a 190. One or a 210 one or a 231 and that's where it is important that when we do at baseline we do a qualitative pcr a qualitative pcr tells us the quality of this transcript whether it's a 190 transcript it's a 210 transcript or it's a 230 transcript and it has a very low sensitivity and when it is negative it doesn't mean that uh, there is no cml it's just that we are not able to pick up the right transcript out of it when we quality 5 whether it's a 190 210 or a 230 transcript we monitor that clonal copies of the same and that's where the quantitative pcr is essential and very important is also it gives us an idea as whether it's a 190 or 210 whether the disease has a cml or it is an all with a translocation of a philadelphia chromosome and that's where it is important that at baseline we don't recommend a quantitative PCR. We recommend only a qualitative PCR as to find out as what transcript it is. And then we monitor that by a quantitative PCR as how many copies have been reduced through the molecular monitoring of it. And that's where it is important that uh, there are sometimes an abnormal transcripts and that's usually pick up by the next generation sequencing. And that's where uh, we have to understand this PCR, uh, BCR ABL report, where uh, we do have an international scale uh, for a conversion factor and an international scale for a normalized copy number that's standardized across the uh, various laboratories to facilitate as to say whether it's a response or what type of response is there. So there are four types of responses. There is a major molecular response. There is a molecular response 4, 4.5 and 5. It tells us the logarithmic reduction in the copies of the BCR ABL transcript, which we detect by a quantitative PCR method. And that's where it is important when the BCR ABL transcript on an international scale is less than 0.1%. It means it's a major molecular response. When it is Point, less than 0.01%, it's a MR4. And if it's um, less than 0.0032%, that means it's an MR4.5. And when it is five logarithmic reductions, that means it's less than 0.001, that's MR5. And that's where the deeper the response is there, that's the anything which is greater than a major molecular response, that's very, very uh, sensitive and that gives us an idea of the, the better responses and a lower chances of relapse and a better 
uh, work up. So definitely uh, next comes what we do in terms of when a patient comes. Examination referring to the spleen and liver size, which helps us in calculating the SOCAL and the UTOS scores, the complete blood counts, the microscopic differentials, the bone marrows for karyotypings and cytogenetics and molecular profiling, which only in cases of a Philadelphia chromosome negativity, quantitative PCRs, ECGs, and a serologies. Now, every uh, uh, two weekly, we see the patient's CBC till a complete hematological response is there. Every three monthly, we do a quantitative PCR till a major molecular response is there. And we also uh, do a cytogenetics on the baseline bone marrow to document a uh, and also on the follow-up bone marrow to document a complete cytogenetic response for the same. And more frequent monitoring, uh, it is very essential because especially uh, when we have to look at the common drug interactions, we have to change the dose of the TKIs, especially those patients where we have stopped this therapy, that's treatment-free remission, we have to close them monthly monitoring for the same. And very important as we say at three months, we have to achieve a complete hematological response. At six months, we have to achieve a major molecular response. And anytime when there is a loss of the major molecular response, uh, we, we look at the various risk mutations for the same. So most of the time, as we say, there has been a whole paradigm change in the treatment modifications. We have five lines of uh, therapies that are available right now which includes imatinib, nilotinib, desatinib, bosutinib, ponatinib. And very important is uh, uh, when we look at the imatinib, uh, nilotinib, desatinib, bosutinib, and the ponatinib, which are four options right now available. Each uh, drug has its own uh, good points, bad points, but all are recommended as a standard first-line therapies, depending upon the treating physicians, depending upon the comorbidities, depending upon the various things. All of them have shown uh, that they are all approved in the frontline treatment of the CMLs. Imatinib is the first generation, desatinib, nilotinib is the second generation, third generation is the bosutinib and the ponatinib, and all of them have an achievement of major molecular response to the tune of 90% and also the BCR ABL conversions of more than 80% for the same. If we look at the desit, uh, desatinib versus imatinib, you can see all those curves exactly pointing each other. If you look at the intolerance, the sensitive tablets we do, the higher generation we do, we do have a more amount of tolerance issues with it. As you could see with desatinib, more GI intolerance, more of hematological intolerance to occur, and also in terms of uh, the infections and other risks. But definitely when you, you use a second generation TKI over a first generation TKI, the responses are better, greater, deeper, and more sustained. As you could see in these curves that at five years, 64% of the patients were able to remain in the major molecular response with imatinib as compared to 76% of the patients with uh, the same. Hello? Hanji. I'm in a meeting. You come and come. I'm in a meeting. I'm in a meeting. I'm in a meeting. Mm-hmm. मैं मैसेज कर देता हूँ हाँ मैं मैसेज कर देता हूँ हेलो या सो द एस यू कूट सी अगेन विद डिसाइटनेब यू कूट सी बाय फाइव इयर्स सेवेंटी सिक्स परसेंट ऑफ द पेशेंट्स वर इन मॉलिक्युलर मेजर मॉलिक्युलर रिस्पांस एस कंपेयर टू सिक्सटी फोर परसेंट ऑफ देम and therefore, these all factors are very important in terms of the risk, comorbidities, expectations, education and compliance of the patient. What are the costs? What are the long-term outcomes? What are the uh, physician-related, which includes experience, expectations, and also the logistics and the available infrastructures for the monitoring? 
and the various important side effect profiles with uh, imatinib includes edema, muscle cramps, abdominal pain, diarrhea, myelosuppressions with desatinib. There's a lot of pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, pulmonary hypertensions, myelosuppressions, diarrhea, colitis with nilotinib. There is uh, hyperglycemia, hypertriglyceremia, cardiovascular and transaminitis, pancreatitis, hypertension, Gilbert syndrome. With bosotinib, it's GI disturbances, myelosuppression, serocytis. And it's only the choice of treatment, uh, It as you could see with this curve, as um, when we have to look at desatinib, uh, pulmonary hypertension is something which we, we can avoid in those patients possibly, and nilotinib, the prolonged QT and the congestive cardiac failures, we need to avoid these patients. And nilotinib, again, uh, the more dose you give, the better response it is, but then definitely the side effect profile does also increases. And most of the times the side effects are subtle, moderate and transient and mostly reversible, and they don't have any cross tolerance. So if you have to switch, uh, you can easily switch with ne the next uh, drug it's not going to cause the same side effect profile as the previous side effect profile and quality of life is mostly the good therapeutic alliance between you and patient is definitely very important and discussion uh, is ensure may, that the compliance is maintained and the molecular response is maintained and when we have a early molecular response that's within three months, less than 10% is associated with superior overall survival, event-free survival, major molecular response. And also very, very important is the early milestones also tells us how the patient is going to predict in next eight years, as you could look at the Australian data and the Indian data also associated with it. And definitely there has been head-on comparisons with the second generation and the third generation molecules achieving a better earlier responses and uh, lesser EMR, EMR failures. <laughs> and especially in those which have a intermediate to high SOCAL or UTOS or has what scores, again, also very, very important. But do we need to change therapies, especially with the, uh, not achieving an early molecular response is not clear at this point. And as you could see, those patients who achieve a major molecular response <coughs> sorry, tend to have a better prognosis, a better overall survival, and a definitely a longer life to stay as compared to those who don't achieve the major molecular responses. And that's where uh, now in the um, CML, uh, you cannot stop a diabetic patient with an anti-diabetic tablet. You cannot stop a hypertensive patient with an anti-hypertensive tablet. But with a CML patient, we are looking in future where we are, because of the various side effects that impair the quality of life, various adverse effects that's as associated with these tablets, family planning, pregnancy, financial reasons, and uh, TKI treatment may interfere in the child growth. And sometimes the patient do come with us. We have a TFR studies across the globe. So imatinib, nilotinib, desatinib. We are stopping these therapies and looking for the disease to come back. And there has been a good and earnest requirement for the same. And when the patient has been compliant for more than five years, there is the duration of major molecular response for more than three years. And the response has been greater. <laughs> So that's the criteria for discrimination. An adult patient who has been compliant with a chronic phase, no past history of accelerated or blast crisis, at least on treatment for three years, there has been a stable molecular response, MR4, for more than two years, documented on at least four tests performed at least three months apart. And the monthly molecular testing has been done for one year and every two months from the second year onwards and every three months from there till indefinitely after the discontinuation of the TKI is the first day we discuss this before discontinuing them there. And there is a higher rates of um, the better the molecule it is, the second or the third generations, the lesser chances of the disease coming back. And that's where TFR is possible more than 300 patients have successfully undergone a successful TFR and this has been uh, shown across various globe, across various studies 
but all across them, at least five to eight years of therapies of continuous monitoring has been there. And even after there is a treatment, uh, there is a relapse, there is a high chances of the same treatment being started again, getting the same response. And that's why even after stopping nilotinib or desiratinib as fiber or cycline, the probability of maintaining has been 50%, <clears throat> which is similar to stopping the imatinib. And therefore, uh, it depends upon the treating physicians, the patient discussions, the concomitant factors as whether you want to switch on restarting the tablets. But again, that has been something which is quite, quite happening in oncology field right now. And we had destiny trial for the same where we showed that the only significant factor that's predictive of recurrence was the duration of the TKI treatment, how far the treatment has been compliant and how uh, early we, we are considering for the TFRs for the same. And that's where it is important that anytime there is a loss of major molecular response, anytime there's loss of compliance of the patient to follow up, they every monthly, at least for the first year and two monthly for second year onwards, it is very important. And when we do a tri tyrosine kinase domain mutations, there is no mutation that is being found on it. That also gives us the possibility of the TKI. T TFRs. So again, uh, pregnancy is quite quite an issue, especially when these are diagnosed in young patients. In males, there is not shown to be teratogenic, but in females, it is contraindicated in the first trimester because of the organogenesis. In second trimester, it does cause hydrocephalosis. But then again, um, very important is uh, we also have to think for concomitant aspirin or anticoagulation for the thrombocytosis. And if the patient conceives on TKI, we have to stop the TKI counsel and obstetrician consult is essentially required. Various, various things are in pipeline, the multidrug resistant CML, the intolerance, the transplant in the CML, the molecular signatures, and we do have a whole glamoura of molecules that are coming, SMNM, which is the most happening and most uh, that's available in the Indian market right now. Uh, an allosteric inhibitor, Redotinib, flumatinib, KO706, again, are various, various molecules are there. SMNTIM has shown uh, efficacy even after three to four lines of failures of this. It's a very potent and active against almost all TKD mutations, and especially 1315 mutation, which is found to be resistance to most of the TKIs. And it has a very good tolerance, except for the pancreatitis and thrombocytopenia. And very important is um, when there is a failure of the first line TKI and you expect a predictive response to the second uh, line TKI, you should be considering for a allogenic stem cell transplants. 315 mutation is an indication for a transplant. Failure to respond to ponatinib again is a transplant indication and various poor tolerance having a repeated grade 4 cytopenias is an allogenic stem cell transplant indication for these patients. And if we look at the 315, ponatinib does so far fare better, but the near molecule SMNA has shown its indications for the same. In TMH, we did uh, nearly 375 patients, and we found out that the generic imatinib is as equivalent as compared to the original molecule. And the results have been consistent as with the original molecule. And therefore, uh, as you could see, uh, there is a TFR in at least few of our patients with the generic imatinib also. And that's where uh, I end my talk and would love to answer any question if there are any. Thank you so much, sir. Um, it was a very wonderful talk. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, would like to ask. Uh, so no, no questions, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Talreja, for your talk. Uh, we'll now proceed with the, the quiz. Uh, 
I'll request Amrita ma'am. I'll request Dr. Amit Verma sir and Dr. Akshay Lahoti sir to kindly uh, come to the stage for uh, the quiz moderation. just a second sir. Question is slightly bad, the next slide will answer. I know that. 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 So after a nice lunch and a short nap, थोड़ा जाग जाइए क्योंकि अब interesting चीज़ हैं तो थोड़ा आगे आ जाएंगे तो और अच्छा रहेगा क्योंकि जो live है यहाँ पे hall में audience they will enjoy more and they can answer more compared to those who are online क्योंकि online वाले तो message टाइप करेंगे तो हो सकता है हम उसको इतना पढ़ नहीं पाए सो आई जस्ट एंड पहले डिस्क्लेमर दे देता हूँ दिस हैज बीन प्रिपेयर्ड बाय टीम एमजीएम ट्रांसफ्यूजन मेडिसिन आई एम जस्ट रीडिंग इट आउट आई एम जस्ट कंडक्टिंग इट सो आई हैव नो क्रेडिट्स फॉर द क्विज व्हाट वी आर हैविंग हियर एंड आई हैव माय कलीग डॉक्टर अक्षय एज कोऑर्डिनेटर ही इज वन ऑफ द क्रिएटर एंड ही विल बी सीइंग हु आर आंसरिंग and he'll be also telling whether your answers are right or wrong. So, a question will be asked. You need to raise your hands. So, please chill out. Don't do it. 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 And single answer. So, we don't have to play KBC. So, you will give just one precise answer. It may be right or wrong. Time is 10 seconds from the time we put the question and there is a prize for every correct answer as a bula gaya again a disclaimer from me and a bumper prize for maximum uh, correct answers so let us start question one so it's a 34 year male pure vegetarian and a chronic alcoholic so a fatal combination jaisi hum padhte to dimang mein ekdam batti jalti hai ki vitamin b12 zero ho gaya hoga Complaints of weakness and easy fatigability, pallor is present, no organomegaly, no icterus. This is the here. CBC hemoglobin is 9.1, RBC count 5.2 million, MCV is 65, MCH is 22. They had to write in bracket low, considering shayad aap normal range bhool gaye ho. RDW is 14, TLC is 5400, platelet is 2.5 lakhs. So now this is a bit contrast with what was the history. So if you are permitted only one test to be done to clinch the diagnosis, there may be n number of tests we can do. So 
बाई चॉइस एक सिंगल टेस्ट क्या करोगे यस एनीवन हु रेजेस द हैंड ओनली वन पार्टिसिपेंट वन आंसर है तो देखिए प्लीज आंसर इंट्रोड्यूस योरसेल्फ एंड देन आई एम डॉक्टर अवनीश अरे ये क्या बात है आयरन प्रोफाइल एनीबडी एल्स वांट टू आंसर दिस इज अ रॉन्ग आंसर आंसर देने का प्राइस है सही आंसर देने का यार कम ऑन चुप फिर रेसिडेंट्स आंसर नहीं करेंगे या देन यू नीड टू आंसर हां कंसलटेंट्स यस एनीवन इन दिस ऑल कैन ट्राई गुड इवनिंग सर माय सेल्फ डॉक्टर मणिगंडन सेकंड ईयर ट्रांसफ्यूजन मेडिसिन अह फ्रॉम दिस लैब वैल्यूज एचबी इज लो एमसीवी एंड एमसीएच लो माइक्रोस्वेटिक हाइपोक्रोमिक अलोंग विद रेड सेल डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन इट इज नॉर्मल सो दैट इट मे बी एनी थैलेसीमिया रिलेटेड So, so what uh, test will like to do? Yeah, to go for any electrophoresis. Yeah, very correct. Perfect. <coughs> so that is the catch. इन्होंने क्या किया दो एक आपको वो दे दिए है ना बुला भी दे दिए पहले पूरा मेगालोब्लास्टिक का पिक्चर रख दिया अल्कोहलिक एंड ऑल वेजिटेरियन और सी बी सी आयरन डेफिशिएंसी के जैसा सो द ओनली इंट वाज आर डी डब्ल्यू सो गुड अटेम्प्ट Congrats. We move on to next question. Question number two. Thirty-two year female, avid non-veg eat eater. अब ये बिल्कुल उल्टा है ना. पहले vegetarian थे, अब non-vegetarian आ गए. Complain of fatigue and mild ictus for ten to twelve days. This mild splenomegaly. Now this is hemoglobin is eight point one, RBC is five point two. So I think they like this figure five point two. पहले भी था, अब आ गया. MCV is one one five. MCH is twenty nine, RDW is fifteen point two, TLC is five lakh four foot. ये same आ गया बिल्कुल. Five thousand four hundred. Platelet is two point five lakhs. Total bilirubin three point two, and direct is point six. So indirect is more. B twelve is normal. Folic acid is normal. Corrected retic is six point five. That is great. So single investigation to be done. Yes. एक ही इन्वेस्टिगेशन करना है अभी विच वन डायरेक्ट और इनडायरेक्ट यू आर करेक्ट बट अब एक तरह से रेटिक काउंट बढ़ा हुआ है हीमोग्लोबिन ड्रॉप हो रहा है सडन फर्टिकेबिलिटी है सो वेर डू यू एक्सपेक्ट द एंटीबॉडी टू बी फिर भी इनडायरेक्ट ही करेंगे ओके इट्स अ डायरेक्ट कॉन्स्टेस ओके गुड अटेम्प्ट सो डीसीटी विल फेच अस द आंसर नीड टू इंट्रोड्यूस आई सेड डॉक्टर वीनस फ्रॉम पैथोलॉजी तो अब रिएक्शन होना शुरू हो गया बाय क्वेश्चन 1 एंड 2 आई होप वी विल हैव मोर पार्टिसिपेंट्स विद नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चंस क्वेश्चन नंबर 3 39 ईयर मेल विद अ मिक्स्ड डाइट तो कितना बढ़िया मेन्यू है पहले वेजिटेरियन था फिर नॉन वेजिटेरियन है मिक्स डाइट आ गई अगला शायद वेजिटेरियन भी आ सकता है सो कंप्लेन ऑफ वीकनेस एंड इनएबिलिटी टू रन ड्यू टू फटीक फॉर वन मंथ ये तो शायद हम सबके साथ हो क्योंकि हम दौड़ते ही नहीं है रेगुलर नो ऑर्गेनो मैगैली माइल्ड इक्टरस सो देर इज इक्टरस देर इज फटीक ऑन मोर एक्सर्शन मिक्स डाइट हीमोग्लोबिन 5.1 आरबीसी इज 1.8 मिलियन एमसीवी 119 एमसीएच 29 आरडीडब्ल्यू 39.2 क्वाइट हाई टीएलसी इज लो 1800 प्लेटलेट इज लो 60000 बिलिरुबिन रेज्ड टोटल 3.6 डायरेक्ट 1.2 एलडीएच इज रेज्ड 4600 सो सिंगल इन्वेस्टिगेशन This is our case scenario. 
and this is your CBC. Yes. So you have some chronic, it is not an acute history, and you have pancytopenia with a raised LDL. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Going to try, yes. Uh, vitamin B12. Good. Why not folate? Why not folate deficiency? Folate bhi to ho sakta hai. Telling more common pehle karna chahiye. Achha. <laughs> पता नहीं इंदौरियों में तो फोलेट डेफिशिएंसी ज्यादा है क्योंकि हम सिर्फ हर चीज सेम से खाते हैं तो वेजिटेबल कंजम्पशन कम है आई वाज अमेज्ड टू सी मेगालोब्लास्टिक एनीमिया इन 16 एंड 18 इयर्स ऑफ मेल्स इन दिस रीजन बिकॉज़ ऑफ पीडियट्रिक पॉपुलेशन या 5 इयर्स 6 इयर्स ओल्ड गर्ल्स सो क्लैपिंग फॉर हिम गुड आंसर यस विटामिन बी12 डेफिशिएंसी गिफ्ट आ रहा है आपका क्वेश्चन नंबर 4 32 ईयर फीमेल रेसिडेंट ऑफ कोलकाता अगर इन्होंने रीजन डाला है तो कुछ सोच के डाला होगा शायद ए सिम्टोमेटिक शी वाज इन्वेस्टिगेटेड फॉर मेडिकल इंश्योरेंस पर्पस हीमोग्लोबिन इज नॉर्मल 13.1 आरबीसी इज 4.8 मिलियन एमसीवी इज 96 टोटल काउंट इज व्हिच दे लाइक दिस फिगर वेरी मच 5400 विद अ नॉर्मल डिफरेंशियल प्लेटलेट इज रिड्यूस 48000 एमपीवी इज 15.6 स्लाइटली हायर एलएफटी इज अ नॉर्मल आरएफटी इज नॉर्मल so overall there is a low platelet moderate thrombocytopenia so single investigation for diagnosis it was discussed by sachin jain sir also so 32 year female asymptomatic that is very essential from calcutta routine cbc hai aur usme thrombocytopenia yes you want to answer please ITP with no symptoms. Yes, sir. What is your take? No symptoms. <laughs> no, it is like <laughs> incorrect answer. <clears throat> the investigation we ask. Investigation, what will we do? Peripheral smear. Is correct. What do you want to look for? In peripheral smear, क्या देखेंगे peripheral smear में? What what do you expect in this? The platelet की clumping होगी. Platelet clumping होगी कि कुछ और होगा. Kolkata word has written ना. <laughs> so that will give a hint कि why in thrombocytopenia and PS what you will get. MPV is high. Fifteen point six. Yeah, yes. As such, you get uh, lower platelets normally also in that region. So pseudo thrombocytopenia due to EDTA was the correct answer. But anyways, you need a PS to rule out that. Question five twenty six year female known case of SLE on irregular treatment. Complaints of fever on and off fifteen days fatigue. Weakness since ten days, an episode of convulsion, irrelevant talk since one day. There is no organomegaly, there is no neck stiffness, and she is a young female. Hemoglobin is seven point one, RBC eight, three point eight million, MCV ninety six, retic count increase six percent, TLC is eighteen hundred, platelet is forty thousand, LDH is raised three thousand four hundred ninety nine. Bilirubin raised 3.6, direct is 1.2, so indirect is more. MRI brain changes of press, urea is increased 115, creat increased 3.4, SGPT 118, so borderline. PTIN are normal, serum prolactin is below 0.5, blood culture is sterile, CSF is normal. काफी बड़ा lab work है, एक बार देख लीजिए आप पूरा. So that's a 26-year female with SLE, irregular treatment, and comes with fever from 15 days with a convulsions. So what the peripheral blood shows? दिखा ना? Show this here. आये नहीं. So basically, PP is two sides over there. Okay, it is not appearing actually. 
दही में छुप गई है सो देर आर समिस्टोसाइट ऑन पेरिफल स्मियर सो वॉट इज अर डायग्नोसिस हाउ यू विल ट्रीट Uh, I'm suspecting hemolytic uremic syndrome since uh, there is thrombocytopenia. Also, there's creatinine, so kidney function is already compromised, and uh, LDH is also on the higher side. And uh, MRI finding of press is also supportive for, I think, thrombocytopenia. <laughs> so, is it TTP or HUS with the press and AKI? So, the symptoms are overlapping basically. So when there is a press, we think more of uh, TTPs, and with the RAP parameters, it more goes in favor of TTP rather than HUSA. Okay, that was a good try, but she deserves a prize. That was a good try actually. So TTP was a diagnosis. Treatment part, I think you can explain. So plasma exchange, she has shown, told sir. Okay, so, she has yeah. shown. Steroids with plasma exchange is the first line of therapy whenever you encounter any maha. So basically for TTP, yes, plasma exchange is the therapy of choice. Question six, a six year girl, history of PUO for one month, high fever with chills, mild hepatosplenomegaly, mild icterus, no lymphadenopathy, chest is clear on auscultation. There is a CBC. So HB is... 7.1, TLC 1500, platelets 80,000, ESR normal, creatinine 0.6, SGPT 232, LDH 989, total bilirubin 1.6, direct is 1.2, ANA is negative, HIV negative, chest x-ray NAD, USG abdomen, there is mild hepatosplenomegaly, PTINR normal, fibrinogen is 98, blood culture sterile, Montox is negative. So she is a child, six year old, with a PU of one month, mild hepatosplenomegaly, and this is a lab picture. I have a bone marrow picture after this. So bone marrow of this. So there's something, some issue with the images. None of the images coming. So there was a picture which was showing some sort of. Uh... Marrow, uh, macrophages engulfing the RBCs and the platelets. The n number of macrophages we are engulfing the other cells of the marrow. So now, question remains is what investigation and what is your diagnosis? So first is what diagnosis and then second is investigation. Diagnosis is HLH and investigation I would say bone marrow aspiration. So the bone marrow has already been done. Apart from the bone marrow, you want to do any biochemical test? Which supports HLH. It has six criteria. Yes. Clinically, uh, fever is present. Hmm. <clears throat> uh, serum ferret. Okay. Anything else? What are the six criteria? Uh, one is fever, second is splenomegaly, hepatosplenomegaly, third is bone marrow aspiration showing uh, phagocytosis. Okay. So, ferritin, triglycerides, fibrinogen, they are plus minus, high ferritin, high triglycerides, low fibrinogen. And <clears throat> uh, fever with pancytopenia, we've already told, there is some organomegaly, so five and some interleukin 2s and yes. So there are 6 out of 8 criteria which needs to be fulfilled for HLH. Ma'am, correct answer. <laughs> Sorry for technical uh, delay. We are trying to get a proper PPT with images.
anybody has seen any hlh patient matlab have you managed the hlh case how was the the course of the hlh matlab did he survive he did not survive what was the etiology something it okay <clears throat> so hlh are very difficult to treat irrespective of the etiology so generally they present with the underlying infections or malignancies and when you try to treat both so when you treat the sepsis the hlh increases when you treat the hlh the sepsis increases that is the problem so what are the role of mental uh, ivig in treating hlh patients so no direct supporting evidence we have but yes because if it is associated with some viral infestation you can always try ivig which will help in both hlh also and this also so depending on the underlying cause but the survival is yes very questionable एंड सर एच एल एच ना बहुत देर बाद भी डायग्नोस होता है बिकॉज पहले तो समझ में आता ही नहीं है साइटोपीनिया चलते रहते हैं इट इज डायग्नोस वेरी लेट सो इफ इट इज बेसिकली जस्ट टू एड ऑन इफ इट इज साइटोपीनियाज हाई ग्रेड फीवर यू आर नॉट गेटिंग आंसर जस्ट डू द सीरम फेरेटिन इफ यू कैन डू द मैरो एंड इफ फेरेटिन इज इन अ रेंज ऑफ मोर देन फाइव थाउजेंड सो मोर देन फाइव थाउजेंड फेरेटिन बेसिकली ओनली थ्री रीजन वन इज दिस एच एल एच another one is adult onset of um, still, still. that's a basically still disease adult onset mm-hmm. of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and third one is jab humne sabne covid mein bahut zyada dekha hai cytokine release syndromes so only three causes whenever you are getting ferritin more than 5000 yeah. other than this very rare sir click karna padega link karna आज के पहले के सेशंस में जो ज्यादा एक्टिव थे वो ज्यादा आंसर कर पाएंगे शायद ये दोनों ज्यादा एक्टिव थे सचिन साहब की बहुत सारे बॉक्स बोर्ड लिए हैं पिक्चर्स हमने सो यहाँ पे कितने पैथोलॉजिस्ट हैं जस्ट रेज योर हैंड प्लीज एंड कितने फिजिशियंस हैं Uh, and how many from transfusion kitne logo ko hematology field ab aaj ke talk ke baad interesting lag raha hai isko usme gaye ki hame routine jo hota hai jab hum md kar rahe hote hain na to jaise pathology karte hain to histopathology mein jana hai md physician kar rahe hote hain to matlab कार्डियोलॉजी में जाना है या वो मतलब एमडी में भी हिमाटोलॉजी किसी को ध्यान नहीं आता पैथोलॉजी में भी हिमाटोपैथोलॉजी और ट्रांसफ्यूजन मेडिसिन किसी को ध्यान नहीं आता so we are back uh, these were the images is now we can appreciate the hemophagocytosis quite well in them so this we have already discussed i move on to the next uh question so what sir had rightly suggested ferritin uh for investigation for hemophagocytosis so question number 7 four year boy born out of consanguineous marriage history of easy bruisability since birth no major bleeds in the past no organomegaly no family history hemoglobin 10.2 gram percent 
total leukocyte 5600 with normal dlc platelet normal 4.5 lakh pt is raised 34 seconds apdt is near normal upper range 32 seconds fibrinogen 243 thrombin time is normal so what is your diagnosis and what test would you like to order yes Yes, transfusion people. Four year boy, consanguineous marriage, easy bruisability. And what you see is a raised PT. Hello, I'm Dr. Yogesh Pawar. Uh, finally resident transfusion medicine i would like to suspect uh, hemophilia so i would like to even order a test regarding factor 8 so we have a pt prolongation PT pro we don't have an aptt prolongation it's a... i think mixing study i would go for you will go for mixing studies <laughs> okay so if it is getting corrected by mixing so let's say full normal plasma is getting. So what is your diagnosis now? Uh, it, uh, it is getting corrected. Yes. Uh, that's that is a deficiency of factor nine. That suggests the deficiency of factor nine. इनके दोनों price ले लिए जाएं. No problem. That is the wrong answer. We have isolated prolonged PT. Only PT is raised, yeah. So PT is an exception. Myself, Dr. Amal, second year resident. Factor yes. 7 deficiency. Okay, perfect. Sir. So factor 7 levels and factor 7 deficiency. So clapping for him. Question 8. 13 year old boy, history of repeated skin infections since childhood, complaint of mucosal bleeding and ichthyomatic spots over body for past 3 years, generalized lymphadenopathy. So there's a boy with repeated infections, with mucosal bleeds, with blood spots and lymphadenopathy. Hemoglobin is 10.2 gram, TLC is 5600, normal DLC, platelet is 56,000, PT is near normal, APDT near normal, CRP is raised, mean platelet volume is very low, 3.2. This is the peripheral blood smear. So the PBS is basically showing some small platelets over there. And that yeah, is what is that's why MPV percent. is also low. And overall platelet count is also low. Do we have any pediatricians over here? Pediatric fellows, pediatricians, no one. Difficult. This is a bit difficult question for the for our, all of us. But yes, anybody can attempt. History of repeated skin infections since childhood. Does it give any hint? Skin infections, probably some allergic also, some uh, infections also, anything. Repeated skin infections and low MPV. We have thrombocytopenia, low infections, and generalized lymphadenopathy. Probably some immunodeficiency is going on. Is a kid. Now the answer. Generalized lymphadenopathy. Yes. Bully, bully. So we Scott Albertson. Perfect. And what is triad of same? Eczema, thrombocytopenia, and repeated infections. Good. Very good. So, Viscot Eldritch syndrome, your correct answer with eczema, immunodeficiency, and thrombocytopenia. Up to yes, that's her koi bol deha. What is this instrument? Yes. Phir bhi ek nahi haath upar ki hai. Anyways. Bataiye. 
अच्छा मॉडल का नाम बताइए तो हम देंगे <laughs> मैकमन कुल्टो तो कंपनी का नाम है रुकिए रुकिए मॉडल का नाम बताइए <laughs> वो <laughs> मोबाइल का सब कुछ बता सकते हैं फाइन <laughs> इसीलिए तो मॉडल नाम नहीं बता पाए इज इट डिफ्लेक्स शो ठीक चलिए कॉन्ग्रेट्स सर ने बहुत सिंपल लिखा है फ्लोज ऑटोमेटिक मशीन हम तो बैकमन तक चले गए Okay, identify the abnormality in this karyotype. एक छोटा सा arrow भी इन्होंने कहीं लगा दिया है. Should be the easy one. हाँ हाँ या anyone anyone. Both arrows. <coughs> It will check your eyesight as well. अगर arrows दिख गए आपको वहाँ से. The eyesight is good. जिसने answer नहीं दिया है उनको दो. So what is BCR ABL? Philadelphia chromosome. What happens? Translocation. Between? Chromosome nine and twenty. Okay, thank you. So Philadelphia chromosome. Transfusion medicine वालों को allowed नहीं है question. जो लोग transfusion medicine से नहीं है वो बताएं कि क्या है. Yes, uh, the physician want to answer. Yes, please answer. Flex machine problem, sir. Yes. Flex machine. <laughs> Flex yes. machine, you are saying. Problem, sir. Or भी कुछ कह सकते हैं इसपे? अभी मुझे भी red red blood cell हमको करना है फिरेसिस कर सकते हैं? प्लेटलेट निकाल सकते हैं स्टेम सेल्स ले सकते हैं <laughs> ले सकते हैं इस मशीन से एक्सचेंज ट्रांसफ्यूजन एंड प्लाज्मा प्लाज्मा से लग रहा है सर एफ एफ पी लगे हुए हैं एफ एफ पी से ट्रांसफ्यूज हो रहा है और ठीक है एक्सेप्ट सो दिस इज अ एफेरेसिस मशीन इट इज यूज्ड फॉर द एफेरेसिस ऑफ एनीथिंग यू कैन एक्सट्रैक्ट प्लाज्मा स्टेम सेल्स ल्यूकोसाइट्स प्लेटलेट्स ओनली द किट यू हैव टू चेंज करेक्ट है ना सर यस ओके नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन सो दिस इज एफेरेसिस मशीन दैट्स राइट आंसर I am stationed in the body of patients with cancers. What's my name? So clinician won't answer. Okay, this side we have new hands. <clears throat> It's looking like Bluetooth. Chemo port. It's a chemo port. Right answer. Yeah. For pathologists, the gross appearance is like a Bluetooth. So this is a chemo port. Question number thirteen. Uh, a seventy-year-old male presented with anemia, hemoglobin seven point two gram per dl with lymphadenopathy. So old age with uh, decreased hemoglobin, lymphadenopathy. PS is in front of you. Or I think ninety percent people will now guess this because who have attended the morning session yet? Yes. Today, sir, before I put the question. The question. The question. What is the question? Therapy they are asking. सो दिस इज सी एल एल वो लिखा हुआ ही है नहीं सर वो ऊपर क्वेश्चन आइडेंटिफाई द डिसीज करके सी एल एल सी आंसर बिफोर वी कैन आस्क वन मोर क्वेश्चन टू हर वट इज द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस फॉर दिस सी एल एल पेशेंट ऑफ ऑनलाइन आंसर It depends on whether the patient is asymptomatic or symptomatic. So, if the patient is asymptomatic, so yeah. despite the high count, we don't need to do any treatment. And if the patient is symptomatic, then it further depends on the age. 
and there were many drugs. Uh, I, I, uh, Online also we got three four correct responses for this. So at least uh, we can diagnose a basic chronic leukemia CLL. Question number fourteen: Identify the disease. A seventy-year male presented with anemia. शायद ये उसी का भाई है. सत्तर साल का ही है. हीमोग्लोबिन इसका भी साथ ही है. And severe bone pain. थोड़ा सा difference है. Bone marrow smear picture is shown below. So looking at the marrow. You can raise the think? hand. We'll ask the the person to answer that. The chat is increasing, swelling up. <laughs> Should I open the chat? <laughs> Sir, answer will be there. I am happy with the answer. Bone cancer. <laughs> so some cell of the bone is cancerous. Is playing KBC. Next is multiple myeloma. So anybody from here who has answers? वन मोर मल्टीपल माइलोमा अरे बाप रे ने बोन मारो डिप्रेशन ही कर दिया है मल्टीपल माइलोमा सो मेनी पीपल आर आंसरिंग माइलोमास बट आई डोंट नो दे डोंट लुक मोर लाइक प्लाज्मा सेल्स मे बी प्लाज्मा प्लस दे आर इंटरप्रेटिंग लाइक इट इज मल्टीपल माइलोमा ओके बट द क्वेश्चन वी विल चेंज समहाउ मतलब वी विल ऐड टू द क्वेश्चन एनी टू और थ्री ड्रग्स व्हिच यू यूज फॉर मल्टीपल माइलोमा for the treatment so the answer is correct it is multiple myeloma with mostly it is showing binucleate Sorry. forms and plasma blocks bortezumab bortezumab ha ah. carfilzomab okay perfect so these are very good the medicines a drug used for multiple myeloma which is teratogenic Sorry, ma'am. Uh, we are giving it to Heman. Carfil. The other drug, oral drug. Perfect. Good. So nice attempt, and we got lot many responses of multiple myeloma. So those who are online, they are more fast than our offline people. <laughs> they started responding. हो सकता है उनको image ज़्यादा अच्छी दिख रही है पांच से दिख रही है. The possibility is that also. और शायद उनका lunch आपसे पहले हो चुका था. तो क्वेश्चन नंबर फिफ्टीन अगेन वी नीड टू आइडेंटिफाई सेवेंटी ईयर सत्तर साल में क्या प्रॉब्लम है सत्तर पे ही नजर गड़ा है हम सेवेंटी ईयर मेल प्रेजेंटेड विद मैसिव स्प्लिन मैगैली एंड एनीमिया हिमोग्लोबिन भी सेवन पॉइंट टू है सो इट इज अ पी एच विच इज डिसाइडेड बोन मारो एस्पिरेशन इज ड्राई टाइप प्लीज लिसन द क्वेश्चन एस्पिरेट इज ड्राई टाइप पेरिफुल स्मियर में ये हमें सेल्स दिख रहे हैं वंडरफुल Yes, and any drug of choice for the treatment? Only Sorry. single drug we are using for hairy cell. And the chat is swollen up with eleven answers of hairy cell. That's what I said. The images on go, बहुत अच्छी से दिख रही हैं मोबाइल. So they are answering very quickly. Tapping for online. <laughs> online वालों की जाए बहुत कर देंगे सर लास्ट में एक बार. That is the right answer. Yes. Which cell disorder this is? Hairy cell to hai. Kis cell se bana hai? B cell. B cell. Good. So that's the correct answer. We are happy that now the participants are increasing, both offline and online. So hairy cell leukemia the and the bone marrow biopsy. Uh, uh, biopsy has a classic fried egg appearance, shrinking artifact of the cytoplasm. But PS, of course, uh, will I will us appearance of the cell cytoplasm? Drug is cladribin. Question number sixteen. Identify the disease. Is my marks be de diye? Twenty marks. So marks be likhli jiga. Six year old male presented with fever, lymphadenopathy since seven days. Or a very classic cell. Is my already dikh raha hai. Hand mirror. Please do not answer without asking. आपने पूछा आइडेंटिफाई द डिजीज सो शी हैज आइडेंटिफाइड शी हैज आइडेंटिफाइड द सेल्स एक 
execute ALL. Which form? Which type of ALL? B T N C. Now that is the real catch. So we have two types: B cell, T cell. So B type B ALL, which is by lineage. You will go with B cell. ALL. L2 टाइप एंड ऑल चैट्स में बहुत सारे आंसर्स हैं कैन बी बी सेल एडवाइस फ्लो साइटोमेट्री एडवाइस भी हो चुकी है ऑनलाइन सो पीपल आर वेरी क्विक ऑनलाइन इज इट मोर ऑफ टी सेल एल दी हैंड मेर सेल्स ऐसा बहुत स्पेसिफिक तो नहीं है बट इफ आई सी वैक्यूल्स आई विल फेवर मोर बी ओवर टी इसमें वैक्यूल्स दिख रहे हैं so if we don't get more of vacuoles maybe t can be a possibility but with vacuoles b yeah, and of good. course majority are b <laughs> yeah. is into the wo bumper ke liye fight kar rahi hai sir so nice attempt question number 17 identify this personality any radiation people we have दो शी इज नॉट फ्रॉम रेडिएशन बट उनको ऊपर से सीधे रेडिएशन आ गए शी गॉट सम क्लू यस वाओ एंड व्हाट शी इन्वेंटेड एक ही को जानते हैं हम तो रेडिएशन मतलब क्यूरी होगी व्हाट शी इन्वेंटेड सो Born in Warsaw, Poland, first woman in Europe to earn a PhD in sciences. Mary Pierre Curie, a very correct answer by you. Chats में भी बहुत लोगों ने आंसर दिए हैं. Yes, they are correct in chat also. So we move on to next question. How many Nobel prizes? So how many Nobel prizes did Curie family win? पूरी फैमिली ने जीतने हैं उसने पूरी फैमिली ने मिलके कितने नोबल जीते हैं थ्री का आंसर आया है रिपीटेडली आठ का भी आया है तो फाइव एट माइनस थ्री कर देते हैं सो द करेक्ट आंसर इज फाइव so five and these are the names who have won the nobel prizes question 18 ha her individual she got two but family got five identify the disease a 38 year male presented with priapism and massive splenomegaly massive kehte hi kaan khade ho jate hain peripheral smear picture is in front of you disease name of the disease base and any peculiar cells you are able to see on the ps ha ab jo jeet gaye bar bar aur galat denge to reverse bhi hoga reverse flow on chat i have already got eight nine answers yes hall any guesses they have already answered चैट पे ये आंसर आ रहा है क्या करें यहां तो कोई आंसर नहीं कर रहा योर आंसर यू आर आंसरिंग सीएमएल डू यू आर आंसरिंग सीएमएल ओके द ड्रग एनी ड्रग सो द आंसर इज करेक्ट इट इज सीएमएल ओके ही इज राइट सर व्हाट इज कॉज ऑफ प्रैपिज्म So is it the cells blocking the vessels? Possible. So yes, it is the cells basically which block the vessels. Viscosity. Viscosity. Next question: A twenty-five-year-old female previously diagnosed with hemophilia A was admitted with spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage, during which she received intensive factor VIII concentrate. Three months later, inhibitor titer of 11 bu and an undetectable factor 
एट सी वर डिस्कवर्ड वन द पेशेंट सफर्ड लाइफ थ्रेटनिंग रेट्रोपेटोनल ब्लीडिंग ड्यू टू स्पॉन्टेनियस रप्चर ऑफ अ हाइपोगेस्ट्रिक आर्टरी थोड़ा सा कॉम्प्लेक्स है वॉट इज द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस फॉर मैनेजमेंट ऑफ दिस केस सो शी इज ट्वेंटी फाइव ईयर ओल्ड नॉन हिमोफीलिया ए गिवन इंटेंसिव फैक्टर एट कॉन्सेंट्रेट फॉर फर्स्ट एपिसोड थ्री मंथ्स लेटर डेवलप्स इनिबिटर अनडिटेक्टेबल फैक्टर एट सी एंड देन शी कम्स विद अ रेट्रोपेरिटोरियल ब्लीड सो वॉट विल बी द मैनेजमेंट नाउ क्राइप्रेसिपिटेट नो सो यू हैव हिमोफीलिया विद सम इनिबिटर्स इन द ब्लड वॉट डू यू वॉन्ट टू गिव नाउ basically giving any factor 8 will be not working so we are giving answer as d and b solvent detergent plasma or cryo precipitate factor 7 somebody has answered factor 7 here also anybody from here wants to answer with a correct explanation to so wo intrinsic extrinsic baat pe ek bar idhar revise karwana padega लास्ट टाइम भी पीटी का कंफ्यूजन वहीं से शुरू करना चाहिए दिस इज दिस दिस पाथवेज एंड देन यू आस्क थिंग्स बिकम इजीयर एक्चुअली दिस इज एक्चुअली लेवल 2 ऑफ द क्वेश्चंस मैम एनीबॉडी एल्स यदि मैम परफेक्ट फैक्टर 7 पाथवे अह विल कम इनटू एक्शन and uh, because inhibitors are in the uh, intrinsic pathway so. so true so online also three people have answered factor 7 they are also correct so you are yes. as ma'am has rightly told that you are having some factor inhibitors against the factor 8 so anything you give factor 9 factor 8 factor 12 11 whatever in the extrinsic pathway they will not work hai na क्योंकि फैक्टर एट के आगे काम नहीं हो पाएगा दे विल इनिबिट choose the correct one regarding lethal triad of trauma and resuscitation coagulopathy alkalosis hypothermia coagulopathy acidosis hyperthermia coagulopathy alkalosis hyperthermia coagulopathy acidosis hypothermia eating tongue twister ho gaya sir coagulopathy acidosis and hypothermia kon kisne answer kiya okay the fourth one perfect perfect answer yes answer is d what yes, you give coagulopathy acidosis and hypothermia yes yeah i am anesthetist sir <laughs> <laughs> the anesthetist yes yeah online bhi sab d chal rahe hain good so i think hello it's quite fruitful i think is subah se jo unhone padha hai they are able to reciprocate now question 21 so few questions left now so there's just a little bit of time between you and the t parents donation should not be used to transfuse the neonates due to the fact so you don't prefer the parents to give blood donation for their kids why a it has a higher risk of nait it possesses the risk of Uh, transfusion associated graft versus over disease promotes replacement donation and a emotional issue so of this which one is a correct answer that you should not promote blood transfusions in plus plus blood relatives transfusion wale to bol hi denge maine bhi bol diya tha sir yahan se to एक डिस्कशन में हो ही चुका था ये यस इमोशनल लग रहा है देखिए ऑनलाइन 14 रिस्पोंसेस आ चुके हैं सर फिर तो मैं तो अपने के आंसर एक्सप्लेन भी कर दीजिए सर इट कैन कॉजेस ट्रांसफ्यूजन एसोसिएटेड ग्राफ्ट वर्सेस होर्स डिसीजेस परफेक्ट एंड व्हाई इज दैट 
पेरेंट्स का कभी भी ब्लड बच्चों को नहीं देना चाहिए और एनी ऑफ दी क्लोज रिलेटिव शुड नॉट बी गिवन टू दू दिलेटिव causing aluminization so in future the transplants may fail of any solid organs or even bone marrow for that matter so can you prevent this ta gvhd if you do not have any option o negative blood group hai aapko parents ke lena hai so can you prevent it aap prevent kar sakte ho isko transfusion wale bataiye agar prevent karna hai aapko ye what you will do what you generally do onko wale kaun sa blood lete hain aap se irradiation irradiated Perfect. thank you मेडिकल ऑफिसर विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग यू थिंक इज नॉट एन एडवांटेज अब ये क्वेश्चन सिर्फ ट्रांसफ्यूजन वालों के लिए हो गया है no risk of this transfusion associated graft versus host disease standardized dose ability to do hla matching reduce risk of tti aapko kisko convince karna parent ko us angle se aap kya bologe un is someone so i think the dose in not dose jo hai wo standardized nahi hai dono ki sdp aur rdp ki doses to different hai because single dose of sdp raises platelets in different uh, amount and the rdp raises in different amount ha uh, that is one factor and most important factor is the baseline platelets of the donor itself so your uh, content may vary yes but it is pooled when you make a pool so pool give you equal result okay okay so that means you are standardizing the dose par hame to ye batana hai ki sdp how it is better than that pooled random donor platelets so of this which is correct which will be told to the parents चैट में बहुत पुलिंग हो गई मैं देख लेता हूँ एक बार चैट भी से so, डी में तीन चार लोगों ने आंसर किया है टीटीआई रिड्यूस करने के लिए Anybody has any other opinion in this? SDP has plasma, so TA GVHD risk always remains. I think I don't know. Yes. Who co compare kiya actually? Huh? The TA GVHD. So it is not an advantage then. So A remains the answer. See. <laughs> answer will be c actually because you are taking from multiple donors so complete actually matching uh, you can't do but for sdp is where we are doing hla typing or matching for that purpose we don't need in refractory, refractory only in refractory cases yeah but in routine in routine protocol if you give me this uh, option i will say your yeah, d is more correct yes 
Because more the number of plasmas, plasma. more chances of transfer, uh, transmitting disease. Yes. That way. Yes, sir. Because C is definitely an advantage of SDP over RDP. Standardized dose for SDP and full, it is full platelets. Though the dose is equivalent, but for SDP, it can be more standardized. Means we are uh, actually setting a value. And then no risk of TA, GVSD. Actually, it will be for both, it will be equivalent. Equal. Yeah. Yeah. Option may which good body answer given is no risk, not, it's not an advantage. <laughs> so, framing, framing ulta, bagis are advantage, right? Coming to next question, which of the following is not required in pack RBC is meant for thalassemia child? Thalassemia ko agar pack tal dena hai. Do you need a leuco reduction, irradiation, washing, pressure, blood units? So, which is not required? Again, a negative question. So, what are required and what is not needed? नहीं मल्टीपल तो राइट है ही रॉंग कौन सा है वो एक ही बताना है नॉट रिक्वायर्ड यस नहीं प्लीज बताइए क्या आंसर है Answer is B. You don't need irradiation. Why? They don't have the increased risk for DHGH. So irradiation is not done on every pack cell uh, because it is not a whole blood. And we assume that the quantity of WBC is low in that. Yes, sir, but washing is also not required. Oh, <laughs> that way. Allergic reaction. In very right severe here. allergic, especially those who, who are deficient, IG, IG are deficient, only in that. Otherwise, uh, it's not required. It's not required. So it's PRBC. PRBC contains very less plasma, and uh, if it is sagam added, then yeah. normally it don't have. It carries the same amount uh, if, we, if we if we speak in terms of HLA, WBC be come hai, to aapka plasma component be come. So these two things can go uh, as answers actually. Washing is not required and irradiation is not required. So jinnon ne dono mein se jo bhi answer diya that partly correct. A 49 year old female presents with weakness, malaise, routine hemogram reveals HB 8 gram. Total leukocyte 4,500, platelets are 60,000. So there is a bicytopenia, low hemoglobin, low platelet. Bone marrow shows hypocellular marrow, age is 49. She denies history of passing smoky urine. So in short, we are trying to say there is no hematuria. Workup reveals red blood cell lies in vitro with acid. And further lab tests reveal deficiency of DK, accelerating factor and membrane inhibitor of reactive lysis. Bone marrow aspiration and biopsy findings are given. Uh, somewhat blurred, but yes. What is the most likely diagnosis? PNH. PNH. And name of this test? Uh, name of the test? CD Where do you use acid? Lysis test? CD55 and 59. Sucrose lysis test? CD55, CD59. Very good.
यस वी गॉट लॉट ऑफ पी एन एच ऑन ऑनलाइन ऑल्सो लोग खुश हो रहे हैं गुब्बारे छोड़ रहे हैं थम्सअप भी दिखा रहे हैं ऑनलाइन सो दे आर हैप्पी दे कुड क्रैक अ गुड केस ऑफ पी एन एच यस आप तक गिफ्ट आया कि नहीं so congratulations to all those who have got correct answer for this question yes definitely pnh is now on flow cytometry as well so hams test cd5559 and bone marrow will simply show erythroid hyperplasia a 26 year old uh, lady presented with 10 days history of gum bleeding पेरिफल ब्लड स्मियर शो पैनसाइटोपिनिया बोन मारो आपके सामने है अभी थोड़ी देर पहले ही शायद सचिन सर ने अपने टॉक में ये स्लाइड दिखाई है वो स्लाइड फिर से आ गई है ए पी एम एल ए पी एम एल सो आई थिंक यू डोंट इवन राइट नीड टू राइट टी फिफ्टीन सेवनटीन हाँ तो अभी पिक्चर अभी बाकी है मेरे दोस्त तो क्वेश्चन आ रहा है सो वेरी गुड इट इज ए पी एम एल ये स्टेन आ गए स्टेन के नाम बताइए पहला स्टेन कौन सा ए और बी कौन सा है बी स्पेसिफिक ए ये है और बी ये है व्हाट इज थेरेपी सर थेरेपी विटामिन ए ओके कैन बी कंसीडर्ड ऑल ट्रांस रेटिनोइक एसिड हां स्पेसिफिक एंड द ए एंड बी स्टेन्स के हमें बाहर से मिल गए ऑनलाइन एसबीबी एंड एटीआरए सही है मैडम स्टेन्स एम पी एंड एस बी बी एस बी बी तो ठीक है ब्लैक इट इज क्लियर आई थिंक दे गॉट कंफ्यूज विथ एम पी ओ कोई एन एस सी भी लगाना चाह रहा है ए पी एम एल पे ओके ओके फाइन एक्चुअली एम पी ओ थोड़ा लाइट दिख रहा है सो इट इज नॉट अपीलिंग लाइट एम पी ओ एस एस बी बी इज गुड So, etra and arsenic are the drugs also, and yes, sir. So we got complete answer on APML. So congrats to all the winners. We move to next question now. So that was AML M three, MPO and SBB, targeted therapy, attract. अच्छा okay, उन्होंने therapy लिखा था मैडम attract. I got confused with उन्होंने staining लिखा है. A 19 year old uh, college student from Bhopal, चलो कोई तो आया अपने लोकल एरिया का कम्स टू यू एंड सेज दैट वन ऑफ हिज कजिन ब्रदर्स इन द मैटरनल साइड थोड़ा सा कॉम्प्लिकेट है एज सीकल सेल एनीमिया एंड इज मदर हैज वंस बीन डायग्नोज एज सीकल सेल ट्रेट ही लॉस्ट हिज फादर एट एन अर्ली एज ही इज ए सिमटमेटिक वॉन्ट्स टू नो वेदर ही ऑल्सो हैज सीकल सेल ट्रेट यू ऑर्डर एच पी एल सी एंड द ट्रेसिंग आर एज फॉलोज कुल मिला के कहानी पे ध्यान मत दीजिए अब जो एच पी एल सी आएगा उस पर ध्यान दीजिए यस प्लीज इंटरप्रेट दिस ग्राफ ऑफ एच पी एल सी सो फीटल हिमोग्लोबिन इज सिक्स पॉइंट सेवन परसेंट एडल्ट हिमोग्लोबिन इज सेवन पॉइंट वन परसेंट ए टू इज सिक्स पॉइंट नाइन परसेंट और ये लास्ट का ग्राफ मुझे यहाँ से नहीं दिख रहा है वो छुपा दिया हमने तो आपको डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन सीक्वेंस अगर पता हो कि कौन सा पिक किसके बाद आता है दैट इज अ मिस्ट्री एंड द क्वेश्चन में भी थोड़ी सी एंड मिल रही है हमें फिर से क्वेश्चन दिखा देते हैं 19 ईयर ओल्ड स्टूडेंट वन ऑफ कजिन ब्रदर्स इन मैटरनल साइड हैज सिकल सेल एनीमिया हिज मदर डायग्नोज सिकल सेल ट्रेट फादर डाइड एट अर्ली एज ही इज ए सिम्टोमेटिक अब उन्हें रूल आउट करना है सिकल सेल ट्रेट चैटिंग में तो आठ आंसर आ चुके हैं उनको पूरा ग्राफ तो नहीं दिख रहा है नहीं दिख रहा है किसी को देना है सर? नहीं सर इतना फास्ट चीटिंग नहीं कर सकते एच बी एस सर एच बी एस हेट्रोजाइगस बीटा थैल सिकल सिकल सेल डिजीज दीज आर द आंसर्स वी आर गेटिंग So that is an HBS band, okay. But percentage-wise, you need to interpret what the child is suffering from. 
आपके पास हमने पूरा पिक्चर रख दिया ना फीटल हिमोग्लोबिन सिक्स पॉइंट सेवन ए जीरो इज सेवन पॉइंट वन ए टू इज सिक्स पॉइंट नाइन वॉट यू कॉल इट टूगेदर वॉट टर्मिनोलॉजी यू यूज वॉट आंसर यू गिवन इज करेक्ट टेक्निकली डबल हेट्रोजेगिंग डबल हेट्रोजेगि डबल तो नहीं है एस का बैंड कितना है देखिए ना बाकी के हीमोग्लोबिन मिला लीजिए कितने हैं व्हाट इज द टोटल सो व्हाट इज एस क्वांटिटी ऑफ एस इज क्वाइट हाई सो सिकल सेल एनीमिया बिकॉज योर एच बी एस इज क्वाइट हाई दैट्स व्हाट आई सेड इफ यू मेक द टोटल इट इज नॉट इवन थर्टी सो एस इज मोर देन सेवेंटी टीम हू क्रिएटेड दिस कंटेंट ऑफ क्विज मैंने केवल कंडक्ट किया है थैंक्स अलॉट क्या बम्पा प्राइस गोज टू डॉक्टर वीनस डॉक्टर अवनीश डॉक्टर वीनस एंड डॉक्टर मनी मनीकरण ओके प्लीज कम ऑन स्टेज सो थैंक्स अलॉट टू ऑल द ऑनलाइन participants of quiz for a very enthusiastic replies and very correct answers given by you unfortunately we cannot send the gifts to you but yes you have cracked most of the answers correctly thank you we are receiving many hand uh, thumbs up and clapping responses from online audience congratulations to all the winners Uh, receiving sir many wonderful comments regarding uh, the conference very informative th talks thank you thank you so much for this wonderful session all lectures were very informative and kept us awake throughout so on behalf of medical learning hub i would like firstly like to thank uh, mgm medical college for uh, uh, helping us organize this conference uh, hematocon and uh, dr ashok yadav and the team for uh, helping us throughout with this thanks to all the audience who have joined us today via uh, online as well as on site mode Uh, thank you for your participation 
uh, the certificate of attendance would be uh, given on your registered email address, which you have uh, used while scanning uh, the QRs. So you can use that. Uh, let me close it. Okay. So with this, uh, uh, also this recording of this complete uh, conference would be available on our platform called as medicallearninghub.com. You can access that uh, uh, via browsers and go to the concerned and log uh, log in with the concerned uh, name of this conference and access this recording throughout. Thank you all. Thank you for being patient and have a good day. Thank you for all the joinees and all the respected faculties who joined us. Uh, I would like to invite the MLH team for the felicitation and uh, I would like to say the sir to please felicitate the team. Uh, yeah, all are all can proceed towards the lunch area for high tea. Thank you. हाँ आप लीफ कर दीजिए से ना ये ज़ूम कर दीजिए. Uh, also, I would like to make an announcement. Like, uh, like the way you have taken the pre polls, you can also take the post polls by scanning the QRs and. Uh, Check the knowledge gap if uh, uh, towards the post poll. Thank you. I might put that up.